If you have been on the internet in the last 9 years, there's no doubt you have heard about Five Nights at Freddy's. Starting as a small indie game before skyrocketing into the massive IP it is today, Freddy Fazbear has reared his head into almost every corner of the internet. With such a large, loyal fan base, it's no surprise that many fans have taken it upon themselves to create fan projects surrounding the series. These fan projects come in all forms, whether that's music, animations, or even complete games, that either take inspiration from or try to recreate the core of what made FNAF so great. While few fan games have risen to popularity, mostly thanks to Let's Players covering them on their channels, I still feel like a lot of fan games go unseen to the broader audience of FNAF fans. Over the last two years on this channel, I've gone through almost every fan game I could find that sparked my interest for one reason or another, delving into the game's story, reviewing its gameplay, and overall just seeing the unique spin fans put on the original series. And with the year coming to an end, I wanted to compile all of these fan game videos into one massive supercut that fans of the FNAF series can come to to get a taste of what the large fan game scene is like. I've also added a few corrections to small things I got wrong in my original videos, as well as a tier list at the very end so you guys can see my final rating on all of these games. Anyways, with that being said, sit back and relax because today we will be diving into the disturbing world of Five Nights at Freddy's fan games. Before starting though, for just one more week, you can actually get your very own Plain Trace plushie over on U2s.com. If you've ever wanted to punch me in the face, or maybe just want to support what I'm doing over here on YouTube, this is the best way to do that. The Plain Trace plushie will only be available until the 14th before it goes away forever, so don't miss your chance and head over to U2s.com to pre-order it today. Regardless if you order a plushie or just stick around to enjoy the content, your guys' support seriously means the world to me. Me. The fact that a plushie of me even exists is all thanks to you, so once again thank you all so much for watching. With that being said though, let's dive straight into the video. Polar Dread is every bit as horrifying, stressful, and chaotic as it can get when it comes to a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. By choosing to make the game virtual reality opposed to just having it be played on the desktop, Polar Dread is able to create some of the most unique experiences when it comes to a FNAF style sit and survive game. And trust me, you will never be just sitting there while playing this game. Whether it's you scrambling to pick up an object off the floor to shut this animatronic up, or hiding under the desk to avoid this thing, Polar Dread always keeps you on your toes and makes sure that you're using your full body and range of motion while trying to survive. And by making the game such a frantic, chaotic experience, it was always able to keep me fully engaged during the nights, with not a dull moment of gameplay. There are a few areas I do think the game could improve, but even with these minor nitpicks, this game still checks out to be an amazing indie horror game experience, and might even be my favorite fan game to date. So with that being said, let's jump straight into Polar Dread, a VR Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. Now the biggest reason why I think Polar Dread is one of the greatest fan games I've ever played is the motion controls. Or more specifically, how the game makes you use your full body and range of motion during each night. On night 1, you are only going against two animatronics, Snark and Perry. Perry comes from the vent that is located behind you periodically throughout the night, and you will need to turn around and press this button to close the vent. If you leave the vent closed for too long, however, you will suffocate and get a game over. For Snark, you will need to watch him on this camera to see where he's at in the building, and basically just when he gets close, you just need to close the door by pressing this button on your desk. And you actually do have a power meter similar to FNAF 1, so you'll need to conserve as much power as possible. And I mean, you have to save a lot of power, because there was a lot of close calls where I had just barely any power left. Now, night 1 starts it off pretty easy, making the only movements you need to do turning around to close the vent, scrolling through the cameras, and closing the door. This, however, will quickly change. On night 2, we are introduced to Slush Bear and this pink toy Bonnie character. I'm not sure what their name is called. Slush Bear's trick is that he is not affected by the door. This means that when you hear Slush Bear's footsteps getting closer, you will need to prepare for him to enter your office. Once standing in your office, you will need to crouch down under the desk to hide from him. 
After a few seconds of being under the desk, he will wander back out of your office. If you are already under the desk before he enters the office, however, he will leave almost right away, which adds a new level of skill to the game, as if you're able to predict when he's coming and crouch before he even enters the office, you will be rewarded by having him exit the office faster. As for the pink bonnie head on the wall, she will basically randomly start making loud noises and singing, and this will basically summon animatronics to your office. You will need to shut her down by picking up one of the objects around the room and throwing it at her. This is actually one of my favorite gameplay features in the whole game, so I'll be talking about it later in the video. But it's around here where you could probably start seeing how this game gets very chaotic very quickly. And this is only night 2. Night 3 introduces two more animatronics once again, with the first one being another one of these animatronic head thingies that you're gonna have to throw stuff at and this guy who goes by the name of Whack E Mole. And his thing is that he will kill you if you are being too loud, which is basically if these guys won't shut up or if you accidentally break bottles, I'm pretty sure, he will just come and kill you. Now that doesn't seem like too much more to deal with in comparison to the jump from night 1 to night 2, but trust me, this game is not easy at all, and it actually took me a lot of attempts before I even beat night 3. And night 4 gets way worse. The first animatronic night 4 introduces is Vicky, and her thing is that this TV in your office will basically turn on, and you will see her peeking her head out of this vent to your left. Similar to Slush Bear, you will need to hide under your desk, and trust me, ducking under the desk over and over is not easy and caused me to get extremely tired and overwhelmed while I was playing. But seriously, when there are moments when you need to crouch under the desk and you realize that you haven't checked the vents in a while, so you need to stand up and turn around as quickly as possible to close it, it can get very tiring. This night also introduces one more animatronic and that is this mouse guy who will pop up on your face and you will just need to grab him off your face and just throw him off. It's pretty fun throwing this guy, and while he's not much of a threat at all, there are a few moments where I remember him popping up at the absolute worst times possible. But one thing I can say for certain about this game is that once you complete a night that you've been stuck on for a while, oh boy does it feel good. This brings me to my second reason why I think this game is just so amazing, and that is the overlapping animatronic mechanics, and the various solutions you can have to these encounters. Unlike some other FNAF fan games where what you should do is very clear, in this game it is not so much. For example, let's say I hear Slush Bear coming, and one of the animatronic heads starts singing. I need to decide whether I'm going to throw the object at one of the animatronic heads before crouching down, or if I should crouch down first and take a riskier shot from a safer spot. This gameplay is so genius, as these split second decisions you need to make constantly left me second guessing myself if I was making the right choice or putting myself in more danger. Another scenario I found myself in a lot is I would be hiding under the desk and I would realize I needed to quickly close the vent, so I would literally have to crawl over to the button just to close the vent. It's just little stuff like this that makes the game so much more immersive. When you're scrambling on the floor for an object to find or a button to press, it just feels so real. One strategy I developed during the later nights when it got extremely hard was I would collect all the objects as soon as the night started and would stack them on my desk so that they were basically all ready to be thrown at a moment's notice. This is one of those things that is only possible in a VR experience and I felt rewarded for coming up with strategies the game doesn't just outright tell you. The throwing mechanic is also a really cool idea I think because even during the most stressful part of the night you will need to make sure that you slow yourself down and be patient with your throw. Because if you try to just toss the object out there, you will most likely miss and need to fumble around for another object to throw. Lastly, I want to talk about the graphics and atmosphere that this game has. As you can tell from seeing the gameplay already, this game is extremely dark, forcing you to use this weak little flashlight you have in order to see anything. 
This isn't like those other horror games where they just give you a very powerful flashlight. No, in this game you will barely be able to see anything even while flashing. And this makes the game feel so much scarier as areas you're not flashing your light feel vulnerable. Like staring down this vent not knowing if there's an animatronic crawling towards you is absolutely terrifying. Or not knowing if there's an animatronic at the door because you're too busy flashing something else in the room. Speaking of the animatronics, I think the animatronics in this game do a really good job on writing that thin line of being creepy while also looking like something that could actually be at a children's entertainment place. I think Perry is definitely the scariest animatronic in the game. Something about how he looks at you while he's crawling is just so creepy. I also really like these head thingies on the wall. It's just a really weird concept, but I think it's pretty cool. Another cool thing I liked which helped the game feel more immersive is the fact that the power along with the time are both shown through your watch that's on your left hand. This cuts out the need for the game to have a HUD and lets you be fully immersed in the world. The animatronics also all have their own distinct voices which helps to give them a little bit more personality. And the game also features some pretty cool music tracks that play during the nights that just add that extra bit of intensity during the gameplay. Now the game is not fully finished yet and there are only 4 nights as of now, but I still see this game as an absolute must play for any Five Nights at Freddy's fan who owns a VR headset. Everything from the motion controls, gameplay mechanics, and atmosphere make it stand out so much to me and succeed in immersing me every time I play. Huge props to everyone who worked on this game, I believe you guys truly made an amazing fan game here that should be looked at as the standard when it comes to a VR Five Nights at Freddy's experience. And I can't wait to not only check out the final night being added to this game, but also any future projects coming from the team. So to answer the question, yes Polar Dread is good and you should definitely play it if you get the chance. After playing Fredbear and Friends Left to Rot, I can confidently say that it stands as the best Five Nights at Freddy's fan game I have ever played. The game offers a polished Five Nights at Freddy's experience with a small scale, easy to follow story. The mechanics feel great from the start to the end and thanks to the amount of variety the game has, it never gets boring. Each night features new gameplay with new ways to stress you out and scare you, and not one night in the game feels inferior to the others. This made my experience while playing Fred Bear and Friends Left to Rot fun all the way through. Typically FNAF fan games start to get frustrating or just flat out too difficult in the later nights, which often overshadows how well made the game is. However, with that trait not being present in this game, it was just such a joy to play through. And let me appreciate how polished this game really is. There is also a ton of extra content outside of that that I want to talk about. But before I start the analysis, I just want to say that this is my personal opinion on what the best FNAF fan game is, and I am in no way saying that this is objectively the best fan game. So if you guys think another fan game is even better than this one, please let me know in the description as I'm trying to play as many fan games as I possibly can. And who knows, it may even become a video in the future. Anyways, let's not waste any more time. Here's why I believe Fred Bear and Friends Left to Rot is the best Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. Upon launching the game, we are met with a cutscene of Fredbear with his mouth covered by an out of order sign. We are then asked to replace Fredbear and Bonnie's parts with a different suit. These additional parts belong to the original Withered Freddy and Bonnie before they were withered. We then place Chica next to the other two animatronics and that concludes the first of many tapes we will interact with throughout this game. After this we are sent to the menu and this is where the real game starts. The game opens up with us riding in a car as a man tells us to make our way to the security room and shut off the cameras and audio system, as requested by the company. We are also told to hide under the desk if any animatronics roam into our office, as they will do that for security reasons. We are also told to look out for a prototype endoskeleton which we will need to shine our light on if we encounter them. Once the man is done talking, we click on the door to enter the establishment and this kicks off night one of the game, which is called the observatory. We load into an office which features a computer in front of us with eight cameras. 
To the right of us is a desk which is looking into a long hallway. We can flash our light down this hallway and also hide under the desk. Our goal for this night is not to survive until 6am but is actually to, like the phone guy said, turn off all the cameras and audio. We need to do this by pressing these buttons that are located on each camera. And this is just such a cool mechanic for the night because you actually need to use these cameras to see how close Fredbear and Spring Bonnie are to reaching the hallway on your right. This adds a lot of strategy to the night as you will need to make decisions on what cameras you should disconnect first and which ones can wait to the end. Disconnecting the video and audio also takes a long time so you will need to be vulnerable while doing it. This leads to a lot of stressful moments in the night where you will be in the middle of disconnecting something when you feel a bad feeling that something is on your right. Are you going to stop the connection and restart your progress to check? Or will you commit to it and get it done and then check if the animatronics are there? The visuals of seeing Fredbear and Spring Bonnie towering over you is also just so terrifying. The animatronic designs just look so threatening and it can sometimes be so shocking when you first see him right in your face that you can't even react fast enough to duck under the desk. I know this happened to me a couple times when I first played. There's also Prototype who you will need to worry about and to stop Prototype you will need to actively check Cam 3 and if you see him standing there you need to just press control to flash him which will cause him to go away. I think it was great to add this third animatronic into the mix for the night as it just adds that little bit more depth to the cameras because now you will not just be going from camera to camera to shut them off but you'll also need to be actively flipping back to cam 3 to stop prototype. After completing this night we are then greeted with the second cutscene of this game. This cutscene opens with Freddy Fazbear who tells us that we need to make sure his performance is in working order. We do this by using this little controller to test if his jaw laugh and body forward buttons are working. After completing that we are brought back to the present moment and we are placed in front of this door. The man guiding us tells us that the first set of security animatronics should have been deactivated and now we can move on to the next room, which is the storage room. The man then tells us to collect all these items sitting on the table before entering the door on our right. And this actually kicks off night 2 of the game which is titled Storage. This night, while simple in concept, is actually really stressful. This time we are placed in front of a curtain and we have this button that we can access on this side of the room. And we also have a door to our right. We complete this night by holding down this button next to the door, which makes it slowly open. Looking away from this door causes your progress you made while opening it to quickly go down. The game of course forces you to look away from the door however, by having this animatronic named Max slowly peek his head out of the curtain. Whenever you hear Max peeking his head out of the curtain, you will need to quickly turn to the left and use the button to close the curtains again, before quickly returning to the door to make sure you don't lose too much progress. This is a very simple concept, but actually leads to a lot of decision making, which is why I love it so much. For example, a lot of times I would be a few seconds into holding the button when I would hear the sound of Max opening the curtain. This would put me in a hard situation. Do I try holding the door for a tiny bit longer to ensure I don't lose progress on the door during my time away? Or do I turn towards Max now and stop him immediately? This makes this part of the game so stressful as you're constantly juggling between the door and Max while slowly making bits of progress. Another genius thing about this night is that you can accidentally press the button to close the curtains when they have not opened yet, which will make the curtains actually open up all the way. This led to a lot of scenarios where I would think I heard Max when I didn't, which would make me quickly turn and push the button. And since the button opens the curtains, I then had to wait a few seconds before I was able to close them again, which costed me precious seconds of having the door open, pretty much setting me back to square one. The way the game punishes you for messing up in a way that makes it feel like it's actually your fault is just so cool, and makes a perfect gameplay section that feels tough but also fair. After getting the door open, we are able to immediately dip out of the storage room which concludes our second night and brings us to our next interactive cutscene. In this one, we are testing out two arcade machines. The first arcade machine is called Golden Comet and it is a little shooting minigame where we just shoot pizzas out of the air. The other arcade machine is a lot creepier though. It's called Sneaky Guy and has us playing as Freddy in a suit and a hat while we walk around empty rooms. The static on the minigame gets louder and louder until eventually the minigame ends. We are then told that that minigame is broken and that concludes this VHS tape. Okay, so now for night 3, which is actually one of my favorites. This room is called Test Room 01 and it takes place in a bedroom. 
In this bedroom, we have a wind-up mouse toy hanging in front of us along with a door. To our right is another door and behind us is a vent that we will need to slowly open. The night is similar to the last as it has us opening a door very slowly while juggling animatronics. However, on this night, the vent will not go down, meaning we can take our time to keep the animatronics at bay. The first animatronic we will need to deal with is the guy that is hanging in front of us. To stop him from triggering a jump scare, it is pretty simple. We just need to make sure he is winded up at all times, which we can do by clicking on him and holding it down until he is winded. The other animatronic that is introduced, however, is our main threat. His name is N Mouski, and just look how scary this guy is. N Mouski will randomly throughout the night peek his head through either the front door or the right door, and we will need to press space to hyper flash him and scare him off. This turns the night into a horrifying balance of three different tasks you are trying to accomplish. And while this night is a lot easier than the previous two, I just find it so scary. The imagery of seeing this giant animatronic peeking through the doorway only a few inches away from your face is just so horrifying to me. The fact that the vent is right behind you in this night also makes you feel like N Mouski is right behind you and ready to kill you every single time you try to move it up a few notches. This night uses your own fear against you as you will always be doubting how long you're spending opening the vent, always fearing that death is around the corner. Another thing I really like about this night is that it starts us off with the man talking to us. However, as he begins explaining to us what to do, his voice slowly glitches out. This caused a lot of panic for me on my first playthrough because up to this point you were expecting him to explain what you need to do, but now that he's gone, it's all up to you to figure it out. Now the game does give you these prompts telling you which things are interactable, which is just such an amazing touch by the way, more fan games need to do this, but they never really tell you what your goal is or how the best way of going about it is. After fighting off N Mouski and crawling through the vent, we are taken to an exit door. However, when we try to click on the door to open it, this happens. After being jump scared, we spawn into what seems to be a repair room with a cassette tape in front of us. The tape has the original spring lock call from Five Nights at Freddy's 3 on it. We can also look to our left during this part to see Golden Freddy sitting against the wall. After this call is over, we move closer to the suit and open it up before crawling inside and putting it on. Upon putting on the suit, a phone call begins telling us how to put on a spring lock suit as our vision slowly goes blurrier and blurrier before cutting to black. Next night up is Night 4 aka Test Room 02 and this is by far the most in-depth and complicated night. This is due to the fact that this night is the most like a traditional FNAF game, featuring cameras, multiple animatronics, and other similar mechanics. So basically we spawn in an office that has an open hallway in front of us. We have a power switch which can turn the power on and off, a camera for checking on the animatronics, and also a gas mask which we will need to put on periodically to keep our toxicity meter down. We can also turn around to check behind us which will come in handy later. On the camera there are also two vents which Freddy and Chica can crawl into along with buttons that deactivate these ventilation systems. Upon seeing Freddy or Chica enter the vent we will need to use this button. However, it does have a drawback, and that drawback is that our toxicity meter will quickly go up. So as soon as Freddy and Chica are gone, you need to reactivate it ASAP. The vents are also the only place Freddy and Chica can come from, by the way. Foxy's mechanic is that he will appear in the hallway, and when he appears, you will just need to turn off the power for a few seconds to hide from him. Nothing too difficult, however, when mixed in with other encounters, it can be a huge inconvenience. And finally, best for last is Bonnie, who will randomly appear behind you throughout the night. When behind you, you can't actually do anything to get rid of him until he leans in to kill you, which he will do a few minutes after arriving. Once leaned in, you will need to turn around and hold space to turn on this fan and scare him away. And I believe this is by far the coolest animatronic mechanic in maybe the whole game. I love that you can't just get rid of him as soon as he appears and you need to wait for him to lean in as it builds so much tension throughout the night. When you are checking the cameras to find Chica and Freddy or turning off the power to get rid of Foxy, the horrifying feeling that Bonnie could lean in at any moment torments you throughout the night and make sure you are on full alert the entire time. These animatronic mechanics may seem simple on their own, however they overlap perfectly and make an amazing office gameplay experience with interesting mechanics and stress inducing moments. Oh and I forgot to mention this night is actually time based, which was a nice change of pace that I really liked. 
After our painfully long six minute shift ends, we are taken to a room with a taken apart spring lock suit in front of us. An audio tape plays which tells us to clean the animatronic suit. After spraying the suit with some cleaning products, the screen then fades to black and the fifth and final night begins. Night 5 is titled The Final Test. In this night, we are tasked with moving the suit from the backstage camera to the upper office room. Before I explain how we do that, let me explain our office layout. In this night, we are put in an office with a window in front of us, a door to the left, and a door to the right. We are also given cables which can be used to shock animatronics that are entering the office, along with a camera to move the suit around in the building. There are four animatronics we are dealing with on this night. The first animatronic is of course the suit, which we will need to move to the upper office like I said earlier. We do this by watching him closely on the camera and pressing this button when his eyes shut off. Once we do this, he will move a few cams closer to the room we need him in. If we do not pay attention to him however, he will slowly approach our office before coming into the left door and killing us. The second animatronic on this night that is trying to stop us is Security Freddy. Security Freddy will appear in the window that is in front of our office and in order to stop him we need to drag this piece of paper over his eyes, which is just such a cool and creative mechanic in my opinion. I have never really seen anything like this in a FNAF fan game before and I just think it's really funny blocking his vision with this little piece of paper. Anyways, the third animatronic hunting us down is Security Bonnie. Security Bonnie will appear in the doorway to our right and we will need to stop him by holding control to pull out our cables and clicking on him to shock him. I love this mechanic so much as well because when you shock Bonnie you get this amazing animation of him twitching around which just looks super cool. It's not very often we get to see this type of animation in a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game so I just appreciate stuff like this a lot. And last but not least we have Security Fredbear who will randomly appear on the cameras. To get rid of Security Fredbear all we need to do is quickly press the reset camera button on the cam he is on. Failing to do this however will result in all the cameras turning off. This night was just so awesome to me as it proved once again that this developer is capable of coming up with creative, cool gameplay features for the animatronics and won't rely too heavily on common FNAF gameplay tropes like most fan games do. The mechanic of sending the suit throughout the building also works so well as it makes you utilize almost every camera in the building while also making us multitask in order to complete the night. Once we do complete the night, we are taken to a screen with a single light bulb above us as it brightens up to reveal the suit is right in front of us. We quickly get a notification to swipe down, however the button which is used to stop this animatronic is broken. The animatronic then springs forward and kills us. We then see a camera pointing towards the bathroom from Five Nights at Freddy's 1. Static fills the camera and then disappears again, revealing the suit waving at us, before once again fading to static. And that is the end of Fred Bear and Friends Left to Rot. Well, at least the tragic ending as there are actually two endings in this game, which is just so cool. So remember when we entered the door to go to the storage room? Well, if we actually disobey the guy commanding us around and instead turn left and walk down this dark hallway, we are taken to a keypad. If we then enter the code 321975, which is obtainable during the arcade mini games, the safe opens up revealing to us a fully intact remote. We can then play through the rest of the game as normal and once we get to that final cutscene of the suit in front of us, we can actually pull out the working remote and stop the suit. This unlocks a new cutscene where the tape guy tells us that Fredbear and Bonnie are being put away in boxes and the company will be shutting down soon due to the CEO William Afton disappearing. We then see a final shot of the building with text that just reads, The End. I seriously love this so much. It's so sick that if you actually diverge paths and find this secret remote, it gives you the ability to save yourself from the suit. I love when FNAF games do these alternate endings. It just adds that little bit more replayability and just makes the whole experience feel like you actually have agency in it. Now I do have one complaint about this secret ending however. And that is the fact that there is no way to get the good ending on your first playthrough, as the arcade sections come after the only opportunity you have to visit the keypad. This sucks in my opinion, because I think it would be so cool if you were able to figure this out on your first playthrough of the game. I mean the satisfaction of stopping the suit at the end of the game only to find out later that that was only due to your smart thinking and exploration of the map would have been amazing. The developer should have seriously had the keypad hidden in a section that comes after the arcades in my opinion, but besides that minor nitpick, there is really nothing else I can say negatively about this game. 
Oh yeah, and I haven't even mentioned yet that this game features an extra menu and a completely new mode, which is a custom night, with traditional office gameplay like we are used to in most FNAF games. And I was fully expecting this to just be a reskin of the Night 4 office, just with the other animatronics added, but no. The developer actually went out of his way to make a completely brand new area and mechanics for this custom night. There are also extras featured in the game where we can see character models, replay mini games and cutscenes, screenshots of the game's development, and also an insane mode, which does take place during the Night 4 section of the game, only with extremely aggressive animatronics. Both Insane Mode and Custom Night also feature their own exclusive endings, which I will play right now. So here's the Insane Mode ending. I'm terribly sorry it had to end this way. Maybe there's a way to communicate with him? Probably not. But after you're done, I'll send in a team to go after Afton. And here is the Custom Night ending. So yeah, it goes without saying that this game not only has stunning visuals, polished original gameplay ideas, and a cool easy to follow story, but it is also packed full of content for a FNAF styled game, with enough stuff to hold you over for a few hours even after completing your first playthrough. All of these reasons are why I believe Fredbear and Friends Left to Rot is the best FNAF fan game I've ever played. I'll leave a link down in the description if you guys want to check it out for yourself. And with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Baby's Nightmare Circus was a FNAF fan game that was released over 5 years ago, yet to this day is one of the most impressive fan games I've ever played. The gameplay is one thing, but what stood out to me the most was the graphics. Now, it's not that they look hyper realistic or anything like that, but it's actually the way the developer is able to replicate Scott's style of modeling. I'm not even joking, when I started playing this game, I started to ask myself, you know, what if Scott actually secretly made this game and just disguised it as a fan game? Now this obviously isn't true as the game was created by Mixless, I think that's how you pronounce it, who I mentioned earlier went on to make Tyke and Sons Lumber Company, but this just goes to show the talent behind the game. The graphics alone was enough to draw me in to check it out for myself, but I was also very excited to see the sister location characters used in a different way. Over the past few months, I have grown to not really like sister location too much, despite loving all of the characters in it. So to be able to see these characters in a much more interesting setting was really exciting for me. So today we are going to dive into the world of Baby's Nightmare Circus to see how good the game really is. Now the first thing I want to talk about in this review is the gameplay. Before that though, I just want to say that there are two types of gameplay. There is the left side of the levels which I will classify as the main game, and the right side which I'll just call the side missions so it's easier to understand. Now to beat the game you do have to do all of these missions, but think of the left side as like the office kind of gameplay, and the right side being more akin to the fun with plush trap style of FNAF gameplay. The game allows you to do the missions in whichever order you want, but I'll just go over the left side first. During these main missions, you are placed in the middle of four tents. There are two in front of you and two behind you. Clicking on one of these tents causes your character to run up to it. You then get an animation that lasts about 10 seconds before arriving in front of whichever section you are trying to check on. This gameplay focuses a lot on managing all of your resources and knowing which tent to check on at which times. The front left tent has Circus Baby in it. To stop her from killing you, you must flash her every once in a while to make sure that she doesn't escape the tent. If you walk in and she is right in your face, you will need to immediately run out or you will be jump scared. The front right tent features the Nightmare Biddy Babs. I think that's what they're called, I'm not actually sure. Very similarly to Circus Baby, you will need to walk in and flash them to stop them from killing you. These Biddy Babs will appear a lot more often than Circus Baby and will be the main reason for most of your deaths but luckily there is an indicator when they start to appear. See, when they start to appear, your screen will start to flash black, and if you let it flash for too long, then you're dead. 
The back left tent features Nightmare Ballora. To stop her from killing you, you need to run into her tent and just watch her spin around for a little bit. Think of this kind of like a music box. If the bar reaches zero, you die, so you need to keep it up throughout the entire night. The back right tent is very similar to this. You need to run into the tent and hold W to wind up the music box. The music box takes longer to wind up than Ballora, but also runs out slower. This is where the resource management comes in. There are so many moments where you will need to decide which tent you can afford skipping over from one loop around the circus, and this leads to a very tension-filled and stressful gameplay loop. Let's say I only have Ballora up 3 bars and my screen starts to flash black. Do I wind it up all the way before getting rid of the bitty babs, or do I just stick it out? Because if I leave Ballora and go immediately to the bitty babs, then I will need to return to Ballora right after, which will waste precious time I need to check on Circus Baby and wind up the music box. It's very hard to explain how this gameplay loop works, as it sounds rather simple on paper, but when you are actually playing it, the whole thing just feels very stressful. The way the game makes you second guess yourself is something you don't see too often. Now the time it takes to run up to the tents does get annoying after a while, but at the same time it's definitely necessary. There were a lot of times I would be running up to a tent hoping I made it in time before I was jump scared. The gameplay always had me on my toes and I thought it was very engaging. This is not one of those games where you can just zone out. You need to be constantly remembering how close each tent is to jump scaring you so that you're able to manage everything accordingly. The first night serves as kind of a tutorial mission. Then after this we get the next three levels. They are the same gameplay wise with the only difference being that they get progressively harder. Then for the final two nights the game introduces the fun times which replace the sister location cast. Circus Baby is now Nightmare Funtime Freddy and Ballora is now Nightmare Funtime Foxy. This was a pretty cool addition, however the gameplay doesn't switch up at all which I found pretty disappointing. It also didn't feel any harder than the previous nights, so I would just think of these nights kind of like the Halloween update on FNAF 4, basically just reskins of the animatronics. I really wish these fun times had different gameplay from the sister location cast because this is something that the game severely lacks during these levels. Each night plays exactly the same, so there's never that feeling of the unknown during the later nights. Once I made it through the medium night, which was very hard, I had no worries for the actual hard night because I already felt like I mastered the gameplay. Now luckily we do get some variety via the right side of the mission list. The first three levels in this section take place in a new area of the circus. Now instead of having two tents in front of us and two tents in back, we now have three tents in front of us. The gameplay works like this. For the first night, the mini Rena will appear in one of the three tents, and you must use your flashlight to scare them off. If she is on the left, you will need to keep your light off until she goes away. If she is on the right, you will need to keep your light on until she goes away. And if she is in the middle, you need to flash your light. And I just need to go on a quick rant really fast. The hardest part of this entire thing was not the memorization or the time you had to survive. No, it was sticky keys. For some reason, the developer thought it was a good idea to make the flashlight only turn on by pressing the shift key. And since you need to spam the light to get rid of them, I was constantly getting sticky keys. Just listen to this gameplay. You can hear it spamming while I was trying to beat the level. No matter how many times I clicked this switch to turn off sticky keys, it kept happening. Turns out you need to turn off every single one of these features just to get it to work. I hate sticky keys. Anyways, once you get that problem out of the way, it might seem a little bit too easy. And well, it kind of is, but this isn't where the trick comes in. The trick actually comes in during the second and third night of this. These nights feature different animatronics, and with each different animatronic, they switch up the order. So now, if they are on the left, instead of keeping the light off, you need to hold it on. And instead of turning it off when they are on the right, you need to flash it. And instead of flashing the middle, you need to turn it off. This messed me up a lot because you already kind of program your brain to memorize it a certain way, and I think this was a really smart way to do it. It makes each night really stressful and makes sure you can't master the gameplay as it's always switching it up on you. 
Besides the sticky key issue, I think this is a really cool gameplay concept and appreciate how the game messes with your memorization. If the game really wanted to step the difficulty up though, I think it would have been cool if there was a night where multiple of the animatronics were there at once. That would have been very hard to memorize if there was two you were interacting with at the same time. Anyways, the next side missions also switch it up. The next mission is called End Nights and has you going against only Nightmare Entered, and this night just wasn't very good in my opinion. Unlike the previous nights, this one takes place back at the original circus, but instead of having you check on every animatronic, you only need to focus on Ennard. And this night just wasn't very good in my opinion. The way this one works is very basic. You need to constantly find out which tent Ennard is in and then go in there and flash him. Now how do you find out where he is exactly? Well each tent has its own sound cue. Once you know which sound cue leads to which tent, it's really easy. However, the game doesn't tell you which sound cue means which tent, so essentially it's just trial and error until you figure it out. And once you figure it out, it's not scary or stressful at all. So yeah, that's End Nights. And for the final one, we have Baby Geist Attacks. And this one is actually the final mission in the game and leads to the ending. You have to play this one last, so before I explain the gameplay, I just want to preface this by stating that I think this one is supposed to be more for the story and not actually gameplay oriented. This is because the gameplay is not really anything. You need to go from tent to tent until you find Baby Geist, and once you find her, you just need to press S to shock her. You just keep running around doing this until you eventually win. There is no real way to figure out which tent she's in, so it's all a guessing game on this one. And they give you so long between running from tent to tent that I don't even think you are supposed to die at this part. The only way I know you can die is by shocking a room that she is not in by accident. Again, just like the Nights one, this night wasn't great in my opinion. I do like the concept of Baby Geist and having to catch her and shock her, but the execution just wasn't great. Alright, so now let's talk about the game's graphics. And I'm going to try not to sound like a broken record, but just one last time I need to appreciate how accurate these models are to Scott's iconic style. Everything down to the way the gradient is on the animatronic's teeth, the blocky style of withering, and how everything is textured just looks so insanely like Scott's style. Other than this, I also think the animatronic designs are all great. They all do a great job of understanding the design philosophies used to turn the other animatronics into their nightmare variations from the previous games, and I think if Scott were to really make nightmare versions of these characters, they wouldn't be far off from how they appear in this game. The environments also look great and give off such an eerie vibe. The atmosphere just perfectly replicates those old FNAF games. One thing this game actually does better than the Scott games though in my opinion is the animation. Now this game, just like Scott's games, was using Click Team Fusion, which is a very limiting software. But even with those limitations, the developer has done some truly amazing things, such as the way Ballora and Funtime Foxy dances in front of us, or the twitching animation that the animatronics do during some of the side missions, or even things like seeing the music box actually physically move when you are winding it up. All of these things are just so good at making the world feel more real than any of Scott's games. After playing enough of FNAF 1 through 4, the illusion eventually wears off and it's kind of hard to not look at the game as just a sequence of PNGs and videos, but the way this game handles the movement and animations brings it to life in a way that I haven't seen much FNAF Click Team games do. The jump scares also look great. Not only are they actually pretty scary, but they also do a perfect job of replicating how Scott would do the jump scares. Putting some of the jump scares side by side with Scott's shows that Mixless really went the extra mile to make everything have that made by Scott feel. Now if I could give the game one criticism, it would be that I think the running back and forth animation could have been a little better, especially since you were doing it constantly while playing. I think FNAF 4 did a little bit of a better job selling the illusion that you are actually running, but it definitely isn't so bad that it can't be overlooked. The game also has a small story to follow. The game opens up with dialogue between you and this mysterious character. Our character seems to be a game developer maybe, I mean we might even be playing Scott here but I'm not really sure. And after going to sleep we wake up in Baby's Circus. We are told by someone that we did not listen to our own heart and that we are lost in our mind, whatever that means. 
and after beating the game, our player states that we finally beat our own corrupted game. We are told by the mysterious voice that we remove the baby geist from the game, but there is still one more problem. The baby geist always comes back. The voice then tells us goodnight and we get the baby geist ending. Now there are apparently a few other endings, but I have not seen these yet, nor do I really have the urge to check them out. I feel like the game doesn't really do a good enough job of hooking the player from the start to keep them exploring the lore. And I also feel like each night should have added more and more to the story. It feels like the story was almost an afterthought and that's why I'm mainly focusing on the gameplay here. But for the people who do enjoy the more lore side of FNAF games, it's good that the developer made an effort to include something. Now before we end off this video, I also want to mention some miscellaneous things the game does which brings it up that extra notch. First of all, there are these rewards which you get after every single night. Now some of these are just cool little things to look at, but I'm actually pretty sure some of these you need in order to get the other endings. Now it's not much, but it's just nice to at least unlock something after every single night, and feel like you're being rewarded for the time you're spending playing the game. There is also an extra menu, very similar again to the ones you would see in Scott's games. You can look at all the animatronics, the jump scares, how the characters were modeled, and also some of the unused material which was actually pretty interesting to see. After completing the game, you also unlock a classic mode, which according to the wiki is an extra feature that was added a year after the game was released, which has you surviving 5 nights from Biddy's game. Now I'm not going to cover this in this video as it really feels like its own individual game, but if you guys do want to see me talk about it in the future then definitely let me know down below. Overall, I think that Baby's Nightmare Circus does everything a FNAF fan game should do. It gives off that FNAF feeling in both the gameplay and the graphics. It's a fun short experience which challenges your memorization and decision making. The gameplay is fun and also can be very scary at times. And the game also provides a ton of content which will keep you busy for probably around 2 days. Let me know what you guys think about the game in the comments down below. Also let me know if there are any other fan games that I really need to check out. Anyways, thank you guys as always for sticking around to the end of the video. And I will see you in the next one. Peace. A few days ago while scrolling through Game Jolt, I stumbled across a game that seemed very interesting to me. The game was titled The Twisted Carnival and despite never seeing it before, the thumbnail looked very promising. After clicking on the game to see more of the screenshots, I was met with this screen right here, which only heightened my curiosity towards this game. This game is tagged for mature audiences. It could contain content you may not want to view. The game is also listed to have cartoon violence, intense fantasy violence, and even realistic blood. And this all just got me very excited as I really dislike how kid friendly the series has become, especially in the recent years. The screenshots themselves also looked great. I mean, especially the prize place and wackaboy minigame screenshots. They both just had that nostalgic Scott vibe that I really only get from a few fan games. In a few of the other screenshots on the page, we can also see how the animatronics actually look. And let me just say, this Toy Chica design is one of the most horrifying things I've ever seen come out of a FNAF fan game. This excitement I had towards the game quickly turned to disappointment, however. Upon finding out that only a demo of the game had been released, and the developer has yet to post any updates in over two years. Alright, so this is the uh, first correction of the supercut. Basically in this video, I was saying that the game was cancelled when it actually isn't cancelled. The game is still being developed to this day, with a demo even releasing 3 months ago. So yeah, this game isn't cancelled, and I'm actually really looking forward to when the full game releases. Anyways, let's get back to the video. So unfortunately, I think it's safe to say that this project was cancelled. And that's really such a shame because the screenshots do look so promising. Luckily though, we do still have the demo, which surprisingly has a lot of stuff to check out. So I went ahead and played it for myself to talk about with you all today. So join me as we look into The Twisted Carnival, a cancelled FNAF fan game. 
The game opens up with a traditional Five Nights at Freddy's menu. We got new games, settings, and extras, which I will get into later. We can also see who looks to be Freddy and Bonnie just staring at us right here. Upon actually starting a new game, we are shown a cool little loading screen with a sign that reads, Help Wanted, Nightly Security Guard, Monday through Friday. After this, we are thrown directly into the game, and instead of taking place in an office, we are instead stationed in one of those booths from the carnival. We can use our flashlight to check what is in front of us, and also use this button up top to close the curtain on any approaching animatronics. Behind us, we have a computer, and there's also this wooden doll to our left. And oh my god, this thing, it, it gives me flashbacks. This wooden doll needs to be looked at from time to time, and if you do not check on it enough, you will be jump scared. On the computer screen, we are able to observe the entire carnival. There are 9 cameras in total and they are laid out in this convenient grid pattern to make sure we can see everything as easily as possible. For night 1, we must fend off against Bonzo and Chixie, who are this game's versions of Bonnie and Chica. Bonzo and Chixie from time to time will wander around until they eventually reach your window. When at this window, you will need to hold the button above you for a few seconds until they go away. And let me just say, the way these animatronics look when standing right at the window, especially Chixie, is just so scary. Also present in Night 1 is Bearhug, who is this game's version of Freddy. Bearhug is much different from Bonzo and Chixie, however, as he will not appear on the cameras. So to get rid of him, you will need to listen in for when he is getting close, and because the curtains also don't work on Bear Hug, you will need to instead shine your light on him to stop him from killing you. Think of it kind of like the way Foxy worked in FNAF 2. However, the difference with Bear Hug is he doesn't actually leave and will stay there the whole night. So you're really just flashing him to stop him from killing you, opposed to flashing him to get him to go away, if that makes sense. After completing night 1, we are brought into our first mini game. And these mini games are kind of formatted as cutscenes and they are done in such a sick style. The presentation in these really is just so great. This cutscene depicts David, who is the phone guy who talked to us in FNAF 1. David is talking to his mother. His mother tells him that he cannot keep doing this and it is not healthy for him. However, David believes something deeper is going on at the carnival. Apparently something with faulty wires occurred at the carnival, leading to the loss of David's sister. And David being an ex-cop feels the urge to dig deeper into the events that took place. While his mom feels it is unhealthy for him and he should just believe the police report. After reading through that first minigame, I was loaded into an arcade version of the carnival. And after roaming around for a little bit, I ran into this NPC who invited me to play the prize roulette. The description read, Cycle through a gauntlet of games. Complete as many as you can before the time runs out. Reward, tickets. So, I of course hit yes. In this game, I was supposed to be hitting these cones with a ball, but I was just very confused the entire time. I did eventually manage to get all the pins though, just out of pure luck. The whole time there's this funny wooden guy just dancing in the background, and for some reason this whole thing just gives me pizzeria simulator vibes. Just the way these minigames are structured really reminds me of the minigames from that game. After knocking down all those pins, I was brought on to the next game, which was one where I was supposed to shoot this marionette head. At least I think that's what I was supposed to do. Just like the last one, I had really no idea what I was doing, but somehow managed to actually get through it, bringing me to the last game that I got to try. Now in this one, I was supposed to spam click on this hammer to hit it, I'm pretty sure, but I only had 3 seconds left for my countdown, so I didn't even get to see what happened. Anyways, after all of those mini games, you are brought to this neat little gift shop where you are able to spend all the tickets that you just earned. And I think that this is just a really cool concept. Especially because some of these rewards will actually help you in game. Like these flashlight batteries which will make your flashlight last longer, or the computer chip which will add a motion sensor to your cameras. Or you know, you could just buy some cool plushies for your desk. Alright, so now moving on to night 2. And tonight, a few more threats are added such as Foxtrot, who is this game's version of Foxy. Foxtrot needs to be monitored on the cameras. He will first begin in his booth until he eventually moves on to this camera right here. After moving on to this camera, he will then run away and eventually show up in this window, which is behind you, located behind the wooden doll's head. When Foxtrot arrives at this window, you will need to turn around and look directly at him. This will cause Foxtrot to run around the tent up to your window, where you can then turn around and close the curtain to get him to go away. Other than Foxtrot, more characters will be added depending on which minigame you played. For example, two characters who are able to be added are Cotton and Shopkeep. 
Shopkeep will appear in your room at random and they are pretty simple to get rid of. You just need to click on him and then turn around and click on him again one more time and he will go away. Cotton on the other hand is way more annoying. Think of Cotton as a different version of Balloon Boy. They will appear in your office at random and just mess everything up. In my game, they shut off my computer, leaving me with absolutely no knowledge of where the animatronics were. Just like Balloon Boy in FNAF 2, to my knowledge there is no way to get rid of Cotton, but then again, I could be wrong. There's also these other wooden dolls which I got in my game, and basically you will have these three different masks in the top left of your office, and each mask scares off a different one of these three mannequins which will sometimes appear in your office. Now these guys were pretty easy to deal with because it's not like putting on the wrong mask will instantly result in death, so they didn't really cause too much trouble during my playthrough. One more notable thing about Night 2 is during the Night 2 phone call we learn a little bit more about the story. David admits to the player that he is a private investigator and then tells us about how three weeks ago a group of five kids went on the ferris wheel, only to come down not breathing. Doctors were unable to explain what happened to the five kids, however David doesn't buy it and thinks something deeper is happening. After finishing up night 2, we are then brought to another minigame. This minigame depicts David speaking with the owner of the carnival. The owner tells David that he's very busy and to make it quick. David asks him if anything strange has happened lately, to which the owner responds saying, Nothing much, just over half of my workers quitting or vanishing on me. He then talks about how all the employees were scared after the police showing up, before letting David know that he is free to have a look around the place, as long as he doesn't break anything. After this, we are then set free into the minigame carnival once again, and this time I foolishly played Cotton's game, adding him to my night 3. His minigame was pretty fun though. You needed to try to get as many cotton candy pieces into this bucket as you could, and while the concept is very simple, it worked the best out of all the mini games I had played up to that point. After finishing that up, I actually earned quite a bit of tickets and went ahead and bought myself both the battery and the computer chip before moving on to the third and final night of the demo. Other than the addition of cotton, there was no new animatronics added to night 3. This was very unfortunate as I was really looking forward to seeing what other characters the game would have in store. Looking on the wiki, the game does seem to have a lot more characters though, so I'm guessing if I had chosen different minigames, there would be some new characters. Now after getting through night 3 relatively easily due to my newly upgraded flashlight, I got the final minigame. This one has us roaming around the carnival once again, however this time it looks different. Instead of wearing green, now everything is shrouded in purple. We even have what appears to be the same badge that the purple guy has. Now it's not yellow in this game, but it is in the same spot. I'm not sure if this was leading up to something like us actually being the killer, but it's a cool detail nonetheless. Anyways, we just have to walk around interacting with different parts of the carnival to learn more about the area and how worn down it has become, before eventually finding the exit and leaving, which ends off this demo. Now other than the extras menu, which features a work in progress custom night, there really isn't much else to check out from the game. Based on the demo alone though, I do think that this fan game has serious potential. I mean, all of the pieces are there. Horrifying animatronics with interesting gameplay, a unique eerie setting, and an interesting story. As well as some new additions such as the carnival sections and the gift shop. It really is such a shame that this game never ended up seeing the light of day, as I would have really loved to discover more about the story as well as survive against many more animatronics. Now one thing that did dawn on me after playing through this game was that it was a little dramatic labeling itself as a mature game. I mean it states to have realistic blood and all this stuff, but to my knowledge it just wasn't present. Maybe it was going to be added later in the finished product, or maybe show up in a later night, but I guess we will never know. Let me know what you guys thought about this game though. Also consider leaving a like if you guys enjoyed and subscribing to see all of my future uploads. Thank you everybody so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video. Peace. Just a few days ago, a brand new fan game dropped, and after I played it for myself, I have come to the conclusion that this is my new favorite fan game. This game is called The Glitched Attraction. The Glitched Attraction combines free-roaming FNAF gameplay with various puzzle-filled escape rooms. 
This leads to a perfectly challenging but fair gameplay system which will continue to evolve throughout the game's 6 levels. Each level is completely unique to the last, featuring a new location, a new set of animatronics, and new gameplay mechanics. The story is also very interesting throughout the entire game, and all of these things combined just make the game feel very polished and like a complete package. The game has a very clear beginning and end which cannot be said for a lot of fan games, and the way they tie it off at the end is really cool, so make sure you stick around to see that. The more I played through this game, the more I wish that Security Breach would have been more like this. A very graphically impressive way to explore unique areas of the Pizzaplex while also offering puzzle styled gameplay to keep us engaged. I think that this system of going from room to room solving puzzles works a lot better than the open world style of design that Security Breach took on. The structure of the game just felt so much tighter and just way more fun in my opinion. The animation work also just ties the whole thing together so well graphically, making the world feel more real than any FNAF game I've played in the past. Like for example how Molten Freddy will just chase you after he crawls out of the vent. The fantastic work that has been done to bring this game to life cannot be understated. So enough rambling, let's take a deep dive into the glitched attraction and see all of the reasons why this has become my favorite Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. Right away when launching the game, I knew I was in for a great experience. Not only does the menu look great, but this game has one of the hardest OSTs in any FNAF game I've played. Looking at the other options on the menu, we can see that there are a few other features, such as an extras menu, achievement menu, and even a backgrounds menu, all of which I will cover more in depth towards the end. After actually clicking new game and starting your run, the game opens up with a fully animated cutscene. The cutscene shows our friend, who texts us and tells us to go to the new Fazbear attraction. Our character then reaches for the phone and the cutscene fades to black. The game then opens up which finally kicks off the actual gameplay. We are in the lobby of the new Fazbear attraction, and similarly to Help Wanted, we are told that we will be experiencing moments throughout the FNAF story. Oh yeah, and the guy who tells us all of this is one of those bots from Security Breach. I'm not actually sure what this one's name is, but I'm sure you guys will know. So after he's done with his explanation on the attraction, we give this robot all of our things and continue forward. We are then given a quick tip screen, basically just explaining how we can learn what to do during the nights, before moving on to this room right here. It's so cool being able to see the FNAF 1 animatronics actually performing and being able to free roam around the room. The models look so accurate and the animations for them performing is really cool. After looking at how good these animatronic models look for however long you want, we can then make our way down a vent which leads us to the very first night of the game. The first night of the game you guys may actually recognize as it has actually been released prior as a demo a few years back getting coverage from YouTubers such as Markiplier. I even almost made a video about the demo actually, before I decided to hold off because I found out the game was going to be releasing soon. Anyways, I'm assuming most people haven't seen this yet or have forgotten most of the details over time, so I am still going to cover it in this video. This level takes place in the FNAF 4 house and features 4 animatronics who will try to kill us as we attempt to escape the room. Nightmare Balloon Boy will sit in a chair in the corner of the room and needs to be flashed from time to time. Failing to do this will result in Balloon Boy killing us. Similar to Balloon Boy, the Freddles will also begin spawning into your room at random. You will know they are there by the noise they emit when they are present and can also be dealt with by just shining your light on them. Nightmare Marionette will sometimes randomly appear during the night as well. You will know they have appeared as their tentacles will begin coming out of the wall just above the bed. And to avoid dying to Nightmare Marionette, you will need to slowly put on this Golden Freddy suit, which for some reason is here, and this will actually cause Nightmare Marionette to do a quick scan around the room before disappearing. Now I'm not really sure why the Golden Freddy suit is what helps you get away from Nightmare Marionette. It seems kind of random, but if you guys know what that means, just let me know down below. For the fourth and final animatronic who is out to kill us, we of course have Nightmare Fredbear. Nightmare Fredbear will be outside of your window as a huge version of himself. He will slowly make his way closer and closer to the window, so you will need to keep tabs on him and close the curtains once his face is very close. Failing to do this quickly enough will cause you to die. 
Okay, so now that we know what the animatronics do, how do we actually escape? So the first thing we actually need to do is fix this puzzle of Freddy that is on the wall. And it's pretty simple, you just click on the blocks to rotate them until they are all in the right position. However, this is easier said than done as it can be really stressful when you know that Balloon Boy is behind you and you need to check on Nightmare Fredbear. And also one more thing preventing us from finishing the puzzle is one piece is actually missing. To get this, we need to open all of the drawers around the room until we eventually find two keys. These two keys can be used to unlock the FNAF 4 box, which is sitting on top of the dresser. And inside this box, we have the last piece, which can be placed down on the puzzle, allowing us to complete it. The wall then moves down to reveal a code. We can then enter this code into a small safe, which is located under the nightstand. And after typing in the code and unlocking the safe, we get a hammer. Finally, we can use this hammer to break the wooden boards on the closet and escape. Before getting out though, Nightmare Bonnie spawns out of nowhere. Bonnie will start to creepily walk towards you as you just nearly make it out of the place alive. Which concludes night 1 of the game. And I think that this night is excellent. Now it is a bit of a learning curve, getting used to the escape room type gameplay and also how the first person mechanics feel. However, I feel that the difficulty of this first level is balanced just perfectly to get you ready for the rest of the game. The animatronic mechanics all work great and never feel unfair or unpredictable. They are also very easy to memorize, so this night isn't overcomplicated at all. The stage also looks so great. All of the animations here are so cool. Especially Bonnie's creepy walk, I just think it looks so good. Overall, this was a great way to open up the game. A small, simple level to get us ready for what's ahead. Night 2 was a big surprise for me when I played it for the first time as it was actually extremely challenging. This night takes place in the Five Nights at Freddy's 2 location and features three animatronics who are trying to kill us. Mangle, Toy Chica, and Withered Freddy, who is now funnily enough placed in this box. Withered Freddy now needs to be winded up very similarly to the puppet. This winding is actually very interesting however, mainly because now not only do we need to worry about not winding it up enough, but now we also need to be worried about overwinding it, as if you do so, Freddy will break out of the box and kill you. This brand new feature is also perfectly complemented by the fact that there is no HUD element there to tell you how much the music box has been winded up. The only way to actually tell if the box needs to be winded up is by the pitch that the music is playing. This works so great as you never really are able to tell how much you should wind up the music box and this leads to very stressful, tension filled moments every time you crank this gear because you're just waiting in fear that you might over crank it and Freddy will break out of the box. Toy Chica will wander around the play area in a circular motion. If you are seen by Chica or heard running around her, she will chase you down and jump scare you. You are faster than Chica however and can lose her in multiple ways. The main way of losing Chica is running and hiding in a nearby locker. However, I did find out later that this is unnecessary as Chica will quickly lose sight of you. This means that you can run away for a few seconds before crouching in a dark corner and she will likely lose you. Mangle on the other hand is a little different. Mangle will only appear every so often, and before appearing you will hear them running around in the vents. This is a sign that you need to hide in a locker immediately as if you fail to do so, Mangle will catch you and kill you. Unlike Chica, Mangle will kill you if you are in a locker and will not forget where you are, so you really need to be listening in for those vent noises. These three animatronics gameplay mechanics work so well in conjunction with each other. The way Chica's scanning of the area makes Winding Freddy's music box even that much more stressful, and how listening for Mangle in the vents can be more difficult when paying attention to Freddy's music are just a few examples of why this level works so good. To actually escape this room, it's quite a bit different than night 1. So first off, in the beginning, we actually just need to avoid Toy Chica. There are 6 sticky notes scattered around the room, showing us the code to a door. We need to sneak around the pizzeria gathering these codes and writing them down while also avoiding Chica. This part was actually very stressful for me on my first time playing, so you can only imagine my fear as a player once I turned on these switches and saw Freddy power up as I knew that Chica wasn't the only animatronic I would be facing. 
now that all of the animatronics are powered up, we must again go out into the room. This time to find gear parts which can be connected to this wall. These gears will spawn in very hidden and hard to find places and can be only carried one at a time over to the wall. One of these was even so hidden that I straight up just had to look it up. Because the whole time I had been searching around the floors for this gear, and it turns out they hid it in Bonnie's mouth. Luckily, after a long and grueling process of collecting the gears, a door opens up which leads us to the exit of night 2. One last thing I want to mention though before moving on to night 3 is how much I love the ambience of this part. All of the sound effects during this level play such a good role in making this whole experience so creepy. We even see the return of some classic FNAF ambience sounds in this level which I really enjoyed hearing, alongside some pretty cool scripted moments which would happen in the background, like this withered foxy that kept twitching outside of this window. Things like this that the game included just had me on edge the whole time I was playing, cause I didn't know if Withered Foxy was going to become one of the animatronics to survive against at any moment. Night 3 is actually the most accurate night to its original game. This night takes place in the FNAF 3 office with some very minor changes, and has us fighting against pretty much the same animatronics. We have Phantom Foxy, Phantom Balloon Boy, Springtrap, and now the newly added Dreadbear. Phantom Foxy and Phantom Balloon Boy act exactly like how they did in FNAF 3. You need to avoid looking at them and if you fail to do this, they will cause you to panic and also shut off your equipment. Springtrap you will need to monitor on the cameras in order to prevent him from reaching your office. However, in this version of the game, instead of using an audio device to lure Springtrap, you now just have doors on your left and right. As for Dreadbear, he can be monitored on the cameras and will be seen moving closer and closer to your office. He will eventually reach a camera which signifies he is about to run. Once he reaches this camera, you need to quickly crouch under the desk and wait for Dreadbear to run in. While managing all these animatronics, you also need to once again worry about escaping. The first step to escaping is that we need to find this code which is hidden somewhere in the room. This has a random chance of spawning in many different areas and is actually quite hard to find. After getting this code, we can then enter it into this keypad that is on the back wall, which will verify the code, opening a small hole in the wall. In this hole, there is a key, which then can be placed into the arcade machine, which I forgot to mention is present in this office. Yeah, there's an arcade machine in here. And now we must proceed to play an entire mini version of FNAF World in order to obtain a code while still trying to survive against these animatronics. This arcade game itself just has us walking back and forth talking to different NPCs and giving them different items, which takes a really long time. They're basically just trying to get you to walk from one point of the map to the other over and over just to take as long as possible. After completing the mini version of FNAF World, the arcade then shows us this weird sequence of Springtrap dying before then switching over to a screen with a hidden code. We now need to decrypt this code by looking at the key given to us in the bottom right of the screen, and once we have our code memorized, we can then input it into this box on our desk. This will grant us another key, and this one actually allows us to set the FNAF 3 pizzeria up in flames. A small vent opens up in the floor which allows us to escape, but as soon as we are leaving, this happens. Now to be completely honest, while the ending of this night was really sick, it probably is the weakest night in my opinion. I really did like the challenge of balancing time spent on the cameras watching Springtrap and time spent on the arcade machine, and I also really liked the inclusion of Dreadbear, not only because of his design being really fitting, but his gameplay mechanic was also just really cool. But the arcade machine taking up most of the night did kind of feel cheap, but I do see how it would have been hard to come up with more concepts for the player to do during the nights. Overall, it's not a bad night, it's just not my favorite in the game. Alright, so next up is night 4, which is actually probably my second favorite night in the game. This one takes place during sister location and yet again brings a cool spin to the gameplay. In this night, we are surviving against Funtime Freddy, Funtime Foxy, and Ballora. 
Every once in a while you will hear Ballora's music playing, which means she will either be coming from the left or right side. You will need to figure out which side she is coming from and push the appropriate sides button. This will set up a wall of electricity that Ballora will then walk into, which sends her back. If we fail to press the button or press the button at an incorrect time, Ballora will kill us. Funtime Freddy can be seen through a glass window on the left side of the room. We have the option to flash a light on him and also the option to control shock him. We must not shock him too often but also only enough to stop him from killing us. We can tell when to shock him as we are able to see his eyes kind of glowing in the dark and if you see Freddy's eyes getting closer to the door, you can then shock him which will send him back to his original spot. Funtime Foxy works in a very similar way. They are stationed behind a window on the right side of the room and also have a feature to flash a light or do a controlled shock. Foxy will every once in a while begin to glitch out. This requires us to shock Foxy in a quick enough time frame or else we will be killed. And unlike Funtime Freddy, you actually can't see Funtime Foxy's eyes glowing. Meaning the only way to know if they are glitching is to actually check the light or listen for a very faint audio cue Foxy will make when they begin to glitch. Okay, so now that we know how to deal with all of the animatronics, how do we escape night 4? Well, firstly you may have noticed that there is a broken down circus baby in the middle of the room. And this ties directly into what we need to do. So first things first, we need to just open this drawer and insert the CPU input into this computer. This will then open up a computer menu which allows us to order various parts for Circus Baby. We need to look at the diagram of her on the computer and attach the proper parts in order to rebuild her. When attaching a new part, if the part makes a noise when placed, that means it's broken. If a part is broken, we will need to go and place the part back where it came from and send it back, which just wastes more time making you survive longer. After connecting Circus Baby's parts, you will also need to fuse them. You can do this by completing a puzzle. These puzzles, while simple, require 100% of your focus, so you will need to find a good time when the animatronics aren't moving to complete these. And some of these final puzzles were actually brutal. Luckily though, after completing it, the night is immediately over and we are able to exit the area through a door that has now unlocked. After this door unlocks, we actually get into the elevator present at the beginning of Sister Location and begin writing it down. This is until the elevator comes to a complete stop and we are laughed at by some mini arenas before they destroy the elevator and it crashes down. We then get this small cutscene where our player gets up and limps over to a door. We then climb our way through a vent and make our way into what feels like the back rooms of the establishment, like somewhere we weren't meant to be. After walking through these hallways for a little bit, we come across a very familiar character. Now this cutscene immediately kicks off Night 5, however I quickly just want to comment on my thoughts for Night 4. Night 4 was personally one of my favorites in the whole game. Funtime Freddy and Funtime Foxy have such a horrifying presence. The fact that you don't really know what they're doing unless you go over to their window to watch them is very eerie. That alongside the intense puzzles required to attach Baby's arms and legs made this night so horrifying in a very unique way. I also really like how the whole structure was set up. Unlike the other nights, this one you know everything you need to do from the start. So instead of the challenge coming from finding a certain part or figuring out the next puzzle, this one comes down to more of your execution on everything. Alright, so now for Night 5, which is the largest in scale that the game has to offer. Right away we are given a flashlight that needs to be wound up every once in a while in order to keep it powered. This wind up is of course extremely loud. We are then set free in a warehouse where Ennard is roaming around looking for us. If spotted or heard by Ennard, we will be chased by them, with our only real way of getting away being these wooden pallets. These wooden pallets can be knocked down upon running past them which will block Ennard's path giving you time to get away. Now to actually win on this night, it's very confusing so bear with me. So first things first, we will make our way across the room and stumble across this piece of paper which basically tells us to find Kyle's desk. So you will need to find where Kyle's desk is which will be in a different spot every time. Once you find Kyle's desk, you will need to get a crowbar off of it 
and then take this crowbar over to John's desk. We can then use this crowbar to open up John's desk which gives us a key card. This key card can be used on a door on the far back wall of the warehouse and allows us to turn on a generator. Now that the generator is on, we need to go to three different desks around the warehouse. Each of these desks features a computer which requires us to insert three batteries. We must use the information displayed on the computer and the batteries to find out which ones are compatible. Very similar to what we were doing with Foxy in the parts and service minigame from Help Wanted. If you make a mistake and place the wrong battery, the computer makes a loud noise which sometimes alerts Ennard to your location. After finishing the long grind of fixing all three computers, a ladder opens up alongside one of the walls, allowing us to escape and move on to the sixth and final night of the game. And I quickly just want to say that night 5 was a mixed bag for me. I really did like the idea of it. Being hunted through a dark warehouse sounds really cool on paper, but I just think it wasn't executed very well here. During my first time playing, I found the flashlight almost useless as it was very easy to see in the dark without it, and I didn't even have my brightness boosted up or anything like that, that's just how the game is. And Ennard also didn't seem to hear sounds like very often. During my playthrough, sometimes when failing on the computer, he wouldn't even come after me, and when he did, I found it very easy to escape him as there was a lot of pallets scattered around. Now don't get me wrong, the gameplay mechanics are so cool here, I just really wish this section was a little less forgiving and they made it a lot darker. Also making the warehouse smaller could have maybe benefited as you would have less space to run away from Ennard and there would be less potential of Ennard being all the way across the warehouse from you, basically giving you ease of mind that you're not going to die anytime soon. Alright, so finally finishing off the game we have Night 6, which is actually my favorite night in the game. This night takes place in the coolest area in the whole game in my opinion as well. That being a mix between the outside alley area where Henry would leave the animatronics in FNAF 6, and some of the interior of that pizzeria where we would interview the animatronics. The mechanics in this section are also the best in the game in my opinion. In this night, we are faced off against three animatronics, Scrap Baby, Scrap Trap, and Molten Freddy. Scrap Baby begins randomly walking out of the forest towards this fence every once in a while. If Scrap Baby makes it over this fence, there is no way to get rid of her and she will chase you down and kill you. To prevent her from reaching this fence, you will need to see when she is coming and use a computer screen on the wall to activate the repel system. This repel system is a sound that plays that will cause Scrap Baby to turn around and go away. Molten Freddy will be heard every so often climbing through one of the two vents that are located outside. To push Molten Freddy back, you need to crawl in the vent yourself and hit this lever on the wall, which will send him back a few notches every time you flip it. Last but not least, we have Scrap Trap, who acts actually very similarly to how he would during the interviews in FNAF 6. You need to monitor Scrap Trap throughout the night to see if he has moved at all. Eventually, once Scrap Trap has moved enough, he will look straight forward before charging out of his chair towards you. To prevent your death, you need to see when Scrap Trap looks up and use the computer on the wall to shut the door. You can then activate the call system, which will calm Scrap Trap down and send him back to his chair while he is banging on your door. Oh, yeah, and I forgot to mention, Music Man is kinda just here. He doesn't really do anything, but he has these timers on his eyes, and I don't really know what they mean, so yeah. To escape from Night 6, we firstly need to play the FNAF 6 minigame on the wall. This is a lot like playing the FNAF World minigame on Night 3, however I think this one works a lot better as it's a lot shorter and the gameplay itself just lends itself much more nicely to being a step you need to complete. After feeding the kids in the FNAF 6 minigame 3 times, we can then move on to our next step which is to solve this puzzle. This puzzle is very simple. There are these three papers scattered around the map, which will inform you on which animatronics fit into which box. You can then enter this code into the box, which will give you a key. This key opens up a left door to the left of Scrap Trap, and in this room there is a coin. 
This coin can be placed into Rockstar Freddy, who I forgot to mention is in this room to the right of Scrap Trap. And after placing this coin inside of him, we can then press the two buttons on his shoulders, which will cause him to open his mouth. In his mouth is a piece of paper, which can then be placed alongside all of these other pieces of paper on this desk right here. We now must arrange these pieces of paper into the proper order, the only problem being that we still must survive against all of the animatronics. And because we are too far away to hear if Molten Freddy or Scrap Baby are coming, we now have a red light that will flash when an animatronic is present. Whenever this red light is flashed, you need to run as fast as possible to get over there or you will die. Sometimes even running immediately, I would still die. So I actually started predicting when they would come and pre-firing to check because the red light wasn't very reliable. Anyways, once you finish arranging that paper and you pull the lever on the wall, this will unlock yet another room. This one being to the right of Rockstar Freddy. This room has a pair of pliers that allow you to cut the chains outside and finally escape for good. Although night 6 was the final real night, we do get one more scene. After cutting the chains and escaping the FNAF 6 location, we go down another hole in the floor which leads us to this strange office. We are then able to look at a few blueprints on the computer, these being various security breach things such as Freddy's charging tube and endoskeletons, and after switching through these files for a bit, we turn around and get struck by Vanny, who then puts us in front of Burn Trap. Vanny then lets Burntrap out who stands in front of us before the cutscene cuts off. This whole ending is actually a pretty cool tie-in with Security Breach in my opinion. It's basically implying that the way Scraptrap was able to come back was through a Fazbear attraction which Vanny used to lure kids in in order to give Scraptrap their remnant. Which I think is a pretty cool concept even though I'm not really too much into the lore of Security Breach. After this though, there is one final section which is truly something amazing. We are placed in a room with just one door and after walking through it, we are taken to a frozen moment in time. The moment in FNAF 4 where the crying child was bitten by Fredbear. It's really just so cool to finally see this moment being rendered out into 3D. And the way the game lets us see it all by slowly progressing room to room is really cool. This room right here is especially haunting. After this, there is one more room, this one only containing a Fredbear plush. We approach the plushie before quickly turning around to see a horrifying, twitching Fredbear, who I can only assume is the child's memories haunting him. We then get a quick flash of someone's hand turning into an animatronic, so I'm guessing this is William Afton, and then the credits roll. Really such an amazing way to tie off this fantastic fan game, so huge props to everybody who worked on this. The sound design, graphics, gameplay, animation, story, it's all done with such care so I really do recommend that all of you guys give this game a shot. Really quickly though, before I wrap up the video, I did promise that I would show you guys all of the extras. So firstly we have all of these main menu backgrounds which are seriously so cool. Right now, I'm using the Bite of 83 background because that's the one you get for beating the game, and I also think it's just the coolest one to look at. There is also an achievements page which has various challenges for you to go after on a second or third time through the game, which being someone who is a huge fan of achievement hunting, this is actually a really cool addition. And really makes me wish that this game could have been a part of the fanverse and made it onto Steam one day. Finally, for the extras, we get this cool room where we are able to look over all of the expertly crafted animatronic models that this game features. You can also turn off the lights and make it look all creepy or just have it fully lit up. I really like how this was done similar to how it was in Help Wanted, opposed to just being images of the models. So that is why the glitched attraction has taken the spot as my new favorite FNAF fan game. Let me know your guys' thoughts on the game and also tell me which night out of the 6 was your favorite. If you made it this far into the video, seriously thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video. Peace. Throughout the many different Five Nights at Freddy's games, we always experience them from the perspective of the security guard, doing our best to monitor the animatronics and survive the night. 
But have you ever wondered what it is like for the children stuffed in the animatronics, trapped inside the robotic suit while being watched over by a security guard only looking out for himself? Well today we are looking at Bondi's Barnyard, a FNAF fan game that was released on November 26th. This FNAF fan game explores the horrifying perspective of being a child stuffed in an animatronic. Using this unique concept allows this game to do a lot of interesting things, not only just gameplay wise, but also narratively, and has been one of the most enjoyable fan games I've checked out in a while. The game is also packed with a lot of content, such as 5 nights, a challenge mode, a custom night, and even some interesting extras. So if that sounds interesting to you, then join me as we look into Bondi's Barnyard, a FNAF fan game where you are the animatronic. As soon as we start the game, we are greeted by Bondi, who is a farmer animatronic and also the main mascot of Bondi's Barnyard. Upon pressing new game, we get our very first cutscene. We see a panning up shot of the animatronic that we are trapped inside. During this, we hear what I assume to be the owner of Bondi's Barnyard explaining how Ku the cow's purpose is to keep a child inside in order to keep them safe, in the event that a child is separated from their parents. We are then shown a newspaper detailing the disappearance of a child. A child's gone missing at Bondi's Barnyard on their own birthday. The child's mother filed a missing persons report to the local authorities. The restaurant claims no wrongdoing but have doubled their safety precautions and has employed a full-time security guard. Now this is where the first night of the game starts. And one thing I think is really cool about this game's nights is they are actually hours. So in universe, this game takes place in the span of one day, with each stage being one of those hours. It's a really cool idea and keeps the story more grounded as it wouldn't really make sense for the game to take place over multiple days. This also comes into play with one of the bonus modes titled Night Mode, where you must play through the entire game in one sitting as if it was taking place in real time. And if that doesn't sound too bad, trust me, these nights are long, and there's no chance in the world that I'm beating that mode. Anyways, in our office we have a door to our left and a door to our right. We are able to close these doors and also shine our light on them. Closing them however causes this percentage to go down much faster, and if this number reaches zero, we die. We are able to get this number up by clicking and holding on the animatronic's teeth towards the bottom of the screen to let our character breathe. Doing this while the doors are open will allow our percentage to go up, however doing it while the doors are closed will merely prevent the number from dropping as fast. Right in front of us is a security camera that is being controlled by the security guard. Kinda weird right? This is like the first FNAF fan game where we are actually trying to not die from the security guard. That is because every once in a while the camera will come up and point at us. We are able to see ourselves twitching on the screen in front of us, and during this animation we cannot click any buttons, as doing so will get us caught by the security guard and we will be shocked to death. There aren't any actual cameras present in the game, which is actually pretty cool as it makes us be aware of where the animatronics are in the building by only using our ears and what is right in front of us. During hour 1 we are tasked with surviving against the security guard as well as Grease the pig who will every once in a while make a snorting noise. This means that they are one step away from appearing at our left door. After hearing the snort, you will need to listen one more time for a shuffle noise before closing the door to get Grease the Pig to go away. While the door is closed, your percentage will go down, however once they bang on the door for the final time, you are given around 15% to your meter and you are now safe to open up the door. Now is also a good time to mention that before every night, instead of receiving a phone call like typical FNAF fan games, in this one we get a small riddle sung by one of the animatronics, giving us a clue on how to survive the next night. You are somewhere you're not meant to be, I guess you'll have to settle for the company of me. If the camera sees free saw, say she, don't let them put you on your knees. This is a really unique way of informing the player of upcoming threats in my opinion, and works a lot better than just having text on screen before the night, as having a phone guy wouldn't make sense. After completing night 1, we get to see our very first cutscene of the game. Happy birthday my child, for your gift I'll let you go to Bondi's Barnyard. Hey, 
you look sharp as a sausage. I'm building a house. What material should I use for it? Bricks, of course. Thank you. The cutscene has an extremely cool art style, appearing as one of those poorly made children's games from the past. And during the cutscene, you are told to choose a material for the pig to build his house. And while I'm pretty sure this has no actual impact on the rest of the game, I felt very scared to pick the wrong option, as I didn't know if anything would happen to me. During hour 2 of the game titled Count Sheep, we now must go against Grease the Pig, the security guard, and now Forley the Sheep. The sheep behaves like Grease the Pig's counterpart, sharing the exact same gameplay only this time appearing in the right doorway. This night is pretty simple since the gameplay is very similar to the last, however it's a good calm before the storm to get you used to the flow and balancing of closing the doors while also finding time to open your mask and breathe. After night 2 concludes we once again get a cutscene of our duck character interacting with the cast of Bondi's barnyard. We get another prompt which we need to select an answer but once again I don't think this has any effect on the story. Hour 3 of the game is when the difficulty really starts to pick up. Now on top of all the other threats we need to avoid, we are now faced off against a withered version of Bondi. Bondi can appear in either the right or left doorway and instead of closing the door on him, we will need to hold the light to get him to go away. This adds a new level of difficulty as sometimes when trying to move quickly you can accidentally close the door on him which more often than not leads to your death. Bondi will also appear at very inconvenient times, forcing you to sit there shining your light at him while you also need to attend to other tasks, such as opening your mask or closing the opposite door. Another addition to Night 3 is Chickling, who behaves very much like Foxy does in FNAF 1. During random moments in the night, the TV screen will quickly change to display Chickling running towards your office. You must see which direction Chickley is coming from and close the appropriate door before they reach your office. It's not very difficult to stop Chickling from entering your office, however it adds yet another distraction during your night which can throw you off. I actually died quite a few times during this night, and I know it may sound like a pretty simple gameplay loop, but actually mastering the flow takes a bit of adjusting. After hour 3 is over is when the cutscenes start to take a darker turn, and also is when we find out the reason that Bondi is so afraid of the light. I got something here just for you. Blow out whenever you're ready! This cutscene really caught me off guard as all the other cutscenes before seem to be innocent introductions to all the characters. Using this unique way of showing us what happened to Bondi opposed to just telling us through exposition was really cool in my opinion, and helps add a lot of intrigue towards what happened at Bondi's barnyard, and what type of interactions our character had with the animatronics. During Night 4 there are no new animatronics added and we once again need to survive against the same threats, only this time they appear much more frequently. This means that you need to be on top of every single sound effect you hear and make sure you optimize the amount of time you have each door closed. After Night 4 is over, during the next cutscene we see Koo the Cow interacting with our main character. Ku the cow promises to protect us and we are then shown another panning shot of the animatronic before hour 5 kicks off. Hour 5, the final night in the game, also adds no new animatronics and instead chooses to survive as a last test to see if your skills are perfected. This night takes immense concentration to complete, especially when considering how long the nights last. After actually completing the final night though, we are shown the fifth and final cutscene. This one being a newspaper that reads, Missing child has been found deceased inside a restaurant that went lost. The child had somehow climbed inside a robotic mascot where it later suffocated to death early in the morning. Police are investigating the night guard that somehow didn't realize that the child was in the building, slowly dying throughout the night. Overall, I think this game did everything it set out to do perfectly, and is a golden example of how a FNAF fan game should be handled. An interesting style, unique story elements and gameplay, and a nice beginning and end, as well as many extras to hold you over for a few more hours. 
I thoroughly enjoyed my entire time with Bondi's Barnyard. I never felt like the gameplay was too difficult or too easy. Each animatronic added a fair amount of challenge which slowly built up into a very well balanced gameplay loop which keeps you on your toes but never feels impossible. The story being told during the mini games kept me engaged the entire time and had me wanting to see how it would conclude. After the game was all said and done, I felt very satisfied with the overall experience. If you guys enjoyed this video and haven't checked out the game for yourself yet, I seriously recommend it and challenge you all to try to complete the custom night. Anyways, that has been it for me. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you leave a like and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. When browsing the FNAF tab on Game Jolt to find a new game to play, there has always been one game that stood out to me a lot, and that was Jolly 4. Boasting extremely cool animatronic designs, amazing graphics, and a really well animated announcement trailer, Jolly 4 was shaping up to be one of the most well produced fan games the community has ever seen. But recently I stumbled across it again when I got the idea to go back and play the previous Jolly games in the series and give you guys my honest opinions on each one, in preparation for the release of Jolly 4. So that's exactly what I did. I took it upon myself to play Jolly 1, 2, 3 Chapter 1, and 3 Chapter 2. So without further ado, let's start this series review off with the game that started it all, Jolly 1. Jolly 1 was released back in 2016 and was developed by Ivan G. I'm gonna start by talking about the gameplay before I jump over to talking about the story and visuals. Now in terms of gameplay, this game does not do a whole lot and relies heavily on features from previous FNAF games. In Jolly 1, you are a night guard and you are tasked with surviving till 6am while fighting off Jolly and the rest of the animatronics. You are placed in an office that is on a lower floor from where the animatronics are located, and you have a window in front of you with a light, and a door to your right. You are also equipped with a camera that is able to give you a view of not only the vents leading into your office, but also the entire second floor of the restaurant where all of the animatronics are located. We are also able to close these vents on the left to prevent these two animatronics who go by the names of Maxi and George from entering the vents. And we are also given this charging panel on our right which lets us take power from this generator and put it in our own pool of power. There is also a brand new gameplay feature that this game invents which is the wire mechanic. And while it is a new mechanic, it does take a lot of cues from how the music box worked in FNAF 2. Basically there are 4 wires connected to the puppet and randomly throughout the night the wires will go out and you will need to go to the camera they are on and click on them to repair them. It takes a few seconds to repair it and that usually gives the animatronics a chance to make a move. For example, during my runs, it would sometimes give Jolly enough time to make it down the elevator and onto the floor with my office. Speaking of the elevator, the elevator mechanic essentially works like this. The animatronics need to either go through the vents or down the elevator to get onto the same floor as your office. Maxi and George are the only ones who are able to go through the vents, therefore all the other animatronics will take the elevator. The way we can prevent this is by sending the elevator back up whenever the animatronics ride it down to our floor, using this button on its respective camera. One thing I really like about this feature is that there is this ding sound that plays every time the elevator has gone up or down, and this audio cue allows us to know when the animatronics are moving without having to check the cameras. As for the other animatronics in the game, they will come through the vent and appear in this window. If in this window, you will need to flash them and make sure the light remains on them in order to keep them away. This gameplay mechanic felt extremely glitchy however, and I had died countless times even though I was flashing the animatronics, so I'm not really sure what I was doing wrong here, and the game doesn't really explain everything to you in the greatest manner either, but I will get back into that later on. If an animatronic is able to make it down the elevator and into the bottom floor, you will need to keep an eye on them in your cameras and close the door before they make it into your office. Since there is no light on the door like in Five Nights at Freddy's 1, you will need to solely keep track of him through the cameras and won't be able to see him when he's peeking through. If an animatronic does make it to the door, they will actually jam it so you won't be able to close it. Now one gripe I have with this game is that almost every single camera on the second floor is useless and doesn't need to be looked at. 
You essentially just need to make sure you stop the animatronic from coming down the elevator while simultaneously checking the light from time to time. I don't think that this game had enough solid mechanics to keep the gameplay interesting for very long, and I felt this caused it to get pretty stale very quickly. Another problem I had with this game is something I mentioned earlier, and that is that the game does not do a very good job of explaining what you're supposed to do. Not only does the phone guy sound like he's constantly forgetting his lines while recording, but the phone audio is just so quiet that you can barely hear him. And when you're in the cameras, like, you literally cannot hear him at all. Now the game does feature subtitles, which I'm grateful for, but during most of the nights, you don't even have time to read it because you're too worried about the animatronics. Now I wouldn't say this game has horrible gameplay, especially considering that this is one of the developer's first games and he was only 13 years old when he made this game according to the wiki which is just very impressive to me like that doesn't even make sense however there's just not enough there to fully grasp me and with the sometimes inconsistent feeling mechanics and just the poor introduction of the gameplay itself i feel that this game is pretty lacking in this regard The setup for Jollies is that you play as a security guard who has begun his job at Jollies Fantasy World, a restaurant that was created by CEO Kevin Johnson as an attempt to compete with Circus Baby's Pizza World. The game is tied to the Five Nights at Freddy's canon and is stated in the paycheck that this game takes place all the way in the year of 2017. Other than this brief story introduction, there are also five mini games. The mini game for Night 1 has the player control Jolly in a FNAF 3 style mini game, also similar to FNAF 3 you start on the main stage and walk around the pizzeria until you eventually stumble across the parts and service room. Here you will find a spirit who tells you to follow them, leading you down a secret room hidden in front of the main stage before the minigame ends. The Night 2 minigame again has you playing as Jolly beginning on the main stage, however this time there is an audience of children. After roaming around the pizzeria for a little bit, you will find yourself in a back room that shows what appears to be the puppet slumped over accompanied by text that says, it's okay. Upon leaving the room, a man in a blue shirt runs up to Jolly and the minigame cuts to black. The Night 3 minigame spawns us in a party room full of children, and after exploring the pizzeria for a little while, we stumble across the man in the blue shirt, who is surprised to see us, and similar to the last night's minigame, runs up to us before the minigame cuts to black. For the fourth night, we spawn in the same place as Night 3, and once again walk towards the same room as last time. After entering this room, we see a different blue shirted man who quickly runs out of the room as soon as we enter. He runs into the room with the children partying, and after entering the room to catch him, he runs up to you and once again ends the mini game. Now what does this all mean? Well, I honestly couldn't tell you. I'm definitely not a person you should be looking at when it comes to decrypting all the deep lore in these games. However, what I can tell you is I think it's good that the developer at least took the time to incorporate these mini games and I like to see that the game is trying to tell its own unique story. I'm pretty excited to talk about the visuals in this game because I think it's one of the game's strongest aspects. Just like the original FNAF games, this game was created in Click Team Fusion, which if you guys know anything about that engine, it is extremely limited and requires a lot of different tricks in order to make the game appear as if it's in first person and all that kind of stuff. And I think that this game does a really good job at that. While it doesn't have the same polish that Scott's games do, I still really think the environments, along with the animatronics, look above average in comparison to most fan games, when taking into account when the game came out. The office has a very dark and lonely vibe which sets the mood for the whole game, and I think the other rooms in the building do a more than passable job of representing what they need to. This game also has a very cool aesthetic, and while being very obviously inspired by Sister Location, it still helps give the game its own unique identity and feel. Another section of the visuals the game absolutely nails is the mini-games. They do a perfect job of replicating the mini-games seen in FNAF 3, and when looked at side by side it's hard to even spot the difference. This isn't to say it's all good however, as there is one section of the visuals I feel like the game is severely lacking in, and that is the jump scares. While not being the worst, I just feel like they needed to be a lot faster to be scary. The animatronics kind of just slowly swing in front of your face without any real unique animation, and while being paired with this not so scary noise, it just makes the whole thing feel underwhelming. 
Again, I do want to reiterate here though that the developer was only 13 years old when he made this. So the fact that he could even pull off modeling these animatronics and animating them is already extremely impressive. So huge props to him. That's about everything I have to say for Jolly 1, so let's move straight on to Jolly 2. Jolly 2 was released on December 2nd of 2016, only two months after the release of Jolly 1, which is absolutely insane. This game, opposed to the normal restaurant location, takes on a new setting in the form of a cargo ship, where we will need to defend not only against animatronics from Jolly's fantasy world, but also the four main animatronics from Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Starting off with the gameplay, in this game we are once again a night guard with our task this time being to watch over the animatronics who are being taken across the ocean via a cargo ship in order to be investigated. This game has two different sections of gameplay, the office section and a fun with plush trap style mini game. So I will first start by talking about the main part of the game which is the office gameplay and then I will go over the fun with plush trap style mini game which is titled Time to Sleep. Now right off the bat, I just want to start this section off by saying that this gameplay is so much better than the first game in my opinion, as it brings the scale down a lot and is a much more simplified gameplay loop. Gone are the excessive amounts of cameras and overly complicated maps. In this game, we are just placed in an office similar to FNAF 1. There is a door to our left and a door to our right, a monitor in front of us, and some pipes behind us which we can turn around and look at. You will need to use the monitor to see where the animatronics are in the cargo ship and will have to shock them if they are getting too close to your office. The shock does need to recharge however, so if you use it at a bad time, you will have to wait for it to recharge, which could potentially get you killed. Anyways, shocking the animatronics does slow them down but it does not stop them, and they will still make their way right outside of your doors. Once outside of your office doors, you will need to wait for them to disappear from that camera, and that means that they are standing at your door. Similar to Jolly 1, there are no lights for these doors, so you will have to base when you will use your shock button on what you have seen in the cameras. Also, I have been calling them doors, but there is actually no door there and the button is actually another shock button which will shock the animatronic trying to enter your office. This shock also needs to recharge and the recharge time is actually pretty long, so if you accidentally use it before the animatronic enters the doorway, it could easily get you killed. Unlike the shock on the cameras, this shock will actually send the animatronic back to where they originally started, so after you catch them trying to enter your office, you just basically send them all the way back. There is also the pipe mechanic, which essentially works as a quick way to disable your shocking abilities. Every once in a while, you will hear steam leaking out of a pipe which will shut off your ability to shock anything. This will force you to exit the camera, turn around, and click on the pipe that is leaking in order to fix it, and this will return your ability to shock the animatronics. This gameplay, like I said earlier, just works so much better than the first game. I feel like this game gives you way more time to breathe while also making sure that you are focusing and paying attention throughout the whole night. Forcing the player to know by the cameras when the animatronics are at the door tests your memorization and ability to keep track of every single animatronic in the building at once, and at times led to some horrifying moments where I wasn't sure if an animatronic was at the door or not and needed to make the risky decision whether or not I should use my shock, knowing there would have been a chance I used it too early and would have had to wait to recharge it again. One thing I feel like the knights needed though was some variety. The game pretty much throws all the animatronics at you on the first night, and you are never introduced to any new threats as you progress. This causes the gameplay to start feeling stale after around the third night, similar to the first game, and I just feel like the developers should have thrown in a surprise animatronic on the later nights just to make things a little bit more intense. Another thing I feel like this game is lacking is uniqueness across the different animatronics in the game. While there are 6 animatronics in total, they all behave in the exact same way other than their pathing, and this makes them all feel the same. One of the things I feel like made the Five Nights at Freddy's gameplay so great is the management of different animatronics who all require different ways to fend them off, with more being added as the nights progress. 
but sadly in this game that is nowhere to be found and you will most likely not even be paying attention to what animatronic is after you. As it doesn't matter at all which animatronic it is and only matters where they are in the building. Next up I'm going to quickly talk about the time to sleep minigame that you have to play after every single night. Think of this as the equivalent to fun with plush trap, however in this minigame you are trying to fill up your sleep meter before the clock reaches zero. You do this by staying at your bed to charge up the meter, however you will need to run and check these two doors to flash Foxy with your flashlight. This game mode tests your patience a lot as succeeding in this game mode requires you to trust your gut and know when it is a good time to wait and when you need to run up and flash Foxy. There is some randomness to knowing which door Foxy will be in, but I think this is fine. It adds to the tension that is built up when you know that you have already been in the bed for a while and can't afford the extra seconds you would lose by going to the wrong door. One gripe I do have with this minigame is they just throw you straight into it after the first night. And while there are directions detailing what to do, they do not give you enough time to read them. Which resulted in me getting jump scared before I even knew what was going on the first time I got here. I really think there should have been a tutorial screen before the minigame even started, like how Scott did it in the fun with plush trap. But that's just a minor gripe and after the first small death I had a lot of fun with this minigame moving forward and I thought it did a good job of keeping the gameplay fresh. The game opens up informing us that the year is 1985, meaning that this is a prequel to Jolly's 1. We are then shown a newspaper reading, Five children have gone missing inside Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Restaurant. The animatronics will be transferred and will be cargoed off to somewhere safe for further investigation. Like I said earlier, we play as a night guard in this game, tasked with staying up on this cargo ship with these animatronics to watch over them. Other than this short introduction though, the game doesn't outright tell us any more of the lore. However, it does contain a lot of minigames with one after every single night, so let's look over those now. The first minigame opens up with us playing as the blue shirt guy who was in the Jolly One minigames. We can see there is a large sign up in the building that reads, bring your daughter to work day. A little strange how it's bring your daughter to work day and not just bring your kid to work day, but this might have just been a slip up from the developer. Anyways, you roam around the building while you hear a voice in the background repeatedly saying, I'm scared. And after walking around the pizzeria for a little bit, we eventually stumble across the purple man in a golden suit luring away a child into the back room. Upon following him, we see the purple guy bring him into yet another room before closing the door and locking us out, as the minigame fades to black. The second minigame is pretty much identical to the first one, with the only variation being that there is a different child being lured by the purple guy. No, actually not just the second minigame, the third, fourth, and fifth minigame are all just variations of the first minigame, with a different child being in every single one. This felt extremely disappointing to me as I felt like the developer just included these minigames to pad out time, and while I understand that this game was made in only the matter of two months, it just feels really cheap to reuse the same minigame so many times and make you play it every single time as well. This especially sucked because up to this point I was actually pretty invested in seeing what was going to happen next. But as soon as I found out the minigames would all just be reskins of each other, that interest inside me died out and I wasn't really too interested in the story anymore. Luckily for me however, there was a little bit more lore in this game after night 6, so let me show you that now. So first off, after night 6 we get to see a paycheck, and on that paycheck we can see that the character we are playing as is not the same character from Jolly 1, with this character being named Liam Smith. After being shown the paycheck, we then get to see a small credit section for the game with text that reads the end. And after that text fades to black, we see Jolly's eyes light up from the darkness with text that reads bad ending. If we go ahead and visit the extras menu in the game however and click on this secret little guy in the corner, we are taken to a sister location style minigame where we need to feed burgers to children. And after completing this long minigame, we get to walk into a building as Jolly. Here we find a girl wearing purple crying. She walks up to Jolly and hugs him when suddenly the purple guy runs out of a door and charges us. The screen then cuts to an arcade cabinet zooming out before the credits roll once again. We are then shown Jolly again, similar to the bad ending, however this time his eyes aren't lit up and we are given text that reads, true ending. 
I'm guessing this means that Jolly Spirit is freed in the canon ending of this game, as it bears so many similarities to the Five Nights at Freddy's 3 bad and good endings. And it was at this point where I was very lost on the story, so I can't really give you my full thoughts on what I think about the lore, but I do think it was cool that the developer did decide to include a second ending to the game. However, the amount of work you have to do to achieve this ending, just to see a 2 second shot of Jolly with the lights in his eyes off, isn't really worth it in my opinion. Anyways, that's all I have to say about the story, so now let's move on to the visuals. The visuals are very interesting in this game to me. While some of it is definitely a step up from the previous game, other parts of the game almost look worse than the first one. This could be due to the game being rushed or just the developer struggling with the new setting, but I feel like some of the rooms in this game don't look as good as the first one. The office in particular doesn't really look as good as it did in the first one, and is a pretty uninspired design in my opinion. I will say though that the animatronic models have improved a lot from the first game. I'll put a screenshot of both games animatronics on screen to compare now. And you can see that the developer was able to execute the animatronics proportions a lot better in this game. And while I do think the models could still use some work and aren't up to the par that Scott's models were on, they do do a good enough job of representing the animatronics, and my small nitpicks with their designs aren't very noticeable when you're actually playing the game. The biggest upgrade by far to the visuals, however, is the cutscenes and the animation. There are two brief cutscenes in this game. The one that we see during the intro to introduce the newspaper, and this one right here of Foxy running around the cargo boat to introduce us to the Time to Sleep minigame. These cutscenes, while short, are really cool and got me really excited to play the game. The animation on the cutscenes also looks pretty smooth, and I like how the one with Foxy is from his POV. It kinda reminds me of that FNAF Plus teaser if you guys know what I'm talking about. And other than that, this game also features some small animations, in the form of this running animation that plays when clicking on the monitor. I think it looks pretty cool when you're actually going up to the camera. The only thing I think that looks a little off is when leaving the camera, it will just play in reverse instead of having its own animation for running back. Other than this though, it was a cool idea to feature animation and I think it makes the game feel a little bit more alive. One last thing for the visuals I would like to touch on is the jump scares, which have not really improved much from the first game and still feel very slow and just not really scary at all. Especially the Freddy one. His head just kind of slides into frame while the out of sync jump scare noise plays. Overall, I can say that this game makes a slight improvement in terms of visuals over the first game, but nothing you will really notice and the visual jump isn't as huge as the leap from say Jolly 2 to Jolly 3. So why don't we waste no more time and jump straight into Jolly 3 Chapter 1. Jolly 3 immediately opens up with this beautiful menu screen, which is quickly followed by this sick intro cutscene that shows us a car driving around at night. We then see somebody running into the Jolly's location, where we see a withered version of Jolly open his eyes. Here you can probably already see a sneak peek at the visual upgrade that the series got since the second game. With this game being released 8 months after Jolly 2, the extra time the developer got to craft this one definitely shows. I also want to say this intro cutscene has had some really sick music accompanying it, and it was just such a great way to start the game, immediately getting me hyped to see what's coming. So let's go straight into the gameplay. Immediately loading into night 1, we can see that this game strays away from the typical FNAF style gameplay and instead chooses to follow what Sister Location did with its design, where it adopts a more linear experience, sacrificing replayability in order to create more story-driven cinematic experiences. That is not to say that this game doesn't have office gameplay, however. Every night will first have you survive in the office before moving on to a unique task for the night you are on. The office gameplay is very complicated, but let me try my best to explain it to you. Like every other FNAF game, you have a camera where you are able to look at each room in the building. Each room has its own fan that you will need to keep track of. These fans will break during your shift and will need to be repaired, however the game will not tell you which fan is broken. This means that if one breaks, you will need to search through the cameras in order to find the one that needs fixing. Once you have found the one that needs to be fixed, you need to click this repair button right here on your camera. 
The fan breaking is a major disturbance throughout the night as it will cause you to lose your vision making it very hard to see anything. There is also a maintenance tab that you can access by pressing this wrench in the left corner and in this screen you are shown your oxygen levels as well as your gas supply. Your oxygen levels will slowly go down as a fan breaks and it is this screen that you will use in order to charge it back up. The gas supply is also able to stop working similar to the fans and will require you to open this screen to repair it. As for the office design, think of it similar to FNAF 2. However, instead of having a mask, you have this lever in front of you. And whenever an animatronic appears in front of your office, you will need to just pull it down to release gas on the animatronic and scare it away. This will shortly cause you to lose a little bit of oxygen, but it is required to get rid of the animatronics. Also similar to FNAF 2, there are two lights you will need to check on your left and right. These being windows that have Tweety and Maxi in them. Whenever Tweety or Maxi shows up at the windows, you will need to keep the light on them in order to stop them from killing you. And this is kind of similar to the window mechanic from Jolly 1. I think that this is definitely the best office gameplay in the series, as it not only makes you utilize every single camera by implementing the repairing fan mechanic, but also takes notes from games like Five Nights at Freddy's 2 with the way you will be juggling between stopping the animatronics who are in your office, fending off against animatronics on your left and right, and also trying to monitor the cameras. The game also throws in phantom animatronics who will disable your fans and I think this is a perfect addition. By doing this, the developer was able to keep the gameplay fresh by having different animatronics show up as you progress to keep it from ever getting stale. This also helps each animatronic feel more unique from one another with not all of them doing the exact same thing. This mechanic alone solves two huge issues I had with the previous games. So it's good to see the developer learning from his mistakes of his past games and making improvements upon them. I do think this is a lot of mechanics to be thrown onto you at once and it is very overwhelming, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually not that bad and plays pretty well. Anyways, like I said previously, after each night there is more to the mission in the form of a kind of mini game, similar to the breaker room mini game in sister location or like the spring lock section, things like that. So after night one, we walk through the hallway in front of us and we are told by the phone guy to enter the door on the left. Here we are told we need to find something quickly and get out or we will be dead. Upon entering the door, we make our way into this storage type room and we need to look around the room with a flashlight in order to find the safe that the phone guy wants to see. And after clicking on the safe, this happens. First time around, this was a really cool moment for me, for sure. It actually scared me as I was not expecting it at all, and I thought this would just be a small little hunt for a box, not an actual full level. Moments like these where you are going in absolutely blind are when the linear style of FNAF gameplay works best in my opinion, but I will later explain why this section went from being one of my favorites to my least favorite in the entire game. So after the lights shut off, we are told we need to use our phone to send the phone guy a port number. And this starts the next section of the mini game, where we will need to make a pathway from one door to another using this app on our phone. It's a pretty simple mini game that reminds me a lot of the hacking mini games from Bioshock. If you guys ever played that, you'll know what I'm talking about. However, just like in the breaker room mini game from Sister Location, you will need to flip down your phone and flash the animatronic trying to kill you to keep them away. It seems simple enough, but this was actually the most frustrating part of the game for me. For some reason, no matter what I did, I would always die. I tried barely flashing him, I tried not flashing him at all, and trying to complete the puzzle quickly. I tried absolutely spamming the flashlight on him for him to get back, and just nothing worked for me, until eventually I just lucked out and got through it. Not to mention that every single time you die on this part, you have to redo the whole thing where you walk through the door, find the safe, watch the cutscene where the lights go off again, and that is why this was my most hated section in the game. One upside I will give to this minigame, however, is that unlike the Time to Sleep minigame in Jolly 2, this game actually gives you time to read the directions before just throwing you in, which is yet another improvement made since the first two games. Anyways, after finishing the hacking on the phone, all we need to do is click on the safe and enter the code that the phone guy tells us. After this, the safe opens up and grants us a book, which concludes our first shift. After this, we are taken to a minigame section, like the actual pixelated minigames, not like 
I don't know why I called the other ones mini games. This is gonna get confusing, but the the actual pixelated mini games. However, I'm gonna skip over these for now, and I'm just gonna go over every single night, and then I'll comment on the mini games during the story section. So let's move right on to night two. After the office gameplay for night two, it's time for our next task. The phone guy asks from us. So we enter the hallway once again that's right in front of us and this time enter through the door right in front of us labeled assembly line. Once again we are told we need to find a safe and I know this is the gameplay section and not the visual section yet but right here I just want to say that the environments in this game just look so good and when looking back on the previous games it's a night and day difference with how much better they look. Anyways after we find the safe he tells us the code once again and we get out with these papers harm free. Just kidding, once again, of course something bad happens. This time, it is the lights shutting off. We then hear a girl talking to us, which is very similar to Sister Location. I mean, it's cool that the game has voice acting, but this just feels like the developers were taking a little too much from Sister Location at this point. After she's done with her monologue though, the lights come back on and we see the four original animatronic heads on the ground before the screen fades to black, concluding shift number two. And then after this, we get to the next mini game, like the pixelated mini games. And again, I'm not going to cover these right now. I'm going to do those during the story section. So we're going to skip over that. However, since right now we're talking about the gameplay, I just want to quickly say that the mini games in this game have a lot more gameplay than in Jolly 2 and are not just repetitive games of watching the purple guy lure another child or something like that. And some sections of the mini games are actually challenging and not just there to be a sort of cutscene. Okay, so now for shift three. We again start in the office gameplay and this time we are introduced to another phone guy named Cassette Man who tells us that the jolly suit in the back shouldn't be worn and also that tomorrow is bring your daughter to work day, which is something that we saw in the previous game's minigame. Once we complete our 6 hour office shift, we then walk into the hallway in front of us and again we are meant to enter a door, this time it being the third and final door on the right. However, once we click on the door to enter we are jump scared by whatever animatronic this is. And I have to say that this was completely out of nowhere and actually made me jump when it happened. I really like this scene as by now the game has already conditioned you to walk through these doors and at this moment I had my guard completely down. Anyways, the game pretends you're dead for a little bit before the camera fades back in to reveal that you are in a new room. With this cool brief animation of us waking up, the girl continues talking to us for a little bit and then our shift ends. Next up is shift 4 and here we find out that the phone guy actually knew that that animatronic was there and didn't warn us. The gameplay is more of the same for the office, however we now have Phantom Foxy on the cameras and the animatronics are a lot more aggressive. After the office sections ends, we return once again to the room with the three doors. This time however, we actually get into the room on the right without being jump scared. Here we are tasked for the third time with finding a safe. However, this time before we can find it, the security system is detected and red lights start flashing. Here we need to open our phone once again and this time we need to play a typing game while also trying to keep this animatronic away. And let me tell you guys, this is one of the most stressful sections in the game. Because even if you're good at typing, they throw all these different symbols in there to try to slow you down. And you will need to periodically close your phone to make sure the animatronic Maxi will go away and not kill you. I don't think this was as hard as the other puzzle in the game, but was still very stressful and it made for a really cool minigame in my opinion. The idea to make this section a typing section I also thought was a really good idea. Typing is something that you can do fast, but when the game wants you to type everything exactly how it is on screen, it makes you have to slow down. And when under such high pressure situations, it leads to some frantic typing and high tension as the animatronic gets closer and closer. After completing the typing minigame, we open up the third safe and this time receive a cassette, which wraps up our fourth shift. Finally, for night 5, it is more of the same office gameplay, only with increased difficulty. And at this point, the office section became stupidly difficult and I was absolutely sweating trying to complete it. Upon completing the office section though, we get to move into the room with the three doors for one last time. Here we are instructed to go straight forward and after doing so, a cutscene is triggered revealing that chapter 2 for the game will be coming soon. So that's everything for the gameplay, now let's look into the story. <laughs> 
Now for the story in this game, I have to admit this is where the story completely lost me. Up to now I had been trying to follow along with everything that was happening but from here on out I was just very confused. So for this section I'm just gonna do my best so bear with me guys. I'm not mad pat out here I don't really know how to figure out all this lore but just just bear with me just bear with me. So for the night one mini game, we are shown the blue shirt guy and the purple guy entering the Five Nights at Freddy's 1 location. They walk around for a bit while the purple guy gives the blue shirt guy a tour around the place. Blue shirt guy then asks what the secret room over there is, to which the purple guy responds by saying, There are animatronics in there. They were used. One of their names is Jolly, and I don't know who the other one is. We are then set free to roam around the pizzeria and after following the purple guy into the parts and service room, he asks us, why are you here? He refers to us as Eric and then he tells us that he needs to tell us something. He leans in and tells Eric that no one will know about this room's existence. Eric simply replies just saying, yes boss, and this concludes the first minigame. The second night's minigame starts with the blue shirt guy talking to his daughter about how excited she is to visit Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. They then drive over to the location and pull up into the front entrance. Here we also find out that this little girl's name is Zoe. The blue shirt guy then walks into the restaurant before coming back out and telling the girl to stay as far away from the pizzeria as possible, no matter what. The screen then fades to black and this is the end of the minigame. Night 3's minigame starts where the second one left off. We control Zoe this time and enter the pizzeria only to be met with a dark environment only lit up by Zoe's candle. Zoe walks around the pizzeria for a little bit before being ran up on by the purple guy. The minigame then cuts to Zoe crying and we see dialogue between three characters. And judging off the text color, I'm guessing it's just the blue shirt guy, aka Zoe's father, William Afton, or the purple guy, and Zoe. The blue shirt guy tells William Afton he needs to stop and William just laughs it off, saying he's already dead inside and he will never stop, just being a complete total villain. And then there is a red slash effect across the screen and William says that Zoe is dead. Zoe's father tries to stop William but he can't because William is wearing the golden Freddy suit we saw from earlier. At least that's what I assumed because William had the suit in the previous minigame, but I could be wrong about this so don't take that as a fact. And that is where that minigame ends off. And finally, Night 4's minigame, which is actually the final one, starts us off as the blue shirt guy once again. However, this time we are in a familiar place, the cargo ship from Jolly's 2. In this more gameplay oriented minigame, we essentially just need to sneak past these guards in order to get on the back of this truck. And upon entering the truck, the minigame will fade to black and end. Now, I don't want to comment on the actual story too much because, again, I don't really know what's going on. Like, I don't really know why the, the blue shirt guy was on the boat from Jolly's 2 even though he was just at the pizzeria. I don't know the timeline. There's not, like, any dates. So yeah, I'm not going to really go into the details, but I do want to give a little bit of praise for a second. Not necessarily to the story in the minigames, but just the minigames themselves. They are now so much more unique and diverse. They are not only full of different story beats, but also dialogue scenes with multiple characters. They are also a lot more cinematic now by featuring music and also use things like having the music cut out or dramatic shadows to add to a specific scene. Other than that though, I don't have a whole lot else to say, so let's move right on to the visuals for Jolly 3. Not including Jolly 3 Chapter 2, Jolly 3 has to be by far the best visuals in the series. The game has made so many improvements over the first two installments in almost every way that I honestly don't even know where to begin. Firstly, the main menu and HUD elements of the game are an immediate leap forward in terms of how professional they look. Like, this has got to be one of the best menus in a fan game. And not only that, but it runs flawlessly. This also translates to the camera systems in the game. I especially like this effect when you get a signal is lost in the camera. Compare this to the other signal lost effects in the other games and again it's just night and day how much better it actually looks. Everything just feels so snappy when you're using the cameras thanks to the audio design and effects that play. And not only that but the actual graphics themselves have improved so much. The models for the animatronics look a lot less blocky now and again have much better proportions especially when compared to the first game. The animatronics also now feature withered designs that help bring out how scary they are just that much more. 
The environment also feels so much more vast and real, despite this game using the highly limited Click Team Fusion still. I would say this game is not too far off from the official FNAF titles in most aspects, because that's just how good they actually look. With every single room in this game, you can tell that the developer took his time to make them look good. Even the random cameras that you won't even be looking at look great. And some are even animated with these shadows of the fans so you can see when they have shut off or not. Which I thought was just such a nice detail that he did not need to add. The pixelated minigames like I talked about previously are also a huge leap up visually and now have their own distinct style that helps set them apart from the Scott games. My only wish is that Ivan G maybe took a little bit less inspiration from Sister Location and instead made the aesthetic of this game something completely new. But I understand that that's what he was going for for this title and I can respect it. Also, I can happily say that the jump scares in this game actually do look good and are no longer just those slow, boring animations. That being said, that's all I have to say on the visuals for Jolly 3, so now let's go on to the final game in this video, Jolly 3 Chapter 2. And finally, last but not least, we have Jolly 3 Chapter 2, which was released June 11th of 2018. This game starts off where Jolly 3 Chapter 1 left us, heading to the underground facility under the Jolly's factory in order to find possible animatronics. First up is the gameplay. The game opens up with us going down an elevator very similar to Five Nights at Freddy's sister location, and upon leaving the elevator we enter a completely dark room. Here we must use our phone flashlight or night vision in order to look around, and we are also equipped with a map of the location. In this map, there is a marker of where we need to go, signified by this blue dot. We basically need to click around and free roam around this area until we are able to make it to the blue ping. After arriving at this blue ping on our map, we are told that we can actually not go into this room yet and we will need a key card by working as an intern at the facility. So basically we need to go be a night guard once again for 5 nights in order to get the key card. And I know this isn't the story section, but like, come on, wh what is that? Like, you have to work five nights to get the key card. Like, I don't know, it just seems like too plot driven. But anyways, this is where the game truly starts as it is our first night of five. However, before going into the office gameplay, I just want to make it clear now that there is two sections to the office gameplay. There's the main office section gameplay that you are seeing now. And then once it reaches 6 a.m., there is an additional night that you'll have to do that has its own unique gameplay, so I will go over those now. Once you arrive at the office, you will receive a phone call from a brand new voice, and this voice actually belongs to Kevin Johnson, who if you remember from the previous game is the CEO of Jolly Entertainment. This is when we learn about the animatronics we will be going up against, Withered Jolly and Withered George. To fend off against the two animatronics, you will need to watch over them on your monitor, similar to the other games. And once they reach your door, you will need to turn around and use a jammer kind of thing like in Jolly 2. The gameplay is not as simple as this however, and actually gets a lot more complicated. Basically though, when turning around, you are able to access the radar, the jammer, and the maintenance panel. The maintenance panel is similar to FNAF 3 and will be used to reboot things that will go offline in your office. The jammer, of course, jams the animatronics, sending them back. However, just like in Jolly's 2, you can't spam it and it needs to regen. The radar helps you find the location of the animatronics, but also needs to be rebooted after using it. And it takes a really long time, so like you cannot like just use this thing at will. Like you need to actually conserve it. And that is my alarm going off. I have been up for like 36 hours making this video. Wow. Anyways, the gameplay is a little more in depth than this, but like you just heard my alarm and this video is already getting long, so I don't really want to talk about it for too long. But I do think these mechanics do work very good, and while I don't think it has the same qualities that made Chapter 1's office gameplay so stressful, I think it does do a good job of keeping the office gameplay engaging, even if it is just two animatronics you're going against. This game also has a thing where you will not be able to see if the animatronics are at the door, so once again you will be flipping through cameras and memorizing animatronic locations in order to get through the nights. This paired with the fact that the radar and jammer take so long to regen, lead to some of the most high tension moments in the series, where you will feel defenseless and I think that's where the gameplay of this game shines the most. 
In between every night of the office, you will have to complete another phase of gameplay, and this phase of gameplay involves you decrypting files at your computer. There are 10 files total on your computer in front of you, and you will need to do one by clicking on the file and waiting for it to reach 100%. If the player is not looking at the computer, however, the percentage bar will not go up. To cause you trouble while you're trying to decrypt the files, there are old animatronics inside your home. These animatronics are withered versions of Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. Wow. These animatronics are withered versions of Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy, and they are actually called the Rusted animatronics, I believe. And they will attack you in a way that is very similar to FNAF 4. There are three places they can come from, the left door, the middle door, or the right window and you can prevent these animatronics from killing you by going and checking on the door you hear making a creaking noise. Once you arrive at the door, you will need to listen for breathing just like in FNAF 4, and if there is no breathing, you can just lock the door. If there is breathing, however, you must shine your light to scare away any animatronic. You will need to do this until all 10 files have been decrypted, and now that I think of it, it's pretty much a combination of the Breaker Room from Sister Location and FNAF 4, so just think of it as that basically. Which I don't think is a bad thing. I like that this section of the game doesn't run on time and instead takes as long as it takes you to complete it. And I also think the breathing mechanics are a nice change of pace from the frantic camera scrolling and chaotic office nights. Night 5 changes it up once again, however. You are told that you need to go to the oxygen control room, and this begins another free roam section similar to the beginning of the game. This time, things are different, however, because now George will be roaming around the building as you make your way to the oxygen control room. You will need to avoid George by listening for breathing or checking your night vision on your phone to know when he is in front of you. If George is in front of you, you will need to hold shift to cover your mouth and quiet your breathing until George walks away. Once you have made it to the oxygen control room, you will find yourself in yet another office room. This office gives you a lot of things to worry about, like a camera system, a door, a window in front of you, and a light switch. And this office is just very similar to the one in Jolly's 1. There's also another panel on your right, which will need to be filled up like the decrypting file step previously seen in the last section. And you must listen for George and Jolly while you attempt to fill up the oxygen meters. George and Jolly actually do have audio cues in this section, unlike any other parts in the game, which means you can remain on the oxygen panel until you hear a sound and then quickly bring the panel down and flash the light. If you hear another sound after they have already appeared at the window though, that means they are at your door and you must close it immediately. This section isn't very hard at all, but I still think it was pretty cool to include and it's a cool callback to Jolly 1. The mechanics, while not anything super impressive, work for this section and I don't really have anything negative to say about it. After finishing this part though, we are sent back into the free roaming section for the final time. However, this time we are able to actually go into the room that we could not get into at the start of the game. Because of course now we have the key card from working our 5 nights. After finally making it to the door, the player unlocks it using the key card they earned and upon opening the door they head into an elevator. Once the elevator is finished going down, the doors open and the lights turn on in the room one by one, revealing the animatronic we had been searching for the whole time to be Springtrap. Now while frustrating at times, I do commend this game for its willingness to change the formula many times over the course of its runtime. I mean you had the office sections, the decrypting files sections, the free roam. This game just had a lot of variety when it came to the gameplay, which I felt made it the second strongest entry in the series when it comes to gameplay, only shortly falling behind chapter 1. Anyways, that's everything I have to say about the gameplay, so let's talk about the story. Again, I know I've said this every single time, but I'm just going to talk about how the game presents the story to you because the lore, again, I don't really, I don't really know what's going on in the lore. First off, I just want to say that in this chapter, we are given some great performances by multiple voice actors who play the different phone guys, and I think they just absolutely killed it. Especially Kevin Johnson's voice actor, who is just so comically over the top in his phone calls, and just think it adds a lot of charm to the game. My name is Kevin, Kevin Johnson, the CEO of Jolly Entertainment. And welcome to the Jolly Entertainment Underground Facility, housing one of the most advanced electronic robots ever. The game also features these audio logs that give you more insight into the story after every single night, which I thought was a pretty cool addition for the people who actually want to know about the lore. And they also give you the option to skip it, which is nice. And if that wasn't enough, the game once again features multiple endings, 
with the good ending only being achievable through a series of easter eggs and completing minigames. Now I didn't do it myself because I didn't know how to when I played through the game, but from watching other people do it, it's a lot like the happiest day from Five Nights at Freddy's 3, with how you needed to do a few easter eggs and minigame challenges to trigger the true ending. And again, I think it's really cool that the dev goes out of his way to add these hidden endings that he knows most of the player base won't even see. So huge props to him for putting all this work in, you can tell he's really dedicated to this story he's trying to tell. Anyways, that's all I got for the story this time, so let's talk about the visuals. Now finally we are here at the end and we get to talk about the visuals in this game. And since this game is very similar to Jolly 3 Chapter 1 in terms of visuals, I wanted to instead solely dedicate this section to the animatronic designs. The first animatronic design that I want to bring up is Jolly's. Throughout the series we have seen him get slowly more withered throughout the night. However now in this installment, Jolly is completely missing his head and instead has a human like purple reddish face, which I just love so much. There's just something very eerie and weird about a real life head being visible in these fan games, as it's common for them to stray far away from showing any humans. As for Withered George's design however, I feel like it could have used some more work. The model just feels sort of plain to me and doesn't really look like a real animatronic. I think it has something to do with the fact that you can't see how his jaw is connected as there is no endoskeleton in his mouth, but I'm not sure if that's it. The rusty versions of the main four animatronics do look really good though in my opinion, and they are definitely a step up in quality from the last time we saw them in Jolly 2, before they were the rusted versions. And while not being the most insanely high detailed models of animatronics, I think these guys look very creepy when you're actually playing the game and seeing them in action. Speaking of seeing them in action, the jump scares in this game are really good. They are super fast and in your face similar to chapter 1 which I thought was just a huge step up from the past games once again. Around 6 months ago, I covered every single Jolly game in the series. At least, I thought I had. However, after posting that video, it was brought to my attention that there are actually two more Jolly games in the series, titled Jolly Bees and Jolly Bees Phase 2. I had a ton of comments telling me I needed to play them for myself, however, after doing a quick search on Game Jolt, nothing appeared. And that was actually due to the games being deleted. See, Jolly Bees and Jolly are both based on a restaurant chain in Australia that goes by the same name. Alright, so editing plane trace here, back again for another correction. So at this part, for some reason I said Jollibee's was a restaurant in Australia, even though it's actually a restaurant in the Philippines. I have absolutely no idea what possessed me to say Australia, but yeah, that was a huge mistake in this video, and you guys definitely let me know in the comments. Anyways, just had to clear that up, now let's get back to the video. Similar to Chuck E. Cheese, the brand has its very own mascot, only instead of it being an animatronic, it is a wearable suit. Unlike Chuck E. Cheese, however, Jollibees disliked the idea of a fan game being based on their iconic location and characters, so the developer had to take the game down, effectively wiping any trace of it off the internet. Jollibees can no longer be played, as it was taken down due to infringement of trademark rights. Or so they thought, as many people took it upon themselves to repost the game's download links. Seriously, it only takes one Google search to find the game, so it's safe to say removing it from Game Jolt didn't really keep the game under wraps. Anyways, without any more rambling, let's look into Jolly Bees, the deleted FNAF fan game they don't want you to play. Well, our children have been victims of food poisoning earlier this morning while at a party at a, at a local fast food restaurant. Surveillance footage shows that an unknown man wearing blue fur broke into the kitchen, kitchen and added what seemed to be chemicals, which was later given to the children. 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 After a really sick intro cutscene which details the shutting down of Jollibees due to food poisoning, our first night begins. 
But not how our typical FNAF fan game night begins. No, instead we start our shift at the entrance of the restaurant. This is a really cool concept that is used a lot in this game. Basically, we need to do tasks around the restaurant during the game, so letting us walk around in this space before each night really lets us connect with the location more than we ever could in other FNAF fan games. I actually remember one of the games in my obscure FNAF fan games video had something very similar to that and I really liked it. The building also has a creepy atmosphere with eerie noises and the sound of dripping water which all give the location a worn down feeling and makes you feel like you really shouldn't be there. Anyways, we are allowed to go wherever we please but we are given the objective to find our office. Finding the office starts the actual first night of the game where we must survive in the typical FNAF fashion. During in the office sections of gameplay, we have a few things we need to keep track of. To our right is an animatronic behind a curtain, which needs to be flashed every once in a while to stop her from killing you. If you wait a long time, she will slowly move closer and closer to the window, however flashing for a few seconds will reset her to her original location. In front of us is a door with a window. Every once in a while, an animatronic can peek its head into the window, and to stop them from killing you, you need to turn your power off, and hide until you think the animatronic animatronic has gone away. Now this mechanic didn't work as intended I'm pretty sure as most of the time it had me raging but I'll go more into that later. To the left of us is also a big open vent. There are two animatronics that try to get us from this vent, that being this burger guy and this other animatronic right here, and we must keep track of the vents using the cameras and seal them if an animatronic is approaching. However, the longer the vent is sealed, the more air we lose. Especially if you have both vents sealed, then you're basically screwed because you run out of air so fast. One really cool gimmick about the two animatronics that come in the vents is that they each have another way of getting rid of them. If you know the burger guy is in the vent, then you can flash him with your light and he will go away. If the other animatronic is in the vent, however, you can make sure you don't flash the light on her and this will actually save you from her killing you. This creates a whole new layer of skill with dealing with these animatronics as you can skip out on sealing the vents if you have the confidence that you know which animatronic is in the vent. It also adds a really cool risk reward mechanic to the gameplay rhythm that keeps things interesting. Now there is also one more mechanic that is is not good at all. This mechanic had me slamming my keyboard every time I died to it on later nights. So basically every once in a while you will get this virus thing. When the virus appears, no matter what you are doing, you need to quickly make your way to the cameras and find this little bug, which will be on one random camera. You only get a few seconds to stop this virus before you are instantly killed. And this mechanic made me so mad because it's completely RNG based. Sometimes the virus will be on the first camera you check and sometimes it'll be on the last, meaning you're dead, all because you couldn't guess correctly. You also get these ad pop-ups similar to Pizza Sim that can appear at random and will slow you stopping the virus even more, and they are just so annoying. One cool detail I did notice, however, is that the ads are for other fan games, like they have the Twisted Carnival in here, Honey Bears, Oh yeah, and also don't even get me started on when an animatronic appears at the window and the virus pops up. Like what does the game want me to do? Do I turn off the light and hide from the animatronic at the window? Do I search for the virus? Oh yeah, and then the turning off the light mechanic also just wouldn't work most of the time, but I think I've figured it out now. So after a few seconds of waiting with the light off, the prompt appears telling you that you can turn your light back on, but I still kept getting jump scared. What was I possibly doing wrong? Was I waiting too long before turning off the light? Well, no. Turns out the game tells you you can turn your light on, but you actually need to wait a little extra time to make sure the animatronic is gone. There's no audio cue or visual cue for this or anything. You just kind of have to guess how long to keep the power off, and if you're in too much of a rush to get the light on, well, you're dead. Also, I don't know if it was just because the rage building up inside me, but tell me these aren't the most annoying jump scare noises you've ever heard. This had me raging so bad, especially during the later nights where I was dying over and over again. Now, despite how mad this game was making me, it's actually not all that bad. 
The graphics are seriously impressive, especially for when the game came out, along with all of the animations. The gameplay feels very snappy and easy to understand despite all of the RNG sections, and things like the gameplay with the animatronics and the vents make me think that the gameplay was really well thought out, and just a few bad things got thrown into the mix. One last gripe I do have though with the office gameplay is that most of the cameras are useless when actually playing. Other than when you need to look for the virus, you will almost never use any of the cameras on the right side. My strategy when playing was to primarily only check the two vent cams as if any other animatronics attacked I could easily see them at the door. This seemed like a big oversight and I think that adding at least one more animatronic that needed to be monitored throughout the building would have given this game a lot more depth. Lack of animatronics is also an issue in this game. While all of the characters are beautifully designed and do a great job of representing the characters from Jolly Bees, most of their gameplay is the same. Two animatronics can come from the left vent, two can come up to the front door, and you have the one on the right that's always there. Adding just one more character to the game would have been very nice. Now luckily this game isn't content dry at all, as there are actually new tasks between every single night. So after we finish night one, which isn't too hard at all, we are once again set free in the pizzeria, only this time we are told to go to Yum's party room. After eventually finding the room, this kicks off our very first post night task. In this one, we need to monitor Yum with our flashlight while turning these gears. This section does seem cool at first, but very quickly you realize how easy and repetitive it is. It is extremely easy to stop Yum from killing you as the sound cues make it very obvious when they move. There is also almost no tension built up, so basically it's just a 5 minute section of this. Night 2's post game task has us go to Twirly's show stage. This mini game takes a very similar approach to the last. Once again we must endure the torture of slowly turning a bunch of knobs. I have no idea whose idea it was to put this many, but... Yeah, there's that many. The gameplay for avoiding Twirly is a little different however. This time if we hear a sound cue and see Twirly approaching, we must hide under our desk. During this under the desk section, we need to position ourselves in a way so that Twirly's eyes will be blocked by the chairs. It's a cool overall concept, however just like the previous minigame, there is little to no tension and ends up being another boring repetitive section you wish you could just get through faster. Night 3's post game task suffers the exact same problem. Spin the little things, look up when you hear a sound cue, and stop the animatronic. Only this time it's even easier. Literally all you do is drag this thing in front of the animatronic, and apparently that is enough to stop them from killing you. Night 4 actually had the most unique post night minigame of them all. This one has us enter Jollibee's room, and in here we need to sweep the floor while also making sure we don't walk into Jollibee. Kind of similar to the walking sections in Sister Location. Now this section was once again far too easy and I'll admit it does look a little goofy when you're sweeping, but I can appreciate what the developers were going for and will give them credit for making this one just a little bit harder. Also it's really cool shining your light on Jollibee and seeing the little animation he does to walk away, I just thought that was a cool detail. For the fifth and final post night task, we are told to go fix Hedy, and this is where the game branches off into to four different endings. The discovery ending is unlocked by skipping one of the tasks earlier in the game and going to the parts and service room after night 5. Here you will find some tapes from an old technician who was killed by Hetty. The suspense ending is unlocked by leaving the building after night 5 concludes, which shows us an advertisement for the Jolly Bees restaurant. The slacker ending is achieved by skipping every assigned task, which results in the player receiving a paycheck and a pink slip for not doing the tasks the manager asked. Nobody told me you were able to skip these sections the whole time. I thought you had to do all of them. The death ending, or true ending, which is the one I got, occurs after the player completes night 5 along with all previous tasks and then enters Hetty's room. Upon entering we hear a tape from the Jolly Entertainment CEO Kevin Johnson, who some of you may recognize from my previous Jolly video. He tells us to click a button on the side of Hetty's neck and put on the suit, which causes this to happen. <laughs> Suit. Now you should be able to see the suit of maintenance screen. At first 
have a trouble shooting the suit. It's a cut, cut, cut. It's over. We got him. Very well. Now on the phase two. Basically, our player is killed in the Sioux, and the game ends off with a cliffhanger leading into the next Jolly Bees game, Jolly Bees Phase 2. I have played through around half of Jolly Bees Phase 2, however, it is taking me a very long time to complete that game. And because it's been so long since my last upload, I'm only going to be covering Phase 1 in this video. Overall, I don't think that Jolly Bees is a bad fan game. Despite my many gripes with the gameplay, those things can be overlooked, and the game has many more things about it that you can appreciate. First of all, the art and animations the game presents are all fantastic looking. I especially really like the cutscenes that were done for the opening and ending of the game. It really did a lot to breathe life into the game's universe and get me interested in what's going on at Jolly Bees. While the gameplay isn't very diverse, the game makes up for it with the many locations we get to explore, the different jobs we are allowed to do, and the multiple endings we are allowed to unlock. The game also has its own unique identity, and gives us stuff like an extras menu and even a sixth night. My overall consensus for Jolly Bees is that it is an amazing FNAF fan game to watch very similar to something like Sister Location, but just isn't as much fun when you are actually playing for yourself. The game seems to get overwhelming praise from the FNAF community as far as I've seen, so I'm really interested in hearing what you guys think about this game. Anyways, that has been the video. Thank you all so much for the continuing support on the channel, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. Over a year ago now, I made a video where I reviewed every single Jolly game in the series. With Jolly being one of the most hyped up fan game series there is to play, I was very surprised with the game's quality. A few months after that video was released, I was made aware that the series had actually been soft rebooted. This birthed two new games in the Jolly series, those being Jolly Bees and Jolly Bees Phase 2. I made another video covering Jolly Bees, but never got around to checking out Phase 2. Ever since then, I've been getting countless comments from you guys telling me I need to check out this final installment. So that's exactly what I did today. So join me today as we find out if Jollibee's Phase 2 really does live up to its hype. Before going into Jollibee's Phase 2, quick recap on Jollibee's. Jollibee's took place at the Jollibee's restaurant after it had been closed. We learned in the intro cutscene of that game that the restaurant was shut down after a mysterious man broke into the kitchen and added chemicals to the food that was later given to the children. Throughout the game, we spend our time as a night guard, watching over the Jollibee's animatronics while also doing unique tasks around the building after every single night. At the end of the game, we get another cutscene where we see technicians attempting to fix the heady animatronic who seems to be alive never go near her she must be put down the, the, the thing must be thrown away we then get another cutscene where our main protagonist is told to get into the heady suit before this happens all right now the animatronic parts are tucked away you can now go right inside and wear the suit <laughs> you're now inside the animatronic suit now you should be able to see the suit of maintenance screen. The first step of troubleshooting the suit is the cut 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 You don't. <laughs> This kicks off Jolly Bee's Phase 2. Jolly Bee's Phase 2 opens up with our new protagonist receiving a call from his boss, Michael. Michael informs us that we will be getting a new shipment from the restaurant Jolly Bee's that is just down the street. We learn that Jolly Bee's was shut down for health code violations and the animatronics are being shipped over to our workplace, LBM Shipments, for investigation. After this, we load into the warehouse management interface. This is basically our main menu of the game and here we can navigate throughout the various different tasks the game has us complete, but more on that after night one. 
During these nights, instead of having to survive until 6am, instead we need to send a certain amount of shipments to their proper locations. To do this, we can open up a tablet to our left, which has two windows on it. The window on the left is the conveyor belt where we need to send our shipments. We do this by turning on the conveyor belt and matching each of the shipments to their respective letters. This isn't too difficult, but we need to do a lot of them. With the number of shipments being required to beat the night going up as the night progresses. On the right window, we have four different options to defend against the animatronics. We have a motion detector which will tell us where the animatronics are located in the shipping facility, cameras which are not very useful due to the conveyor belts being a blind spot to them, an audio lure which is very useful in luring the animatronics away from your location, and a hacking tool which can be used temporarily to stun an animatronic. Failing to do this hack properly though will result in the system shutting down, costing you precious time during your night. The really cool thing about these different defenses against the animatronics is we are able to pick which ones work best for us and stick to those ones. This gives the player agency over how the gameplay feels, making each player's experience unique to them. Another really cool thing about the conveyor belt mechanic is that moving the conveyor belt on the left window also moves the conveyor belt scattered throughout the facility. This means that if you happen to turn on the conveyor belt while an animatronic is on it, that animatronic will be carried closer to your location, arriving in front of your window in a much faster time frame. This adds a risk reward element to the conveyor belt, making the player question when the right time is to use it and when it should be kept off. If an animatronic does reach our office, they will be seen standing outside of the window in front of it. For some animatronics, we need to flash them with our flashlight, while others need to be hidden from by going under the table. This can be really tricky because the flashlight dies very fast and has a long cooldown. This means that if multiple animatronics arrive back to back, there is a big chance you won't be able to flash them both. This puts the responsibility on the player to make sure the animatronics arrival times are long enough apart to give the flashlight time to regenerate. On top of all of this, our motion detector, cameras, audio, and hacking can all go out of order, requiring us to use our tablet on the right side of the office to reboot them. This can take a pretty long time, so it's up to you to manage your resources properly if you plan on getting through the night. After finishing night 1, we are rewarded with $1200 and sent back to the warehouse management interface. Here we can choose to either upgrade our different systems, go into night 2, or do optional side jobs to earn more money. This is really cool and unique from any other fan game I have played. This gives the player even more expression of strategy by letting them upgrade the tools they use most frequently. Here you can develop your own method for getting through the nights, which makes the game once again feel unique for each player's playthrough. The optional side jobs are also really cool and all feature unique gameplay mechanics that were pretty stressful to get through. The first of these jobs is box transportation. In this one, we need to drive around a forklift, picking up boxes with designated numbers on them, and returning them to their proper shelves. While doing this, we also need to worry about a few different animatronics. Throughout our time moving the boxes, we also need to make sure we are turning around frequently to both listen for and look for any threats present. If we hear an animatronic breathing, we need to hold our breath, and if we see one in front of us, we need to shine our light on them. How good we do during the job to determines how much money we get, so it's in our best interest to do as well as we possibly can. The second job offering we are able to do is box checking. In this mini game, a conveyor belt brings over a box, which has various details on it regarding its shipment. Next to this conveyor belt is a monitor displaying similar information to what is on these boxes. It is up to us to decide whether or not the monitor's information matches up with the info on the boxes. The more boxes we get right, the more money we get, so it's a good idea to take our time and make sure we are choosing properly. Also, just like the last mini game, we are able to look behind us. Here we will again need to both use our flashlight and hold our breath to avoid various different animatronics out to kill us. Whenever the conveyor belt moves, it is extremely loud, making it nearly impossible to hear approaching animatronics, which just adds a new layer of difficulty to this already hard side job. The third job offering is printing, which in my opinion is the most frustrating out of them all. In this one, there is once again a loud conveyor belt just like the previous mini game. Instead of having to match info though like the previous one, this time we need to type in the proper code before shipping the box off. To do this, we need to click a button to stop whichever number is rotating. The problem is the numbers move extremely fast, so timing the actual click of the button is harder than it seems. Also, if you put in a wrong number, you can't go back, meaning you have to just 
give up on that box and move on to the next. Just like the last two jobs, again we can look behind us and use our light as well as hold our breath to defend ourselves. Since the conveyor belt was so loud, I would typically just hold my breath whenever it was bringing in the next box, and I'm not sure if this strategy works all the time, but it worked out pretty well for me. This still is the most frustrating side job though. Timing the buttons is just so annoying. Also, this is the longest of the four jobs, making it not worth it at all for the pay. For the final job opportunity, we have driving, which was actually my go-to job during the playthrough. In this one, just like all the previous jobs, we need to worry about looking behind us, flashing our light on two animatronics, as well as holding our breath every once in a while in order to survive. Behind us, we have a computer which we use to control a robot. We need to use this robot to pick up various boxes labeled with different letters. We then need to bring these boxes to their respective section of the facility. This can be pretty time consuming because you can't see the whole facility at once. I think this mini game is the best though because it's not overly punishing, but still challenges the player to memorize where each box belongs if they wish to get through the job pretty quickly. So yeah, that was all the side jobs we are able to do. I really like the idea of this because it allows the player to tackle the game in whichever order they please. One complaint I have about it is you are able to do whichever job you want as many times as you please. This means that if there is one particular job you find the easiest, you will most likely end up just spamming that one instead of experiencing all the jobs the game has to offer. I think the gameplay would have benefited if it prevented the player from doing the same job more than once. Regardless though, this is still a super cool idea and made the game stand out a lot. As for nights 2 through 5, each of them is the same gameplay wise. Each night the number of boxes we need to transport increases, making the time we need to fend off the animatronics and survive much longer. We have Popo and Yum who both need to be shined by our flashlight whenever they approach our window, Twirly who we will need to hide under the desk from and also avoid her stare, Hetty who we once again need to hide under the desk from while also avoiding her hand, and finally Jollibee who once again we need to hide under the desk from. I understand that the way the gameplay was designed for this entry does not require each each animatronic's gameplay to vary that much, but I still think I would have liked it if each animatronic behaved a little differently. It feels like all the animatronics can be dealt with in a very similar way, which takes a lot away from the character's uniqueness. Regardless though, the gameplay in this fan game really impressed me. It does something that no other fan game has done, and actually managed to execute it without the game feeling buggy or unbalanced. After shipping our last 100 boxes on night 5, we get one final cutscene to end off the game. Hey man, Kevin Johnson here. <laughs> Look, let's just cut to the chase here. I'm dying. I ordered phase 1 of the Soul Captivation Project, and it turned out great. <laughs> I'm now initiating a phase two of that project, which is the test of reliability of using an animatronic robot to preserve human life. <laughs> if this project works, you'll see my, my brain embedded to an skeleton skull. <laughs> Everything is all in place now. Phase 2 will begin in 3, 2, 1. Overall, I really enjoyed Jollibee's Phase 2. The game offered unique mechanics and actually tried to innovate on the original format for a FNAF style game. I respect the developers for taking the risk of trying something new and I think it paid off in the end. In all honesty though, it's hard for me to say that this was better than Jollibee's Phase 1, as that game felt like it overall just had more content. But nonetheless, this was a very interesting fan game that I do not regret checking out. With that being said though, that's going to be it from me. I hope you guys all enjoyed the video and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. When searching through articles ranking FNAF fan games, you will always see one game listed either at the top or very close to it. That game is the Joy of Creation Story Mode, one of the most highly praised FNAF fan games in the community. 
Many people like it for its insanely good visuals, while others think the gameplay is what shines the most. This one person even said that the game had their hand shaking the entire time they were playing. So you'd expect me to have played this game, right? You know, being a FNAF YouTuber and all? Well, surprisingly, no, I still haven't got around to it. But I decided to change that today. So join me as I do a deep dive into the Joy of Creation story mode to see if it really is as good as people say. This video is going to be split into three chapters. I'm first going to talk about the game's five levels while giving my thoughts on each one, and then after that I'll talk about the game's story which unfolds through many cutscenes seen between stages, and lastly I'll talk about the game's graphics, controls, and just overall presentation. So without further ado, let's begin with Memory 1. In our very first memory of the game, we play as Nick when he was a child. We are in our dark bedroom under our crib when we get a call from our brother Michael. Michael tells us there are monsters trying to kill us and then he gives us a rundown on how to survive from them. Freddy will come to the window. You will know he is there when you see his arm against the glass, which means you will need to hold the curtain shut until he goes away which will be indicated to you through a sound cue. Chica will every once in a while peek her head through the closet door, and to avoid dying to her, you must shut off your lamp and make sure you don't sleep. Bonnie will bang on your door before peeking his head in. Failing to hide behind the crib before Bonnie enters the room will result in him doing this. Finally, Foxy will begin scratching behind your bed, indicating that he is in his first movement phase. After moving one more time, Foxy's hook will be able to be seen behind your crib. This means that the next time Foxy moves, he will be standing right in front of the window, blocking you from closing the curtains. To get rid of Foxy, you will need to close your eyes and sleep, which will cause him to crawl back under your bed. There is something so terrifying about the idea of Foxy crawling back under your bed, waiting for another time to try and kill you. Also, the visual of him standing above your crib is just so terrifying to me. We also have something kind of similar to a power meter, which is called our sanity. Our sanity drains every time we have the lamp turned off, and every time we look at one of the animatronics directly. This means that we need to conserve as much lamp time as possible, as well as trying to avoid eye contact with the animatronics at all costs. At first, I thought this night was very frustrating and unfair, but now that I have gotten the hang of the gameplay, I can see how well thought out and expertly crafted this night actually is. Now it sounds very simple on paper, however when the animatronics gimmicks begin to overlap, that is where the gameplay really shines in my opinion. For example, there are so many times where you will see Freddy's arm at the window, but also hear Bonnie's knocking at the door and we'll have to decide to either stick to closing the curtains or to try to quickly hide from Bonnie before Freddy gets in. It's moments like these in particular that add so much tension to the night. I can't stress enough how many times I would be holding the curtains closed, hoping that the other animatronics would just give me a few extra seconds before killing me. To add to the already stressful night as well, while losing your sanity, the screen starts to become less clear and your hearing also becomes more limited. This makes you focus extra hard to hear every single sound effect and adds a whole new challenge to the already tough gameplay. That's all not to mention that this night is 10 minutes long. I'm not joking, it's literally 10 minutes. So those attempts where I made it 9 minutes in had my heart absolutely pounding because I did not want to get reset back to the start. This isn't even the most stressful of the nights though. Night 5 really made me understand what that guy meant when he said the game had him shaking. Let me not get too far ahead of myself though. Overall, I thought the first night of this game was one of the best FNAF gameplay loops I have ever played. Everything just felt perfectly thought out and it was able to stay tense the entire time. The only real thing I thought was done poorly was how the mechanics were explained. They don't really explain the sanity meter to you at all, and kind of just expect you to learn through trial and error, which can be very time consuming due to how long the night actually was. I would still rate it an 8 out of 10 though, because boy did it feel good to beat this one. In Night 2, or Memory 2, we play as Scott's wife, and this one takes place in the living room. In this one, we once again need to survive against Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy, however the gameplay in this one is completely different. We can now fully roam around the room. 
This room has a main TV, a door to the left and right, and a middle doorway with a keyhole which you can look through. Freddy and Foxy will make their way towards the right and left doors, and when you know one of them is about to burst in, you must hide on the side of the wall that the door is on, to avoid their line of sight. You can monitor both Freddy and Foxy by sitting on the couch and watching the TV. Here you will also see headcams of both of them walking towards the door, and there is also a pause button. As long as you are holding this button, the animatronic you are watching will stop walking. You must use this mechanic to manipulate when each of the animatronics will come to the door in order to prevent more than one coming in at the same time. While sitting on this couch, you may also sometimes hear growling behind you. That means that Chica is attacking. To avoid her from killing you, you just need to stand up and stay completely still. Now finally for Bonnie. Bonnie will make his way closer and closer to the middle door with five stages. First starting in the back of the hallway, and then moving closer each phase until he eventually reaches the keyhole and you can see his eye shining through it. This happens right before Bonnie opens the door and scans the room which requires you to hide against the wall with his door on it. To avoid Bonnie coming in at the same time as Freddy and Foxy, you need to listen for the sound cue which plays every single time Bonnie moves, and take that into consideration when choosing the times Freddy and Foxy will come in. This whole night is extremely chaotic and requires you to trust your gut a lot to make it through. This night is also 10 minutes long and once again features intense visuals that had my heart racing towards the end of the night. This night has a perfect gameplay system that much like the first one doesn't feel linear or scripted at all. You have full control of how everything unfolds during the night and it is up to you to manipulate everything accordingly in order to win. This is yet again another fantastic night that I honestly wouldn't change anything about. Funnily enough, the only criticism I have for this night is the same as the last. Things just aren't explained thoroughly enough. You have no idea about the 5 phases Bonnie moves through unless you look up a guide, which I'm not gonna lie I had to do because I could not sit there and trial and error over and over during this 10 minute night. Overall, this night gets a 9 out of 10 for me. I honestly think it's a little better than the first one. For Memory 3, we play as Scott for probably the easiest level in the game, and this one is placed inside of an office. There is a door in front of us, a door to our left, and a window to our right. And by pressing space on this setup, we are allowed to check the monitors. This shows us cameras of our left door, middle door, and window. In this night, we need to go around the different doors flashing our lights on Freddy, who we need to flash 10 times before we reach 6am to win the stage. While trying to do this, we again must deal with Foxy, Bonnie, and Chica. Foxy will randomly appear in one of the doorways, and if we go to flash that specific doorway while Foxy is in it, he will kill us. We can get rid of Foxy by going to the monitors and staring at him until he goes away. Failing to get rid of Foxy fast enough will also get us killed. Bonnie works kind of the opposite way from Foxy. If you see Bonnie when checking any of the doorways, then keep that in mind and make sure you don't check on Bonnie in the cameras as spotting Bonnie on the cameras will actually result in him breaking that camera, and it will never come back for the rest of the night. Last but not least, we have Chica, who randomly a few times during the night will appear inside of this wall. Chica will slowly begin crawling out of this wall, and it is our job to stop her from getting out. We can do this by keeping an eye on her as much as possible, which will slow how fast she can crawl out. While doing this, we also must find three cupcakes around the room, as doing so will make her disappear. These can be found in all types of places, like trash cans, behind posters, and even out in the hallways. There is an audio cue paired with every single cupcake, however, they can still be a nuisance, as you must make sure Foxy isn't in the hallway you're trying to check. Now, while there isn't anything inherently wrong with this night, I just felt that it was a little boring compared to the other ones. To me, this one felt far too easy and also felt very safe most of the time. Foxy is just not hard to deal with at all, and while Chica's cupcake hunt is really cool, it isn't very hard either. So it leads to this just being a chill kind of night. 
Which, honestly, for a fan game as hard as this one, isn't necessarily a bad thing, as nights 4 and 5 get extremely difficult. My final rating for Memory 3 is a 7 out of 10, still above average for FNAF fan game gameplay, with the really cool moments like the animations when you flash your light on Freddy, or the visual of Chica coming out of the wall, I just couldn't go any lower with the score. But I still wanted it to be lower than Memories 1 and 2, as this one just did not match those in terms of its tension. Yo, what's up guys? So I quickly just wanted to jump in here while editing to say that we are almost at 100,000 subscribers, which is absolutely insane. So if you guys are enjoying the video, please consider subscribing to help me reach that goal. Anyways, with that being said, let's get back to the video. For night 4, we keep playing as Scott, only this time we are in the basement. This memory spawns us on the 6th floor, with each floor having a different puzzle we need to solve in order to escape. Some of these puzzles were actually really tough to get through, but luckily we get a checkpoint after every floor. For floor 6, we need to exit the bathroom we spawn in and make our way over to this locked doorway. After attempting to open it, we get a hallucination which tells us to go back. After that, we just need to make our way back to the bathroom while trying to avoid this endo that's standing in the corner. To avoid this type of endo, we must stay as far away from it as possible. So in this floor's case, we just need to hug the wall until we make it to the bathroom and we are good. After that, we are taken to floor 5. In this one, we need to find an item belonging to each of the four characters that are hidden in the room. After finding these items, we must place them in the furnace, however, there are threats hiding everywhere. For example, when collecting Chica's cupcake from the poster, we must stop and listen until we no longer hear growling before grabbing it. We also need to make sure we don't open the locker next to the one housing Bonnie's guitar, as if we do so, an endo will kill us. This endo jump scare got me extremely bad when I was first playing. I did not expect him to jump out of the locker like that and it caught me off guard extremely bad. After burning all of the items, we can safely return back to the bathroom which brings us to floor 4. For floor 4, we need to make our way out of the bathroom and solve a pretty simple code on the wall by looking at some posters. After this, a gate opens up and behind it is another endo. Except this one is a little different, behaving more like a weeping angel. Anyways, we need to turn around to lure the endo as close as possible to us before making our way around him. Before going through the gate though, we can press the button once again which traps the endo on the other side. From here, we just need to do one more puzzle involving some more posters which opens a gate revealing a key. We can then take this key back to the bathroom and move down to floor 3, which is the easiest of them all. You literally just walk down a hallway and don't look behind you. I beat this one first try, so I'm not even sure if you can die at this one, but I'm guessing you can. Floor 2, which is probably the most frustrating of them all, we need to come out of the bathroom and we will see text flashing on these monitors. After this, a gate opens up revealing two more Weeping Angel Endos. We need to lure these Endos into our room and once again make our way around them to go the way they came from. While still staring at them, we need to walk backwards down the hallway while avoiding Endos standing to our left and right. After reaching the back of the hall, we can then press a button on the wall which opens up a gate housing one final Weeping Angel Endo. We once again need to lure him away from the door while also not dying to the other Endo in order to climb the stairs and interact with the door one final time. After this, all of the endos disappear and we can safely return to the bathroom, which takes us to floor 1, concluding memory 4. This level was a lot of trial and error and was very frustrating at times. For me, floor 2 was especially hard when you had to lead the endo out of the gate without getting killed. This night's more escape room nature was a nice change of pace from the survive 10 minutes mechanic each of the prior memories had, however I just can't say I enjoyed it as much as the first two memories. The deaths in this one sometimes felt more annoying than punishing and with the long cutscenes between every attempt I found myself getting more frustrated than anything on this one. So my rating for memory 4 is a 6 out of 10. 
Alright, so now for the fifth and final memory, which actually happens to not only be the hardest, but also my favorite night in the entire game. This one is going to be a little confusing to explain, I'm pretty sure, so just bear with me. So in front of us is a computer screen, and on this screen we can monitor two animatronics, Creation and Golden Freddy. Golden Freddy cannot kill us if we don't shock him, however the only way to beat the knight is to eventually shock him 13 times. Creation, however, can actually kill us. Every few seconds, Creation will move forward one space, and we must keep track of Creation and use our shock on him by pressing the lever to the right in order to reset his position every time he moves. If we are too slow to reset Creation's movement, he will break the barricade in front of him and move one floor closer to killing us. The lever that shocks the animatronics needs a lot of time to recharge and is also the one we need to use to shock Golden Freddy. While attempting to balance shocking both of those animatronics, we also need to worry about three different endos. By pressing space, we are able to look behind us, which reveals two doors. Each has a lever to close, however, only one can be closed at a time. If we turn back around and pull the green lever to the left, we can see two cameras. These cameras show us if there is an animatronic outside one of the doors behind us. If an animatronic is there, we need to close the door. However, it can get a little confusing as when it says right door on the monitor, it is actually to your left when you turn around. The third endo attacks you by randomly running towards you various times during the night. Every once in a while, you will hear running from one of your sides, which means you need to close that side's door as soon as possible. If both of the animatronics are at the other doors, this requires you to plan out your defense perfectly. Say an animatronic is in the left and right door, and the running one is coming from the right side. I would have to close the right door, and as soon as I heard the animatronic hit the door, I would need to check the left door's camera feed. If I see the left animatronic move immediately, I need to turn around and close the left door, and then the right one after. However, if the right animatronic goes first, I will simply hear him bang on the door, and then I can close the left one. It's this in-depth defense gameplay that makes this the best night the game has to offer, in my opinion. Trying to analyze the endo's positions in order to plan out how you will stop them from killing you, despite the fact that you can only close one door at a time, while also juggling your other responsibilities makes this such an engaging final night. The entire time you are playing this night, you are constantly analyzing where the animatronics will be, planning for your next move, and executing different movements to keep yourself alive. The whole thing is just so satisfying when you are the one in control, and despite this night taking me multiple hours to beat, I never really got frustrated at it. Every loss I understood where I messed up and was ready to jump back in for another attempt. I also don't know if I have ever felt tension like the last few moments of this fifth night. The drowned out noise and loud fire made me think that the endo was going to run through my doorway at any moment. This last section had my heart absolutely pounding, and this is what I was talking about earlier when I said I found out the reason that commenter's hand was shaking. I am not joking when I say that this night is a 10 out of 10 in my opinion, and also the night that solidified this as my new favorite FNAF fan game. So yes, first it was Fred Baron Friends, then the glitched attraction, and now the joy of creation has taken the spot for my favorite FNAF fan game. Now the actual story aspect of the Joy of Creation story mode is where the game lost me. This game's story is very meta, taking place in our world where FNAF is just a game series made by Scott Cawthon. Over the span of the game's five levels, we see Scott Cawthon and his family being tormented by the animatronics Scott created, along with Michael Afton, who even thanks Scott for bringing him into this world towards the end of the game. Each level has you playing as a member of Scott's family, with the story eventually concluding with, I'm pretty sure Michael Afton taking over Scott's body. Now, I'm pretty sure that this story isn't meant to be taken too seriously and is just a fun thing to connect the levels together. However, I didn't really find it that interesting if I'm being completely honest and kind of just saw it as filler between the expertly crafted gameplay sections. Now that is not to say that it is not presented in an amazing fashion. There are beautifully animated cutscenes along with voice acting for every single character which makes this game's story much easier to follow than other FNAF fan games. 
In my opinion, you will most likely be going into the Joy of Creation story mode, funnily enough not for the story, but for the actual gameplay and visuals. So if I'm judging it based on that, then I would say that the story did a decent job of keeping me curious on what would happen next, but I still think that it could have been done a little bit better. Everything just seemed to be happening randomly, and at no point was I ever able to predict what would happen next. I would say that this story is passable, but just not anything too interesting. As for the graphics and presentation of the game, I think that is where it really shines. Now obviously the graphics and models for this game are absolutely amazing. The fidelity of this game, as well as just how good it looks thanks to the Unreal Engine, takes this game to a level I have never seen another fan game top. The use of Unreal Engine also allows this game to set up horrifying scares that wouldn't be possible in other fan games. For example, when Freddy gets through your window in night 1, you will have to physically turn around to see him standing behind you before he kills you. This adds a whole other layer to the idea of a jump scare and honestly makes it way scarier than if Freddy just popped up after getting through the window. Another great example of this is the red endos you need to stay away from. The speed in which these guys turn around and run towards you if you get too close is honestly one of the scariest things in the game in my opinion. I jumped several times when I was not expecting one of them to just spring towards me so fast. I know that this is very cliche, but it's really the truth. This is not only the best looking FNAF fan game in my opinion, but the best looking FNAF game in general. The visual effects and dark atmosphere of everything makes this game feel a lot more immersive than Security Breach, which a lot of the time felt bland and soulless in my opinion. The first person camera angles were also done perfectly. I love how on the nights that use cameras, you have to press space to lock yourself in a position where you can watch these cameras, because this separates the seated and free roaming sections perfectly and prevents either one of them from feeling janky because they need to compensate for the other's mechanics. Everything about this game's visuals, presentation, and controls were done flawlessly in my opinion, and I seriously wouldn't change anything about them. So yeah, that concludes my look into the Joy of Creation story mode. It all makes sense to me now why everyone on my Glitch Attraction video was claiming that this is the best FNAF fan game. For some reason, I always thought that it was just the most generic pick and that it couldn't actually be that good. I assumed that everyone was just saying that because of the game's amazing visuals and nothing more. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Nights like the first one, and especially the final one, proved to me that the Joy of Creation story mode boasts some of the most engaging, tension-filled gameplay you can find in the genre. And I think that this game is a must-play for anyone who hasn't checked it out yet. It does take some time to get adjusted to the mechanics and the difficulty, but just trust me, the feeling of completing some of these nights is the best I've felt playing a horror game in a long time. Let me know down below what your favorite aspect of the game was. Anyways, that is it from me. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. I believe that I have found one of the most underrated and disturbing FNAF fan games I have ever played. A few days ago, I was looking through some people's picks for their favorite FNAF fan games, and while searching, I heard of a game titled Eddie and the Misfits. After searching for it on GameJoel, all I could find was this archive page. Turns out this game was created by Ramanov along with another developer that goes by the name Tupperman. And as many people know, Ramanov's account was deleted from Game Jolt recently, which is the reason Eddie and the Misfits original page is nowhere to be found. Luckily, this archive page does exist though because I was able to still download the game and play it for myself. Judging by the screenshots on the Game Jolt page alone, I knew that I was in for at least a decent FNAF fan game experience. But now coming off beating the game, I can say that this game came very close to being one of my favorite FNAF fan games of all time. It was a ton of fun to play through, the visuals were insanely scary, and the story had me pretty intrigued at least during the start of the game. 
That's not to say this game is perfect though, as there was a lot left to be desired in a few different areas of the game. This is why today I will be going through Eddie and the Misfits, explaining everything I liked, everything I didn't like, and everything in between. Right away when starting the game, we are shown our very first pre-rendered cutscene. This one is very vague, showing a mysterious person walking around with an animal mascot costume before the cutscene fades to black. This cutscene is extremely well animated and shows that despite this game being made back in 2019, the game still had a lot of production and effort put into it. After the first cutscene ends, we then load into this really cool main menu where we can see one of the main animatronics of the game, who goes by the name Mousetrap. After pressing play, we load into our very first minigame section, which is a trend you will see throughout the game. In this first one, all we need to do is pick this lock and make our way into the building. A phone guy explains to us that this place is old and that the lock needs to be picked on a two key basis, basically meaning we must guess which two notches to lift up in order to get in. After a little bit of trial and error, we eventually open the lock and make our way into the building, which is where the first night of the game really begins. I really like the idea of showing our character entering the building. I've seen this idea done in a few different fan games before, such as Jolly Bees and Fred Bear and Friends, and I think it just adds a lot to the overall game. Seeing our character actually make our way into the building helps the place feel more real than if we just loaded straight into the office like we do in the real FNAF games. Anyways, for night one, nothing really happens at all. And and kind of just serves as a way for us to get familiar with the office. In front of us is a camera which has two floors of the building. Also right in front of us is a vent which Mousetrap will occasionally stick his head through. You will know he's sticking his head through thanks to this really cool animation that plays every time he does it. We also have an arrow at the bottom of our screen which allows us to hide under the desk from Mousetrap. To the left of us is a door and a button which will shock any animatronic standing in the window. Also off screen is another vent which the top right camera on floor 2 leads to. There is no way to see it though, so if you see Mousetrap in the camera, that means he will soon be coming from the vent above you and you must hide under your desk. Like I said, night one, nothing really happens. I think it's possible for Mousetrap to attack you like once or twice, but for me that never happened. This makes night one a good section for me to discuss this game's visuals. One of my absolute favorite things about this game is its inspiration it takes from the Rock of Fire explosion, which if you guys don't know was an animatronic band that was around during the 80s. This was actually brought to my attention from a video made by The L7 Animatronic, which showcases multiple ways this fan game was inspired by the real pizzeria. I love this so much because I find the old animatronic designs from the 80s truly horrifying, even scarier than the designs in real FNAF. So to see those style designs make it into a fan game is just really cool to see. This game also makes sure each of its animatronic designs are extremely disturbing and is not shy at all to make the game very dark and gritty whenever it gets the chance. I especially find Eddie's design horrifying. Something about this style of animatronic is just so uncanny to me and freaks me out every time I see it. The poses on the renders also don't help in making them any less scary. Each camera is designed to make these guys look as scary as possible and I think they definitely succeeded on that. The jump scares are also very well done. They are animated very fast but also look super smooth and not unnatural at all. The sound is also out of nowhere and perfect at catching you off guard when you are not expecting it, which leads to them just being absolutely terrifying every time you get jump scared. Okay, so enough about the visuals. After completing night one, we get this right here. The absolute saddest 6am screen I have ever seen. Like, at least be a little bit more excited that I survived the night. I'm not joking, when I say the first time I beat Night 1, I thought this was like a game over screen or something at first, because the way it fades in so quietly and out of nowhere, I actually thought I died or something. Anyways, once that's out of the way, before moving on to Night 2, we get our first post-night task. This one has us entering the rewiring station, where we are tasked with rewiring one of the circuit boards. This is done through this pretty cool hacking minigame, where we need to 
control this snake through a maze while also using our cursor as a kind of flashlight to reveal the path. This is such a cool concept, but I don't think it was executed the best. It's really slow, and the whole time they're playing this epic music that just doesn't fit at all with how boring the section actually is. Now there is a more intense hacking section later in the game that actually does fit the music, but for this one at least, I think it could have done with a different track, because it just doesn't fit at all. After doing this three times, yes, three painfully long times, we can finally move on to night two. This night introduces us to Eddie, the animatronic with by far the scariest design in the game. We are also given a shock button, which is explained to us on the phone call as a way to send Eddie back whenever he is approaching. This however is kind of misleading or maybe I just misheard it because I was very confused the first time I played. Basically this is how it works. Eddie makes his way closer and closer to your office through a set path. He always goes through the same cameras before eventually reaching your door, where you will need to shock him before he jump scares you. This entire night I was sitting there trying to shock him but he just would not go back no matter what. That is because night 4, Eddie actually begins to do something else and that is when the shock button is needed. Now the phone guy might have explained this but I'm not really sure as for some reason they made the phone guy so quiet and they also made every other sound effect way louder so you literally can't move at all or else you won't be able to hear him and even then he is still so quiet I just want to say nice job on the night you did admirable work on the night too hopefully mousetrap wasn't too much of a pain last night because Eddie's up next for night 2 though, we just need to continue monitoring Mousetrap on the cameras, hiding under the desk every time he peeks his head through the vent or makes it to the top right cam, while also making sure we shock Eddie every time he is at our door. After this pretty simple yet stressful night, we move on to night 2's post night task and this one takes place in the breaker room. We first have to remove some trash from this breaker box before turning on the lights. We are then placed in front of Mousetrap and told that we need to repair his breaker box. We first need to click on him to remove his mask, which reveals one of the scariest visuals in the entire game. We can then press a red button on Mousetrap's face to begin his voice command repair. This is a really unique and stressful section where we need to listen to Mousetrap's voice lines and mark where his voice glitches. This is done by playing the audio and pressing space every time the audio glitches. This sounds easy at first, but getting the timing perfectly is actually extremely hard. This section actually took me like 10 tries and had me raging after a while because I had to clean the breaker box out after every single attempt. This is still my favorite post night task in the game though. I love how unique the gameplay idea is and I have never really seen anything else like it in another fan game. And I also just love the visuals of Mousetrap's taken apart face. Something about it is just so creepy to me. After marking the glitches and Mousetrap's lines three times, this post night task is complete and we can move on to the third night of the game. Night 3 was very easy for me. This night introduces one more animatronic who goes by the name of Topsy the Clown. Topsy the Clown will roam around the pizzeria and it is our goal to stop him from reaching this camera and making his way into our office. To stop Topsy we need to find him on the cameras and use this newly introduced button to increase the temperature of the room he is standing in. If you were wondering why these fan icons are always on the map, well this is why. We can hold down this button to increase the temperature and then use the button next to it to lower the temperature back down as soon as Topsy leaves. He doesn't come very often, only appearing like one or two times during the night, so he doesn't serve much of a threat to the player at all. By now, I also felt like I had a very good understanding of both Mousetrap and Eddie's mechanics, so this night was an absolute breeze for me. For Night 3's post-night task, we are taken to the underground circus. This puts us in a really cool open environment where we are able to look around at several different areas of the attraction. During this, our phone guy tells us to get in a car and take the ride when we are ready. This area is so cool to explore and the visual style of everything makes it feel so eerie. I loved getting up close with this really cool ticket booth and actually looking at the tunnel we get to go down. My only problem with this section is really that it's just so quiet. During this part of the game, I feel like it could have really used some creepy ambient noises to make the player feel unsafe and uneasy when exploring. Hearing random 
random banging and other sound effects from time to time would have kept me on my toes while exploring, always looking out for looming threats. But instead what we got is almost complete silence. After following the phone guy's orders and getting in the cart, we go down this very creepy tunnel which takes us to Topsy's turvy ride repair. Here is what kicks off this game's second hacking stage which is way more difficult than the first one. And not only is it much harder, but my game literally glitched for some reason and the circuit board was more zoomed in than it was supposed to be. This is what the section is apparently supposed to look like and here's what it looked like in my game. This section was absolutely brutal, especially during the end. The thing that sets this hacking stage apart from the other one is that not only are there much tighter spaces to maneuver through, but now we must also deal with the clown adding these visual effects to our screen. These effects can really mess up your understanding of where you're at on the screen and almost killed me multiple times. We also have to do this again three different times before finishing the task, so believe me when I say I was absolutely sweating on this part to get it done. For night 4, sadly no new animatronics are added and once again we are just surviving against Eddie, Mousetrap, and Topsy. Only this time they appear much more frequently. One new addition to night 4 though is now the shock button for Eddie actually has a use. See from night 4 and on every once in a while Eddie will move to this camera instead of the camera he normally moves to. This is indicated to the player through a sound cue and once heard you must react fast. When Eddie makes his way to this camera you will have a short amount of time to shock him and send him back before he briefly disables your camera. The game is pretty generous giving you the sound cue whenever he moves though, so this mechanic never really gave me any issues during my nights. Night 4's post night task did give me issues though. In Night 4's post night task, we make our way into the restoration room. In this room we have a camera in front of us and a hall with a light behind us. We must pull up this camera and guide Mousetrap around in order to make him avoid running into any fans. While doing this we must also frequently turn around and shine our light on Eddie to make sure he doesn't make his way down the hallway and kill us. While this mechanic does sound simple on paper, it is actually pretty difficult. You will need to time when you will allow Mousetrap to crawl on his own and when you're gonna shine your light on Eddie to avoid making any mistakes. This also goes on forever, forcing you to survive through this for 5 whole minutes, which is longer than any of the other post night tasks. This minigame's controls are also just so disorienting. For some reason you use S to turn back and forth which just feels very strange at first and the whole minigame just has this very stiff and awkward feeling to it but luckily I was able to get past it in like 4 attempts or something like that. Now I do see what they were going for with this minigame and I actually think the concept of keeping Mousetrap away from the fans is really cool. I just think it could have been executed a little better and feels rushed compared to the other post night tasks. For the 5th and final night of the game, Sadly, once again, no new animatronics were added. I would have really liked to see this bird guy have his own mechanic in the later nights, because having just three animatronics was a little bit too easy to manage in my opinion, and his design is just way too cool to go to waste. I actually did end up dying once in this night to Topsy the Clown, but other than that, this night gave me no real issues at all. After beating night 5, instead of another post night task, we load back into the office and make our way through the back door. From here we can follow this cool cutout sign which leads us to yet another cutscene, very similar to the start of the game. This cutscene depicts our player grabbing his paycheck before encountering the mascot scene earlier in the game. He then chases us to a dead end before grabbing us and placing us in what I assume is an animatronic suit. Welcome to the Misfits. Overall, I think that this game had so much potential to be one of the best FNAF fan games. This game really hits the nail on the head when it comes to its visuals, having its own identity, having a lot of content, having unique areas and gameplay situations, but it really misses the mark when it comes to things like the story, which while cool to see during the cutscenes felt rather unimportant during the actual gameplay. I feel like more lore should have been revealed throughout each night opposed to just having a beginning cutscene 
cutscene and an ending one. The game also needed to add a new animatronic every single night to keep the gameplay fresh in my opinion. After night 3 when I realized I would only be facing off against Eddie, Mousetrap, and Topsy, I was really disappointed as I was excited to see how the other members of the Misfits behave. For what it is though, this is still an amazing FNAF fan game with a lot of content to check out. The game also does offer some content to hunt for after finishing the game in the form of these photo descriptions you could unlock in various ways, as well as a custom night which from what I've heard is actually pretty difficult. I'm curious to hear what you guys thought of this game though. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Let me know in the comments down below. With that being said though, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. SCP The Endurance is a FNAF fan game that has been in the works since 2015. The developer started this project to try and combine their two favorite games, SCP and Five Nights at Freddy's, and use this project to learn more about game development. In 2018, the game was actually revived after it had been put on hold, and now here we are in 2022 with the game being fully released. Just from what is shown on the Game Joel page, the game looks really cool, mixing that classic office style FNAF gameplay with the disturbing facilities and entities seen in the SCP universe. The game feature is very unique gameplay that is unlike any other fan game I have played before. Like what other fan game is gonna have you playing tic-tac-toe to keep yourself alive? The game also has some really surreal unexpected sequences that will really catch you off guard, as well as a very unique and visually appealing style, and some really cool pre-rendered cutscenes which tie the game's narrative together perfectly. Oh yeah, and it also features one of the most rage inducing nights I have played in a FNAF fan game, where they straight up had me trying to code while also trying to not die from like 7 different enemies, but you'll have to wait towards the end of the video to hear me talk about that. Anyways, without further ado, let's jump into SCP The Endurance to see if the 7 years of development was really worth the wait. When starting our new game, we immediately get hit with one of the coolest intro cutscenes I have seen in a fan game. This cutscene depicts a commercial for something run by the SCP Foundation titled The Endurance. The Endurance is a brand new program which allows Class D personnel to work on a few faulty areas in the facility in exchange for a chance to gather additional food and possibly even make it out of solitary confinement. This whole cutscene is done in a really cool corporate style animation which which is accompanied by a narrator and some very fitting music. The whole thing just has a cool tone to it and is executed perfectly. It's not boring at all and doesn't waste any time getting you hooked straight away, which I really appreciated. Right after the cutscene ends, we load into our very first night of the game, and this one serves as more of a tutorial than an actual night, featuring a phone guy who guides us around our office for the very first time. He teaches us how to turn our power on and off, how to turn our computer on, on and put in the password, and also teaches us about the cameras. In this game, there are three floors to the facility. Yes, three floors. We learned that on cam 2D, when clicking on this generator, we are able to turn off our ventilation. This will save us power, but we'll need to be rebooted every once in a while to help us maintain oxygen. We also learned that there are two doors on floor E in the cameras. You can only close one of the doors at a time, and this will become important later. We are also introduced to the mask of SCP-035, which allows us to fool one of the enemies in a later night. One other thing to note which our phone guide doesn't mention as it's pretty obvious is that we have a singular door to our right with a button to close it as well as an open vent to our left and a hallway right in front of us. After this brief introduction to the game's mechanics, the night soon ends and we move on to night 2 where the real game actually begins. And during night 2 we actually get introduced to a lot of different SCPs. The first SCP we are introduced to is this teddy bear right here, who goes by the name of SCP-1048. We can actually see a description of these SCPs on our computer screen by entering the entity library or visiting the extras menu. SCP-1048 is described in the entity library to be a small teddy bear who is capable of moving on its own. 
and is able to communicate through a small range of gestures. The subject often shows affection to individuals, which is given by a hug to their leg, but this SCP is also seen sometimes dancing or jumping in place. And while this SCP seems rather harmless at first, in-game it can actually seriously screw over your run. So the way SCP-1048 works is to save power in the game, you are able to actually turn off your computer, similar to how you would turn off the ventilation. 1048 will appear in the hallway similar to how Foxy does in FNAF 2, and will slowly get closer and closer to the office. You will need to spam your flashlight on them to move them back to their original location, as failing to do so will result in the bear appearing in your office and sitting on your computer. If this happens and your computer is already shut off, you will no longer be able to turn it back on, which basically screws over your whole run. If the PC is on, however, you can refrain from turning it off for the rest of the night and still have a chance at survival. This is probably the easiest enemy to deal with, but can still screw you over in some certain scenarios. Other than this though, there are four more SCPs introduced in this night. SCP-173 begins on this camera right here and needs to be monitored similar to Foxy in FNAF 1. SCP-173 can only move when it is not being looked at, so you must make sure you check the cameras from time to time. Failing to do this will result in 173 moving up a singular camera, and if you allow 173 to make it far enough in the building, it will eventually make it down to the second floor and crawl through your vent, appearing on the left side of your office. If this occurs, you're basically dead. You have to keep eye contact with 173 the entire time to make sure you don't get jump scared. But when also trying to juggle your other tasks, this is practically impossible. This is a really cool mechanic though in my opinion, as say it's like 5am and you are very close to beating the night, you can still watch over 173 in hopes to stop them for long enough in order to reach 6am. Which adds a really cool aspect to the character, kind of like a final chance of survival, even though you already messed up. 173's origin is unknown. It was found in 1993 and is constructed from concrete and rebar. It is an extremely hostile object and is said to attack you by snapping your neck or strangling you, which is exactly what it does in its jump scare. The third SCP introduced to us is SCP-106. Instead of appearing like the other SCPs, when 106 appears you will hear a sound cue accompanied by a black orb floating in one of the corners of your office. Office. This means that you need to put on your mask and wait a few seconds for it to go away. Failing to do this however will result in one of the most surreal things to ever happen in a FNAF fan game to occur. Here, I'll just let it play out right now. Yeah, so after getting jump scared, instead of actually dying, we are brought to a first person parkour section. And the reason I say this is so surreal is something about the transition from 2D classic FNAF style gameplay to 3D parkour is just so jarring, but not in a bad way. This just had me so caught off guard the first time it happened, but had me really curious to see what there was to explore in this area. Thanks to the game being made in Unity, it is able to have a fully explorable first person area which gives this game a really cool layer of variety. In this parkour section we are able to find a few different skeletons laying around along with three different parts of a ripped up paper which have a code on them. This will come in handy during the final night of the game though and help us unlock the true ending. Also in this alternate dimension we are actually given a chance of redemption. Instead of immediately failing the night we actually come back to life if we are able to parkour without falling and find this portal. This brings us back to our office where we can pick up exactly where we left off. If we fail the parkour however, we fall to our death and the night is over. Such an interesting and unexpected mechanic for a character. This definitely was one of the most standout moments in the game in my opinion. SCP-106 is described in the entity library to be an elderly humanoid who is not agile and will stay motionless days at a time, waiting for somebody to prey on. When attacking, SCP-106 attempts to incapacitate its victim by damaging their major organs, muscle groups, or tendons, where they will then drag them into its pocket dimension. SCP-066 tests our reflexes by making us react quickly whenever they try to get into our office. 
Every once in a while during the night, you will hear banging in the vents, meaning that 066 is getting closer to the office. After this, at any moment, a vent towards the top of the screen can come undone. We must flick our mouse as fast as we can and close this vent before 066 plops down onto our desk. This game does not give us a lot of time at all to react, so whenever you hear this SCP entering the vents, you will be on edge the entire time, just waiting for that vent to come open. Which can severely impact your run if you let the stress get to you and focus only on the vent when you should be doing your other tasks. Similar to 17. 066 won't kill you immediately and will actually just sit on your desk for quite a bit of time before eventually triggering a very loud noise. This loud noise increases the AI of all the other SCPs. For night 2 and 3 we don't really have to worry too much about this one but it is still good practice to be closing those vents every time they open. I'll tell you right now nothing is worse than losing a run to whatever this thing is right here. The description for SCP-066 describes it as a massive braids, yards, and ribbon. Strands of SCP-066 may be taken individually and manipulated. When this is done, a note on the diatonic scale C D E F G A B is produced by this object. Yeah, I'm not even gonna pretend like I know what that means. For the final SCP introduced in Night 2, we have SCP-860, who will be seen staring at us in the cold forest through our right doorway. Every once in a while, we will hear a breathing noise, indicating to us that they are about to strike. From here, we must close our door quickly, as failing to do so will result in us getting jump scared. This one is not too hard to deal with on its own, but does cause problems involving power management in the later nights, as having the door closed for too long eats a lot of power. This SCP's description is actually very interesting as it's actually just a blue key. When this key is used to unlock a door, the door leads to a small forest clearing instead of the door's usual destination. This explains why there is a snowy forest in the middle of an underground facility. The description also states that the trail inside of SCP-8601 will lead you to another door attached to an infinite concrete wall, and this door will actually lead you to your normal destination. This is just such an interesting idea for an SCP. And just a quick disclaimer guys, this is one of my first exposures to the SCP universe, so learning about these characters for the very first time is just really fascinating to me. So I hope you guys don't mind hearing these descriptions, as I'm not sure how many people have already heard of these characters. Anyways, that is all of the enemies that are attacking us during night 2, and despite pushing 4 different SCPs on us during technically our first night, this one isn't too hard at all. They are pretty lenient on the amount of power you can use during this night and the SCPs aren't very active. 173 moves very slowly and doesn't need to be checked on too often. 066 is pretty easy to get rid of for now and most likely won't kill us even if they do appear in our office. And the other SCPs like 106 and 860 only attack like once or twice during the night. So giving us this night to get settled with all of the mechanics was a perfect decision on the developer's part in my opinion. Hey, by the way, if you're enjoying the video so far, please consider subscribing. It means the world to me. Night 3 is where the game really starts picking up speed. Starting from now on, we need to make sure we are conserving power as much as possible. This often involves turning off the ventilation and only turning it on temporarily to regain oxygen before once again turning it off. We can also save power by doing stuff like turning off our PC every time 106 comes in the room, as that time we spend in the mask we won't be able to be on the computer anyways. We also need to be checking in on 173 more frequently as it is actually able to reach our office pretty fast in this night. On top of all of this, we are introduced to yet another SCP who adds another thing to worry about. This is SCP-079, who appears in the form of this screen that we can look at on the far left of the room. SCP-079 asks us to play a game of tic-tac-toe with him. So now, throughout the night, we must also try to win or draw games of tic-tac-toe in order to prevent them from killing us. 
Ignoring the game completely or not making a move quick enough will result in 079 shutting off all of our systems, which when unexpected can completely screw you over. But having a task that requires you to actually sit there for a few seconds, planning out your turn, can be a huge distraction when you are worried about other things like the ventilation and also checking in on 173. This night requires you to be on your toes the entire time and really test your ability to remember all of the mechanics needed to survive. The difficulty ramp up is perfect in my opinion though, as it wasn't too hard but did take me a few tries to get through. This night is perfectly challenging while also not being too punishing. 079 is described in the entity library as an Exidy Sorcerer microcomputer that was built in 1978. In 1981, a now deceased college student attempted to code an AI that would continuously evolve and improve over time. The student then moved on after completing the project, leaving 079 in his cluttered garbage. You can also sometimes throughout the game randomly see 079's face glitch onto the cameras, kind of like the hallucinations in FNAF 2, which is just a really cool detail in my opinion. Seeing it try to interfere with your camera lines up perfectly with its description, so it's a very fitting scare to put in the game. Night 4 continues to ramp up in difficulty, this time forcing you to be even more conservative with your power, while also introducing the last two SCPs you will need to face off against. The first of these two SCPs is 049, or as most people know them, the Plague Doctor. 049 will appear in the bottom floor of the facility in the cameras and will roam around for a little bit before approaching one of the two doors. You will need to monitor 049 throughout the night and close the appropriate door to prevent them from reaching the second floor, as failing to do so will result in your death. Although his jump scare is pretty funny, he kind of just leans in and stares at you. Only one of these doors can be closed at a time, but luckily they don't use up any power. I never really had any trouble with this one, but it still does add a lot of stress to the night. Sometimes it feels like you don't even have enough time to be checking other cameras other than SCP-173 and the ventilation, which can add a lot of tension to those moments when you are checking in on them. 049 is described in the Entity Library as a humanoid who bears a medieval plague doctor mask. The robe 049 is wearing is also said to be actually grown out of its body over time, which makes it indistinguishable from whatever form is underneath it. 049 is capable of speaking in various languages, but tends to use either English or medieval French. For the final SCP introduced to us in Night 4, we have SCP-096. 096 will act a lot like Golden Freddy, randomly appearing in your office or in a camera. If you see 096 crouch down in a camera, you must immediately flick the camera down in order to prevent your death. This makes you have to be more aware of what you're looking at on the cameras in order to spot if this entity is hidden in the shadows. If you see this SCP hunched over in your office, however, you must flick the camera up to get rid of it, which isn't a problem on its own, but when paired with other entities like 106 and 066, it can feel like you have barely enough time to execute all the movements necessary in order to survive, which I find to be a perfect addition as these SCP mechanics don't overlap with any of the others, and add yet another layer to the already fast paced reflex based gameplay. This night was extremely sweaty and took me a long time to beat, but it is far from the hardest challenge this game has to offer. Night 5 introduces no new entities to the game, but serves as a final test before Night 6. Every AI is ramped up to almost the max, which makes this night a stress inducing chaotic experience, where you will be trying to balance so many different things. You need to focus on conserving your power, watching over the doors on the third floor, reacting to the vent, flashing your light on the hallway, closing the door when necessary, flicking the camera down when you see 106, and playing tic-tac-toe in a constantly difficult 6 minute night. This took me many, many attempts to beat, but after feeling it, it felt like I had truly mastered the game's mechanics. 
One thing I really like about SCP The Endurance is it does not rely on RNG mechanics at all during the game. Every single death felt like a lesson learned and now that I have completed the 5th and final night, I feel like I can do it again. It doesn't feel like a luck based game, but a game about precision, planning, and execution. Which definitely does take away from the horror aspect a little bit, but makes the gameplay overall an amazing and enjoyable experience. Now that is where the main game ends, however if we want the true ending we must do a few extra steps to get it. And this is by far the hardest part of the entire game, and even maybe the most challenging thing I've done in a fan game. So remember those papers we were able to collect in the pocket dimension? Well we are able to take those three papers on the wall and piece them together in order to form a code. With this code we can go in on night 6 and enter this into the computer which will begin the path to the true ending. After this, typing run power manager on the computer will unlock a whole new screen on our second monitor. Now to get the true ending, we must type various code prompts on this screen in order to activate the elevators needed to escape. And this is no easy task. This straight up had me bashing my desk from how difficult it was. Everything needs to be executed perfectly or else you will die. Not only do we need to defend ourselves against every single SCP we had to deal with during that Five, but we now must do that while also balancing all of these coding sections. Thankfully there was a guide on YouTube which helped me figure out this confusing mess of a true ending, but even then it was still so difficult. I'm not even sure how to fully explain this night, but I'm gonna do my best. So basically we need to first deactivate the elevators allowing SCP-173 and SCP-049 from being able to reach us, which will get rid of two threats we would have had to deal with. We then need to deactivate three cameras on this floor right here, and then activate three elevators before activating the two we shut off at first, which allows us to click on the hallway and leave. To turn an elevator on or off, we must use the information on the left side of the screen to type the proper code. These codes need to be entered perfectly and can be extremely hard to type while under the immense pressure the game puts you on. This section had me feeling like I deserved a computer science degree after completing it the way I was putting in these codes. After many painful attempts though, I eventually had the full strategy mastered and executed the true ending, which gives us our final cutscene of the game. I have stayed in this cursed place for far too long. I know how to deal with these creatures. But all it takes is one slip. One mistake. I'm gone. I've been risking my life for years. I'm not afraid to risk it. One last time. Overall, I would say that SCP The Endurance was absolutely worth the wait. You can truly feel the level of detail and passion that was put into this game. Things like the entity library, void sections, and the secret endings add so much character to the already great experience. The gameplay, while not very scary to be honest, felt absolutely flawless to play. This is a fan game based on strategy and execution more than it is based on being scary, but that is honestly fine by me. 
If you like mastering these types of games, you will absolutely love SCP The Endurance. The visual style of the game is also really charming to me. All the SCPs have very unique designs, and the facility location doesn't look like anything I've seen out of another fan game. The game also has extras and a custom night to perfectly wrap up the game into a nice content complete package. If I had to score this game out of 10, I would honestly give it a 9 out of 10, as I truly think the gameplay is perfectly balanced. Even the 6th night, I think it should stay how it is. Even though it is extremely difficult, you feel absolutely amazing after completing it. I recommend anyone who seeks out to play these fan games for themselves to definitely check this one out. It's definitely not one that should be looked over. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing, it means a lot to me, and I will see you all with the next video. Peace. The Tubbyland Archives Act 1 is the first part of a multiple part FNAF fan game series that released 8 months ago. The game was developed by Clicky Code and is a remake of the iconic fan game Five Nights at Tubbyland, which was released over 7 years ago. Just by comparing the two games Game Jolt pages, we can see how much the developer has improved over the 7 years since the release of the original title. Each render shared on the Game Jolt page showcases the insanely high detailed animatronics we will be facing. As well as well as the horrifying environments the game takes place in, and even some hints towards the game's lore. But is the game actually good? Well, that is what I'm here to find out today. So if you're just as curious as me, then join me as we do a deep dive into the Tubbyland Archives Act 1 to see if the remake is really all that good. As soon as we open up the game, we get one of the coolest menus I've ever seen in a FNAF fan game. We see a flashlight move around the room, giving us a short glimpse at the four Teletubbies we will be facing before the title screen appears. This is just such a cool way to give us a little tease of what's to come later in the game. After actually pressing new game, we are brought to an opening cinematic. The cinematic shows us multiple different shots of the establishment as the CEO talks to us on the phone. He informs us that we got the job for Nightwatch. He tells us that we can clock in on Monday where we will get our uniform and other needed supplies. And as he's explaining this to us, the visuals get increasingly more disturbing, showcasing to us the worn down withered versions of the Teletubby robots, ending with a shot of the green Teletubby staring directly at the camera. After this, we spawn into our office, and to make things easier to understand, I'll go ahead and explain everything we have at our disposal. So in our office, we have an open doorway to our left and in front of us, neither of which we can close. And on our right, we also have a curtain which we can hide in. This will come in handy later. Anyways, on our far left, we also have access to a camera. These cameras are extremely dark and need to be lit up by a flashlight in order to see the animatronics. We don't lose any power for having the camera open, but we do need to watch out on our flashlight battery. We also have a reboot button which will reboot any cameras that happen to randomly shut off during the night. And trust me, during the later nights, you will be using this a lot. Finally, we have a speaker system. Very very similar to FNAF 3, we can click this button to play a sound in one of the rooms. This will attract the Teletubbies into the room you play the sound in as long as they are in a room next to that one. You aren't able to spam this however as it needs to regenerate after every single use. During night 1, our phone guy, who is also an employee at Tubbyland, calls in to let us know that the previous employee left. He then tells us more generic phone guy things before letting us know that the red one has been reactivated recently. He also informs us that she has no eyes, so we can use our intercom system to keep her away from our office. So yeah, pretty straightforward. For night one, we just need to continue using our intercom system to make sure the red Teletubby stays away from our office. This is very easy to do, but trust me, this game gets hard fast. After night one concludes, we load into our very first post-night minigame. This one has us controlling the green Teletubby, also known as Dipsy. We are set free in the Tubbyland establishment and are told by a text prompt to find 
find a new new. New new for you guys who have never seen the show is the blue vacuum looking creature. Yeah, this thing always gave me weird vibes as a kid. It's honestly no surprise Teletubbies ended up as a FNAF fan game cause just look how creepy these characters are. Tangent aside though, after going from room to room in this very well put together and polished minigame section, we eventually stumble across new new. For night one, they are seen deactivated in a random corner of the building. After approaching new new, however, we actually wake them before the mini game concludes. After waking up new new, our second night begins, and this is where the game's difficulty really starts picking up. Right away, our phone guy calls us, informing us that two new animatronics have been activated. These being the one without the head and new new, the one we just awakened. The phone guy informs us that the one without the head is extremely hostile and will not be fooled by the intercom system. He then tells us that our best way of defending against this Teletubby is to simply stay out of view if she gets too close. This means that we need to monitor her on the cameras, however unlike the red Teletubby, we can actually see this one without the lights on. Very similar to Freddy in FNAF 1, this Teletubby's eyes glow, so there is no need to flash the light in order to find her. There are two different cameras that will lead into the two doors in our office. If we see the Teletubby at one of these cameras before disappearing, this means we have a short window to hide in our curtain before we are killed. When you hide, you also get these really sick and terrifying animations where the yellow Teletubby actually walks into the room, which is just such a neat addition. I always love when 2D FNAF fan games incorporate animation in this way. It helps sell the game as being more than just a sequence of PNGs and is also really terrifying the first couple times around. As for the second enemy we must face in night 2, the vacuum cleaner, the phone guy doesn't really tell us much about him. He claims the CEO himself worked on him and that his only piece of advice is to not stay in the room with him for too long. What this is actually referring to is if we stay behind the curtains too long during the night, the vacuum will actually kill us. So Nunu is not really a threat, but more of a way to prevent us from camping behind the curtain. Now on paper this night doesn't sound too bad at all, just monitor the red and yellow Teletubbies and don't stay in the curtain for too long. I mean, how hard could it possibly be? Well, in actual practice, this night was very hard to get a grasp of at first. The mechanic of knowing when the yellow Teletubby is going to come into your office is very confusing at first and will take a lot of trial and error before you get adjusted to it. Once you do have a full understanding of how each of these two animatronics function though, this night can be beaten pretty easily. After night 2 concludes, we load back into the minigame section and our once again tasked with finding Nunu. Only this time we are playing as the red Teletubby, also known as Poe. Just like last time we roam around the same building, searching through various different rooms before eventually finding Nunu, who this time is seen refilling the custard machine. Now these mini games may seem like they are going nowhere, but just stick with it, it gets more interesting later. For night 3 we once again are introduced to another enemy to go up against, and this time it's the purple Teletubby. The phone guy informs us that the purple one will begin moving and also tells us that it has no legs, meaning this one will be crawling towards us, which is absolutely terrifying. It really reminds me of Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese Remastered and how the animatronics in that game also crawl towards you. The phone guy then tells us that this purple Teletubby does not like high-pitched sounds, so flashing our light on them in the cameras will scare them away. After this, the phone guy lets us know that he is getting a really weird vibe from the place. Hmm, I wonder why. And then he tells us that he's going to have a look around the files before ending the call. Night 3's difficulty compared to the first two is quite the leap. This night took me a long time to beat. In nights 1 and 2, it was quite easy to stay on top of managing everything because there was no need to search the cameras where we knew the yellow and red Teletubbies wouldn't go. But now, thanks to the newly introduced purple one, we must frequently scan the other cameras to make sure they aren't approaching our office. This also means we will be rebooting the cameras a lot more which can cost us precious seconds in our run. Sometimes it can even cost you enough time to get you killed if you haven't checked on Poe or Lala in a while. By the way, Lala is the yellow one. I don't know if I stated that earlier. I'm not really sure how to explain it properly. It's just one of those things you need to play for yourself, but the whole night has this sort of balance to it where your time is constantly occupied by fending off one animatronic at a time. And it becomes kind of this juggling act of making sure everyone is where they need to be. Because of this, it is very easy to slip up and actually forget 
forget which animatronic you are meant to check on as your order of checking on them can be interrupted by so many random things happening. Even though this one did take me a little while, this is far from the hardest night in the game. After night 3, this time we take control of Lala, the headless Teletubby, and once again have to find the vacuum. We do our usual search around the building and this time see Nunu taking out the trash. Nothing too out of the ordinary. For night 4, right away our phone guy wastes no time informing us what's going on with the robots. He tells us that after looking at the files, he discovered some crazy things, and tells us that his suspicions were true, but doesn't elaborate further as he's scared the CEO could be listening in on the phone calls. After telling us that, he remembers to inform us about the final robot introduced to this game, this being the green Teletubby aka Dipsy. The only recommendation our phone guy has for us to deal with Dipsy is to stay out of view. We also learn that one of Dipsy's eyes is screwed up, but other than that we are once again left to figure out how to deal with this animatronic. Before finishing the call however, the phone guy is interrupted by the CEO, who seems to be suspicious of the phone guy after discovering some of the files were misplaced. The phone guy tells the CEO that it wasn't him, but it seems like he doesn't trust him. He then out of nowhere asks him to come in tomorrow night, as he needs him to check on something. Hmm, sounds pretty suspicious to me. Soon after that, Night Force phone call concludes and we are left on our own to now face off against all four Teletubbies. This night is once again very hard and now not only do we need to juggle the three previous robots but now we also need to worry about Dipsy. You will be alerted that Dipsy has appeared by a sound cue that will play of somebody laughing. After this occurs you will be able to see Dipsy's one eye peeking through the darkness of the hall in front of you. If this happens that means that Dipsy is in their first stage. From here they are able to move closer step by step step. You must listen for every time there is a sound cue and once you see Dipsy almost fully entered into your room, that is when you need to hide. There is no animation like there was for Lala though, so once you're behind the curtain, you will need to listen out for a laugh which indicates Dipsy has left. Night 4 took me over an hour to beat. Not only does everything need to be executed perfectly, but RNG also needs to be on your side in many situations. I think that this is actually a good spot for me to talk about the game's difficulty because in my opinion, this game is way too hard. One issue I think a lot of fan games fall under is balancing the gameplay perfectly. The game is meant to scare us, however when it's so difficult that you'll be playing over and over and over, it really quickly stops being scary and instead just turns into pure rage every single time you die. Which is what was happening to me during this stage of the game. I think this game has so many cool aspects about it and it really could have been a horrifying experience, but the number one thing holding it back is just how hard it is. Is. I don't think many players will stick around to complete the entire game, as even me, who went into the game planning on making a video about it, almost quit multiple times. That's how hard it really is. I'll go as far as to say that this game is harder than Endless Inside and Night 6 of SCP The Endurance. Anyways, after finally beating Night 4, we load back into our mini game section, this time taking control of Tinky Winky. This one is actually really funny because we get to see Tinky Winky crawl around as we search for Nunu. What's not What's also funny though is when we actually find him and see this. Nunu cleaning up a spill. I wonder whose blood that could be. Okay, so for night 5, as soon as the night starts, we get a call from our phone guy once again, who this time can be heard listening. He tells us he is currently hiding and says that the CEO telling him to come was a death trap. He tells us he found a box in the party hall that smells pretty awful and says the robots were in there with it. Then before the phone guy can get anything else out, this happens. Rest in peace to the phone guy, he was a real one. As for the actual gameplay during night 5, it is the exact same as night 4, only with more difficult AI. During this night, it was unbelievably hard to balance all of the animatronics. It was a constant battle with RNG and my reaction time, and it took me over an hour to beat, but eventually I did it. However, there was just one small problem. So after beating night 5, we once again load into the minigame section and are told to find Nunu. 
We roam around for a little bit before stumbling across what appears to be our phone guy trying to make his last escape from the vacuum before it slowly moves closer and closer and presumably kills him. After this, we get our paycheck for $248. But after this, this is where the issue arises. No, I can't leave now. I can't. I just listened to someone getting murdered. They're responsible. I can't let them get away with this. I have to go back. I have to. Maybe he's still alive. But if not, I can't let his death be in vain. Maybe those documents he mentioned are still there. I might be able to use those. It's worth a shot. What's one more night gonna hurt? Yeah. So if night 5 wasn't hard enough, there is a sixth night to this game. And I'm just gonna keep it completely real with you guys, I cannot beat it. I spent countless hours attempting it on my own, even asked a fellow YouTuber who beat the game for any tips, watched other people's playthroughs, and I truly just can't get through it. Now, if this was just an extra night, this wouldn't be too much of a problem for me, but unlike other FNAF fan games, Night 6 actually unlocks extra story details. So I'm gonna have to use another creator's footage so that way we can still see the ending. If you guys are the type to take on these insane FNAF challenges, please let me know if you're able to beat this night, because in my opinion, it's bordering on impossible. I seriously have no idea how anyone was able to get through this. Anyways, after completing Night 6 by some absolute miracle, we load into the minigame as our actual protagonist. This time the building is dark and our surroundings are only illuminated by a small light. We need to roam around the building collecting 10 files, all while being hunted by the 4 Teletubbies. From what I've seen in the gameplay, it appears this minigame you can actually fail, so it will take you a couple of attempts to get through. Luckily, it doesn't set you back to the beginning of the night though, because that would just be pure evil. Anyways, after collecting the 10 files, the minigame concludes, and the game ends, granting us one pinwheel. Yeah, so turns out you actually don't even get that much extra lore, which is pretty insane considering how hard Night 6 really is. After this, we are able to view the extras menu, which actually has a lot of really cool things to see here, as well as play the custom night, which you will absolutely not catch me playing. This game is way too hard. Overall, I would say that the Tubbyland Archives Act 1 is a fantastic fan game that is only held back by the balancing. The graphics and atmosphere is definitely up there with the best FNAF fan games. Every character has a horrifying and unique design that separates them from each other, the building feels like a real place and is also very interesting to explore, and all of the jump scares and animation work tie the whole thing together perfectly to make it feel more real than if those elements weren't there. The story of the game also, while simple, was pretty engaging. I actually prefer when fan games follow a simple narrative that doesn't try to dump too much exposition on the player and instead just serves as context for each night of the game. The mini games and calls between each night were also an amazing addition as they actually give the player a reason to get through the entire game. All of the voice actors did an amazing job selling their roles, none of it felt forced and you could tell that they actually put real effort into it. So yeah, the only thing really holding this game back is the sheer difficulty of it. Unfortunately regardless of how amazing this game is, most casual players are not going to be able to experience it, which is just such a shame. I'm all for making fan games difficult, that way they can be rewarding to complete, but this game just takes it way too far in my opinion. Let me know what you guys thought of this game though. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Is it being so hard just a skill issue? Let me know down below in the comments. Also let me know if you guys want to see Act 2 get covered on the channel whenever that releases. Anyways with that being said, I hope you guys all enjoyed the video and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. The Return to Bloody Nights is a brand new FNAF fan game set in Fredbear's Family Diner. The game released a little under two weeks ago, and after seeing the praise it was receiving from other YouTubers, I just had to check it out for myself. The Game Jolt page states this game takes its own unique twist on the timeline and crucial events of the FNAF series. In that same description, the game is also said to combine the old atmosphere and gameplay of the previous FNAF titles with new mechanics, bringing out the best elements of the official games. Just from what we can 
see on the Game Jolt page, it looks like this fan game is going to be something truly special. So let's not waste any more time and jump straight into the Return to Bloody Nights to see if this brand new FNAF fan game is really as good as people say. As soon as we start the game, we get a short cutscene which puts us in the perspective of a performer at Fredbear's family diner. We can look around through Fredbear's mask as we see Spring Bonnie performing on stage, before the door shuts and our screen fades to black. This isn't the last interactable scene we'll see in the game though, which is really cool. I always love when fan games include small stuff like this. After that, we load into the main menu which is very unique for a fan game. It reminds me a lot of the Left 4 Dead menus if you guys have ever played those games. Anyways, after clicking new game, we begin our very first night. Before this though, we get a cutscene. This cutscene shows us a phone as we overhear a phone call between William and Henry. William tells Henry that his animatronics are doing well and that he's excited to open his new restaurant. He claims he's a little jealous and hopes his place is as successful as Freddy's. Henry then brings up concerns about safety as there has been a few incidents where animatronics malfunctioned and harmed visitors. William says he understands the concerns and is being very cautious with the production of the new animatronics. He promises to not rush the making of these animatronics and tells Henry to trust him. They then end off the phone call on good terms and our first day of the job begins. We will continue to hear this conversation between William and Henry as the game progresses which is a really great way to tell the story in my opinion. So stick to the end of the video to see where everything leads to. Before night one we get this really cool loading screen before the night which tells us that day of the week along with the animatronics we are facing. So, for Monday, we will only be facing against Spring Bonnie. As our shift begins, we immediately get a pre-recorded message from the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment. The CEO gives us the normal night one talk, telling us about contracts, pay, and also informs us how to stay safe from the animatronics. We are also informed that we have doors to our left and right. Next to these doors is a button which we will use to close them, and we also have a flashlight we can use to shine down the hallways. Behind us is a music box, which will come into play later, and on our desk is a camera system. With this camera, we can watch over the two main animatronics of the establishment, Spring Bonnie and Fredbear. The CEO CEO tells us to shut the door when one of the animatronics is near our office before sending us out on our own to survive the rest of the night. Now night one is not difficult in the slightest. We get a chance to get a hang of the controls as well as take in the environment that the game takes place in. And I just love the sheer amount of detail put into this game. Things like photos of Henry and William, certificates, and William's family photos. Being included really sparks life into the office and makes it feel more meaningful. Oh yeah, and they also have these things. One thing I need to give this game praise for that not a lot of other fan games do is this game has really great ambience. It really reminds me of the feeling I got while I played FNAF 1. There are so many red herring sound effects to throw you off and make you feel like you're in danger. This does a great job at making you always on edge, even if you do know where all of the animatronics are. Another terrifying detail this game has is its animations on the cameras. When watching over Fredbear and Spring Bonnie, they can be seen moving and twitching around, which helps sell the idea to the player that these animatronics are really malfunctioning. Once we reach 6am, our very first shift concludes, however there is still one thing we need to do before moving on to night 2. After the 6am screen, we are then placed in front of Fredbear with a device which I assume is for finding spirits. We use it to scan the animatronic. We can use our mouse to drag the machine all over the animatronic's body in hopes to see if the machine will go off. Eventually though, nothing happens and the screen fades to black as we move on to night two. During the night two phone call, Henry asks William for an update on the animatronic's progress. William tells Henry everything is going well and claims that he is very confident in meeting the deadline of the opening day. The animatronics are on track and I'm confident about meeting our opening date. Henry once again reminds William about safety and expresses his concerns that William may be rushing the development of the animatronics. Pressure to meet the deadline might cause you to rush things. I understand your concern, but rest assured that safety is always my top priority. I know what I'm doing, and I won't take any unnecessary risks. 
William seems to not be worried though and dismisses Henry's worries. Henry offers William help and advice, but William declines and the call concludes. After that, night two begins and from the loading screen, we can see one new animatronic has been introduced, that being Fredbear. We once again get a pre-recorded message from the CEO, and in this message, he tells us about the animatronic's second feature, this feature being that you can wear the animatronics like a costume. He then tells us about the potential danger of a springlock failure occurring and advises us to not wear the suits, as it may be too dangerous, although he doesn't really tell us that in the nicest way possible. We had an incident with one of our employees not too long ago. Poor guy ended up in a hospital bed with his legs crushed. It's tragic, but informative. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't try it out if you're feeling brave, but just know that if something goes wrong, it's on you. Actually, don't even touch them. We're not taking any responsibility here. After this, we are told that a new animatronic has been introduced and that this one is actually made by Henry Emily himself. This animatronic he is referring to is actually the puppet and not Fredbear, who can be found directly behind us. The phone guy doesn't tell us how to deal with it though, instead telling us he's gonna go get some sleep before ending the recording. Yeah, I'm gonna go get some shut eye. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Yeah, thanks a lot, dude. So just tell me he's in my office and don't tell me what to do about it. On a serious note though, one thing I actually like about this phone guy is he has a personality. Instead of just serving as exposition like most phone guys do, this one actually shows some character, which adds a lot to the game. Night 2 goes by very slowly. We must watch over both Spring Bonnie and Fredbear as they move around on the cameras, and both of them share the same gameplay, so just think of them as Bonnie and Chica from FNAF 1 with one coming from the left door and the other one coming from the right. These nights are 8 minutes long, which led to this being extremely boring for a night too. Luckily though, the renders used for the animatronics in this game are absolutely amazing. Much like FNAF 1, the game uses interesting angles and poses to make the animatronics appear as threatening as possible. Some of these poses are very creepy, which I appreciate as I feel like this is something that goes overlooked in a lot of fan games. Sure, it can be creepy to just have an animatronic standing in the room, but it's much scarier if you have them peeking around the corner or covering their face with their hands. This level of attention to detail really makes makes me think that the developers understood what made the original FNAF so scary in the first place. What's also really scary is how the animatronics appear when they are actually at your door. Instead of just standing there when you flash the light, in this game the animatronics now kind of spring forward into your line of sight which makes it a lot creepier when they appear and also sometimes actually made me jump. <laughs> Now, despite the phone guy mentioning the puppet being introduced, they are not actually active during this night. So we just need to survive against Fredbear and Spring Bonnie until 6am rolls around. After 6am, we once again do another investigation on the animatronics, this time scanning Spring Bonnie for any spirits. Just like night one, we get no definitive proof that these animatronics are haunted and end up leaving without seeing the machine go off. The night three phone call begins with Henry giving William a friendly greeting. Henry tells William that after the employees got to see the new animatronic prototypes, they claimed they were too scary and too robotic looking. I heard that some of the employees saw a preview of the new animatronics design and they were a bit concerned that they looked a little too scary and robotic. What were your thoughts on that? William reassures Henry that these are a work in progress and that they will be more child friendly when they are complete. William says he's been studying child psychology which will aid him in his goal of creating safe and positive animatronics. Henry tells William that he trusts him and then asks how he's holding up with his recent divorce. William claims he's been going through a rough time but is doing his best to just focus on his work and his children. It's been a difficult time Henry, I won't lie about that but I'm doing my best to keep my focus on my work and my children. They're the most important thing to me. Henry tells William that his daughter Charlotte is also very important to him, and tells William to take some time to himself if he really needs it. William says he will take care of himself and his work, and they once again end the call on a positive note. I'll try to take care of myself as well, and my work too. No problem, William. We'll talk again soon. Take care. You too, Henry. 
Night 3 then loads up and we can see the third animatronic has been introduced, that being Spring Bonnie 2.0, the one we just heard about on the phone. We then receive another pre-recorded message from the CEO. This time he thanks us for our dedication before asking us if we've seen anything weird going on in the pizzeria. The CEO then goes on about the ball pit being a time machine or something, which I think is a reference to one of the FNAF books. You guys will have to let me know down below though because I haven't got around to reading any of those yet. After that though, he asks us if we could be the voice of the instruction tapes for the spring lock technology, before telling us good luck with the night and ending the call. For Night 3's gameplay, during this night the puppet actually begins attacking. Every once in a while the puppet will begin climbing out of the box, which will be notified to you with a sound cue of a bell ringing. Every time they do this, you will need to turn around and shine your light on them in order to get them back in the box. Failing to do this, however, will result in us getting jump scared. However, this is not your typical jump scare. Instead, the puppet just appears in front of you and begins laughing, which is honestly a lot creepier than just screaming in your face. Whoever did the voice acting on this laugh, I mean, you gotta give it to them. They really went for it. <laughs> During this night, Golden Freddy also began appearing. Golden Freddy will every once in a while appear as a transparent figure at the end of the left hallway. He will slowly move closer to us before appearing right in front of the door, which is when we will need to close it. This adds a lot of stress to the night as while we're busy monitoring the puppet and watching the cameras, we now must also be checking on Golden Freddy from time to time. Golden Freddy also has this glitched out voice effect he will play when present in the hallway, which not only sounds very creepy, but also serves as a distraction to the player, making it harder to hear the other necessary sound cues. Night 3 is actually where I started taking my first couple of deaths, which really got me good. The jump scares in this game are really abrupt and well animated, which when paired with the loud noises leads to a very startling jump scare. <laughs> One thing really good about these jump scares is there is actually a different animation if you are staring at the door. So let's say I'm staring at the right doorway and I get jump scared, then I'm gonna see something like this. After reaching 6am, we do our routine animatronic check, this time on the brand new Spring Bonnie 2.0 that William recently built. We scan all around the animatronic, and surprisingly once again get no sign of anything out of the ordinary. The scene then once again fades to black, and we begin Night 4. During the Night 4 phone call, William tells Henry that they are on track for a successful opening tomorrow. Henry once again brings up the safety measures, and William responds reassuring Henry that he has taken safety safety into account. William seems very angry over the phone this time, commenting on the impact the divorce had on his family. Michael is too busy being a typical rebellious teenager. Devon is just a young child who doesn't understand the situation. Frankly, I'd rather keep my distance from them for the time being. They're at home at the moment. Henry expresses his worries for William, telling him he hopes he is okay. William thanks him for these concerns and tells him he will talk to him soon. This kicks off night 4. The pre-recorded message begins once again, and the CEO begins making more references to the FNAF books, I'm pretty sure. I slept like a rock last night, but I woke up feeling like I got hit by a truck. I had this weird dream where I was half robot, half human, and let me tell you, I wasn't pretty. My legs were replaced with rusty old scrap metal and I was clunking around like some kind of junkyard Frankenstein. <laughs> Can you imagine me like that? Talk about a nightmare. The CEO then tells us that the new prototypes are in the building and once again tells us to stay safe. He is then abruptly interrupted by another employee who informs him that all of the restaurants will be closed for an investigation after one of the founders had been convicted of a crime. The CEO then tells us that the closure of the restaurants won't interfere with our schedule and tells us to get back to work. Now despite no new animatronics being introduced during this night, it is extremely chaotic. 
the AI is very active during this night, which makes you have to be alert for the entire eight minutes. The more active AI also led to a very close call when I completed the night thanks to the generator heat mechanic. Basically, the generator heat will go up when you have a door closed and will go up even faster if both of them are closed. If the generator heat bar reaches its max, then the power will go out, resulting in your death. This makes you manage when you close your doors a lot more responsibly, which can be very difficult when animatronics like Fredbear like to stay at the door for a really long time. Thanks to that, I barely was able to pass night 4 with just a little bit of generator heat left to spare. This was a great night, the tension was very high and it was super chaotic, but it wasn't too hard to the point of being impossible. So good job to the developers for balancing this night. For the post night investigation, we scanned the Fredbear animatronic and surprisingly this time the machine actually begins to act up, shaking rapidly when we point it at Fredbear's head. Our character then suddenly turns to see that we are being monitored by another person in the building, presumably William, before the scene suddenly cuts to black. During the fifth and final call between Henry and William, Henry expresses his condolences to William. Henry tells William he is sorry and asks if there is anything he can do. William then has an outburst towards Henry, telling him that he has no idea what he is going through and cannot relate to the feeling of losing a child. You have no idea what it's like to lose a child. You have a perfect life, your happy family, you don't know anything. You don't know how I feel right now. I'm sorry, William, I, I just- Enough! Enough! You can tell during this phone call that the death of William's child has changed him forever. After that, we get another message from the CEO, who explains that six children have gone missing, which is the reason the establishments have been closing down. We are then left to survive the fifth and final night of the game. Once again, no new threats are added to the night, so we will be facing off against the same five, only with increased AI. Specifically, the puppet is now a lot more active and is moving very frequently, as well as Fredbear, who will be appearing at your left door a lot. One thing that started getting really annoying during this night was actually Fredbear's mechanic. Sometimes Fredbear will stay at your door for a very long time even after you close it on him. It is completely random how long he will stay at your door and sometimes if he decides to stay there long enough, you will run out of generator heat and lose. There is absolutely nothing you can do when this happens, so it really feels like your win is in the hands of the RNG gods. I could be doing something wrong here, but from every playthrough I've seen, this is how the game is. So let me know in the comments if you guys have any solutions to this. After just barely escaping Night 5 with our life, we get the first of three endings this game has to offer. It has been many years since the incident that changed everything. I have done unforgivable things since then. The missing children. It was all my doing. My animatronics were always meant to be more than mere entertainers. They were created to wield fear, to evoke terror, and bring forth the ultimate consequence. Death. And then there was Charlotte. Henry's daughter. I could not bear to see him bask in all his happiness, and receive all the credit for our work. My jealousy consumed me, and I had to take matters into my own hands. I meticulously crafted the evidence to make it appear as though Henry was the one responsible, for I had bigger plans in mind. Plans that require my full attention and dedication. I have built a new place for my new creations. A place that will instill wonder and fear into the heart of all who bear witness. And soon, I will reveal what is coming next.
So yeah, that is our very first ending of the game, which is just such a cool ending in my opinion. I love the fact that this game lets us see the events that led to William becoming the villain he is later in the series, and the tie back to sister location was absolutely perfect in my opinion. This game really just helps tie all of the other FNAF game stories together in a way that's easier to understand. This isn't the only ending though, as the game actually features an extremely hard and RNG based Night 6, which if completed earns you yet another cutscene. In this cutscene we are shown one of the missing children with text that reads, there was someone that night. I called for help but no one came for me. Now I feel different. I can't disappear, not now. I found others who are just like me. They need my help. I must guide them. I will give them their happiest day. This ending, while not adding much more detail, gives us a peek at the events that happened after the missing children's incident, showing us Henry's daughter Charlotte, who went on to become the puppet, and letting us see Charlotte's plan to help the other missing children find their happiest day. After this ending, we also get to see our paycheck, which has a few hidden details. Firstly, our main character's name is Scott Cawthon, which I guess makes sense when you remember that our character was asked to record the voiceovers for Fazbear Entertainment. We can also see the original FNAF in real life hoax image used in the newspaper, as well as our actual pay, which was $99. For the third and final ending, when completing 420 mode in the custom night, we get this cutscene right here. I found this. I made it. All of this was done in order to find something that even Henry couldn't understand. The last ingredient. Something called the spark of life. The most terrible accidents bear the most beautiful fruits. They serve their lives for a greater purpose. Recreating the accident. That is the duty and honor of science. Reproduce the experiment and get the same results? <laughs> I gave my whole life to this experiment. Piece by piece. The spirit follows the flesh, it would seem. And also the pain. If I wish to become my own immortal creation, my body must lead my spirit to its immortal home. And that time has come. I have finally achieved what I've been waiting for for a long time. You thought you would kill me this way and finally be free. By imprisoning me in this body, you only did me a favor. You just gave me a second life that I always wanted to have. I am immortal now, Michael. Running away will get you nowhere now, my son. You may not recognize me at first, but I assure you, it's still me. Now this cutscene is cool and all, but I really think this should have been handled a little differently. I think that it is really sick that Springtrap is finally being revealed, and the fact that we are getting a Return to Bloody Nights 2 that is a remake of FNAF 3 is beyond hype. But where my problem comes in is the way it was revealed. Springtrap is far too big of a reveal and way too relevant to the game to be hidden away in a cutscene for completing 420 mode, a mode that a very small percentage of players will actually complete. I think 
think they should have found a way to tie this in with the night 5 or 6 ending, that way more players would actually be able to see it. Other than that though, the actual reveal is sick, and I am beyond excited for the Return to Bloody Nights 2, whenever that releases. Overall, I think that the Return to Bloody Nights is an amazing FNAF fan game. The gameplay is scary and has a lot of tension, which will keep you on edge when you're playing. There is enough challenge and extra modes to keep hardcore fans invested, and also tons of story content in the form of cutscenes, audio recordings, and easter eggs, which all tell a very concise and interesting narrative. The presentation, graphics, animation, music, sound effects are all done perfectly, working together to create an uneasy atmosphere throughout the entire game. There is also tons of extra content which is unlockable through the sixth night, as well as a fully fleshed out custom night for anyone insane enough to attempt it. Other than a few frustrating deaths that felt like they were in the hands of RNG, there is really nothing wrong with this fan game. I thoroughly enjoyed my time playing this and think that any fan of the series would be able to find something of value here, whether you're a person who likes the story more or someone who focuses on gameplay. Let me know what you guys thought of the game though, and as always, I will see you in the next one. Peace. A little under a week ago, I set out to try and complete the most notoriously difficult FNAF fan game ever made. Normally a fan game won't take me more than a few hours to complete, but this one took me 3 full days of non-stop grinding and many pages of notes in order to complete it. The game I'm referring to is of course Post Shift 2. Post Shift 2 is a FNAF fan game that released Halloween Night of 2022. As many people know, this game was so difficult, unfair, and overly complicated complicated that it was actually removed from Game Joel only 5 hours after being uploaded. The game was receiving overwhelming criticism from everyone who played it, claiming that it was just too hard. With a part A and B, 4 completely different styles of gameplay, rage inducing mini games that make no sense, pages upon pages of tutorial screens that had me taking notes like I was studying for a test, and so many animatronics that I lost count, I really had no idea what I was getting myself into when I started this game. You'll see throughout this video that the game already begins insanely difficult, but only gets increasingly more wild with every single night, ending on the hardest 6th night I have ever seen in a FNAF fan game, and maybe the most complicated level in any video game that I've ever played. So make sure you watch till the end of the video to see the sheer amount of pain you must endure to complete this game. One thing I should quickly mention before starting though is shortly after the game was removed, it was actually re-uploaded with a few patches. This included a few additions to the tutorial screens and some small tweaks to the earlier nights, as well as night 5. Night 6 though went completely unchanged, still remaining as difficult as it was at launch. And as you guys will see shortly, these patches from the earlier nights didn't help much at all. So without wasting any more time, join me as I take you through the story of how I barely completed FNAF's hardest fan game and lost my sanity along the way. Before jumping straight into the game though, I quickly want to talk about how this game is structured. First off, the game is split into two different EXE files. You have Post Shift Part A and Post Shift Part B. Both parts feature three nights in total. In Part A, each of the three nights take place in the same location, only adding new animatronics with each night, just like how any other FNAF game would go. Part B on the other hand introduces a new location, new set of mechanics, and new animatronics every every single night. Also, last thing I'm gonna say before jumping in, I am not gonna be talking about the story in this video, only the gameplay. There was no chance in hell I was gonna try to piece together the story when I was already taking multiple pages of notes just to remember every single animatronics mechanics. Night 1 takes place in this warehouse area which we are able to walk around in. We can do this by using our WASD keys which will trigger these very nauseating cutscenes of our character walking around to the next location. During 
During night one, we need to use a tablet which can be accessed in the bottom left corner of our screen in order to command a drone to repair an animatronic. Each repair takes some time to complete, so we must wait a few minutes between sending the drones each time. The way we actually complete the night is by finishing all three of our repairs and then reaching 6am, all without dying. And this is a lot harder than I expected. So in the warehouse, there are a few key areas in which animatronics will appear. There is the temporary aisle where we spawn, the souvenirs area in front of us, cleaning and sanitary to our left, which by the way requires two full walk animations to get to, the construction area to our right, which also requires two walking animations, and then behind us we can turn around and walk forward to the middle of the aisle, where we are able to look to our right through this shelf. We can then walk forward once again to the promotional area. Here we were also able to look to the left to check another spot where the animatronics can be. Yeah, it took me a while to get used to it too, so don't worry if you're a little bit confused right now. For night one, there are four different animatronics out to get us. These being Miniature Freddy, Miniature Foxy, Miniature Baby, and Revenant Freddy. Yes, you heard that right. There is two different Freddies for night one. When Revenant Freddy appears, you will hear his laugh, meaning that he is now sitting in the promotional area. This means that Revenant Freddy is one step away from attacking. Soon after this, Freddy will randomly move to the left side of the promotional area, meaning you only have a few seconds to run back to the temporary aisle, open your tablet, and throw a decoy drone. There is no sound cue for when Freddy moves the second time, however, your screen will begin flashing black before he attacks. Most of the time, you are able to use this as an indicator on when to throw the drone. That way, you can just stay in the temporary aisle after hearing his initial laugh. However, that doesn't always work because sometimes your screen will be flashing black for a completely different reason. Miniature Foxy is a little easier to deal with, but not by much. When Miniature Foxy appears, you will hear a brief running sound cue. That means he is standing in one of two areas, those being either the other side of the shelves in the temporary aisle or the promotional area. When you hear Foxy's sound cue, you must run up to wherever he is and open your tablet. You can then go to the voice constructor tab where you must input a sentence given to you at the bottom of the screen. You do this by clicking these buttons which each have a few words written on them, which doesn't sound too hard, but when under pressure and given the fact that Foxy barely gives you any time, it's very easy to mess up. Miniature Baby will appear in the souvenir area where she can be seen sitting on the table. There is no sound cue for when she appears, so the best way to find out if she is there is to constantly check your tablet's emotional state tab. If the diagram of Baby is red, that means you must go to the souvenir area and pull open your tablet. From here you can click the run memories button which will flash images of various minigame style images. You have to wait until a good memory appears and then click the lock memory button which will calm her down and make her go away. For the fourth and final animatronic of night one, there is Miniature Freddy. You will know Miniature Freddy is attacking when you hear a very faint sound of a piano being played. This is very quiet and blends in really well with the extremely loud ambience, so you will need to be listening intensely throughout the entire night. When you hear this piano, that means that Miniature Freddy can either be in the cleaning and sanitary area or the construction area. If he is in the construction area, you will see him emerge from the hole and you are given 15 seconds to as quickly as possible make it to the promotional area, which once you've already gotten down the layout of the map is honestly pretty easy, and this means that you got lucky. If Freddy decides to go to the cleaning and sanitary however, things get a lot more complicated. You will need to go into the room and flash your light on him to confirm that he is in the vent. After doing this, you can then open up your tablet and go to the report miniature conversion section. From here, you then have to answer a few questions about the animatronic you see in the vent. Questions like, does he have rabbit ears? Does it reside in the cleaning area? And by far the worst question, does it almost look like a completely different character? During one of my attempts, I got this question, and just before that, I noticed Freddy had a bunny ear now instead of a bear one. So with that information, I went ahead and said, yeah, it does almost look like a different character, as it almost now resembled Bonnie. But nope, apparently that's wrong, and I was punished with a jump scare. This is by far the sketchiest mechanic in night one, as the questions aren't always clear enough, and when under pressure of having the animatronic right in front of you, it can be extremely difficult to get the answers right. Now, is this a stupidly complicated and difficult night one? Yes, but this is far from the worst this game has to offer. Really, the hardest challenge in this night was just learning everyone's mechanics. 
Most of the tutorials gave very vague information on the animatronics, like they don't even tell you how to deal with Revenant Freddy. They just say, oh yeah, he appears in the promotional area, and that's it. No information on throwing the drone or which area you have to be in to even be able to throw the drone in the first place. So the first two hours of this game were spent dying over and over again, learning the animatronic mechanics from sheer trial and error, and literally writing out my own guide on a notebook which I could refer to mid-game. The speed in which your character navigates the area was also a huge cause for a lot of my deaths. Because of how fast the animatronics kill you and how slow your character runs around, even going to the wrong area once upon realizing an animatronic is attacking can cost you your whole run, which is absolutely absolutely brutal. A lot of this night is just sitting around waiting for an animatronic to strike and then perfectly executing the strategy to stop them before returning to the temporary aisle to wait for the next attack. There were a lot of unfair moments though. Sometimes multiple animatronics can attack at the same time which basically means there is nothing you can do and you just have to restart. There was a lot of RNG and trial and error that goes into this night which is why it took me over two hours to complete. Also because of how over complicated it is, I was never scared once during the game. Now sure I was stressed, but never was I afraid of the animatronics. I was too busy calculating like 50 different things to even stop and be scared for a second. After night 1 concludes, we get brought to this quick mini game where we are being chased by who I think is William Afton, and here I was sitting here thinking, oh just a cool little mini game to see into the story. But no, there was actual gameplay to this mini game, and just like the main night it is so unfair and completely RNG based. Basically you need to run towards the right side of the screen to escape the purple guy, while also clicking on every kid you see with your mouse, before eventually reaching a portal at the end of the mini game. This doesn't sound bad at all, but somehow they made this unfair. Sometimes randomly the purple guy will just speed up and catch up to you. There is literally nothing you can do if this happens and you're just forced to restart the mini game. It also doesn't help that they're playing what is probably the most annoying music I have ever heard in a video game at max volume in your ears the entire time. It's this short loop that will absolutely drive you crazy while you're trying to beat this. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, there's like a 20% chance that when you're going down this ladder, the purple guy will just teleport on top of you and kill you immediately, adding even more unfair deaths to this already brutal minigame. This section was just pure torture. I never thought I would see the day where I would be raging at a FNAF minigame, but here we are. Towards the end of the minigame, we also see a code given to us towards the top of the screen. This code can be entered into a lock pad towards the end of the mini game to receive a key which will help us reach one of the better endings. Yes, this game has multiple endings. The only problem with this is only one code works out of the three codes scattered across the three mini games in part A. So basically you will need to play all three nights, write down all of the codes, and then try every single one in order to get the key. Trying to put in the code is so annoying because every time you mess up the code you can't try again. So you just have to stand there waiting for the timer to run out before attempting to reach the area again, knowing there is a big chance that RNG will just completely screw you over. Oh, but that's not it. The portal towards the end can also send you to multiple different locations. So you have to get lucky with the purple guy RNG, get lucky with where the portal takes you, and then get lucky with guessing the code right. All for this key right here. What the f were they thinking? And if that wasn't rage inducing enough, on my initial playthrough, I thought you completed the mini game by walking to this large exit door, but I had accidentally opened up the panel to type a code. I was panicking and thought the purple guy would come, so I quickly hit the escape key hoping it would get me out of the panel, but instead it actually closed my entire game. And because there was no replay mini game section, I was forced to beat night one all over again just to go back and get the key. And I still didn't even end up getting it because the code wouldn't work. This isn't a fault of the game though. One of the number one rules of a FNAF fan game is to never press the escape key, but in panic I did it and for that I paid the price. After getting through that pure hellscape of a mini game, we load into a kind of intermission section in the form of this house. We are able to roam around the house and inspect various areas of it. This area is used mainly to progress the different endings. We can use various different items we collect throughout the night 
fights as well as items like the key we get from the mini game to unlock more of the game's story. For me, I wasn't able to unlock anything after night one though, so after just exploring around the place for a little bit, I ended my time at the house and jumped straight into night two. Just like night one, we are once again in the same warehouse surviving against the same animatronics, only this time with the addition of Remnant Bonnie, Remnant Foxy, and Remnant Chica. Remnant Bonnie will randomly appear somewhere in the warehouse. When this occurs, we will see a counter in the top left of the screen. To stop Remnant Bonnie from killing us, we need to search around the warehouse until we run into the same room as him. He will then disappear and we will need to find him three more times before he goes away. Something weird about Remnant Bonnie though is according to the tutorial, you can also try and use the decoy drone on him, but it only works sometimes I guess. It just seems very weird to me to even include this mechanic when there is already a proper way to get rid of him. I guess you could just use it as a last ditch effort if you already know he's gonna kill you. On his own, Remnant Bonnie doesn't cause too much trouble, but when other animatronics are present at the same time, it's pretty much game over. Because of how long it takes to find him four different times. Remnant Chica appears in the construction area. When Remnant Chica appears, a voice over the intercom will tell you that she has spawned. If this happens, we will need to make our way to the construction area and look down the hole where we will see a flickering light. As soon as you see the light flicker yellow, you will need to make your way back to the temporary aisle and throw your decoy drone, just like with Remnant Freddy. Oh yeah, and for some reason, Remnant Chica is wearing a hazmat suit. I have no idea why an animatronic would need to be wearing a hazmat suit, but hey, at least it looks cool. For the final animatronic added in Night 2, we have Remnant Foxy, who has by far the sickest design in the whole game. Remnant Foxy will randomly throughout the night crawl out of the construction area and appear in the temporary aisle, right in front of your face. The way he looks twitching right in front of you, coupled with his crazy detailed design, is just so creepy to me. This was definitely one of the things that stuck out to me the most in these first three nights. Anyways, to get rid of him, we need to pull up this remote that can be accessed in the bottom right corner of the screen. From here we need to push these three buttons in order to mess with the lights which will make Foxy leave us alone. He's probably the easiest animatronic to get rid of, but something about that animation just stressed me out every time he appeared, probably because of just how close up he is to our face. Now since I had already gotten the hang of the gameplay from my two hours spent on night one, I actually managed to beat this night on my second attempt. All three of the animatronics added during this night didn't pose too much of a threat, as each of them have a pretty straightforward way of dealing with them. Also up to this point, Miniature Baby did not appear a single time during my game, which also played a part in allowing me to pass this so quickly. After finishing night 2, it was back to the mini game grind. I spent over 10 minutes doing attempts over and over again trying to get the right code in order to unlock the safe, but once again I left empty handed. None of the codes I was given would unlock it, so I just had to quit out and keep moving forward. During night 2, house section though, I was actually able to find a family photo of the Aftons lying around in the sink. Other than that though, everything else was locked or inaccessible, so I moved on to night 3. Night 3 surprisingly didn't introduce any new animatronics, and was just a harder version of night 2. I didn't really have much trouble with this night either, only dying a couple of times. I also got insanely lucky though, with once again not having to deal with Miniature Baby a single time. I actually I actually noticed she appeared right before the night ended, which was a huge blessing because I started to panic as soon as she appeared. After finishing that stress inducing but not too difficult third night, I was once again back to the minigame section for the third and final time. I spent another like 15 minutes or so grinding out the minigame, however this time I actually managed to put in the right code. I have no idea if this was a fluke or I just got lucky, but I actually managed to do it. This gave me a key and I was also told for the first time in this minigame that I had survived. Coming back from the house section, I discovered I was able to place some photos I had gotten during one of the nights on this board on the wall. This is how our character begins to piece together that the animatronics here were rebuilt for another purpose, or something like that. Besides that though, I wasn't able to discover anything else notable in the house, so I went ahead and exited. Concluding part A of the game. If you guys thought that was bad though, that was merely an introduction to the game. You guys haven't seen anything yet. Part B took way longer than part A, and was 
even more complicated. So make sure you strap in because we're about to get to the real difficult stuff. Before moving on to part B though, I quickly want to give my closing thoughts on part A. Overall, I think that this is not a bad fan game at all. And hear me out, you can really feel the love and passion that the developer put into this game. The modeling work in this game as well as the art direction taken with the animatronic designs is absolutely stunning in my opinion. Characters like Remnant Foxy and Remnant Chica just look so cool and unique when compared to other fan games. Even the smaller stuff like the UI and night completed screens look really sick, which shows me that the developer really put his all into this game. There are so many cool aspects here that if done just a little bit better could have really shaped together to be one of the greatest FNAF fan games ever made. It's just such a shame small issues crept their way in which really hinder the experience. Things like confusing controls, overly complicated mechanics, vague tutorials, and just too much RNG really drag the game down when it could have been so much better, and push a large majority of the game's audience away from ever getting to see all of the content this game has to offer. With that being said though, let's move straight on to part B, which in my opinion is a lot more interesting than part A. Also really quickly guys, if you're enjoying the video so far, please consider subscribing, it means the world to me. Anyways, let's get back to the video. Starting off post shift part B, we can now move on to night 4, which takes place in the miniature containment area, honestly one of the coolest areas in the game. During this night we must survive until 12pm while surviving against many different threats, and once again we are back to reading paragraph after paragraph of tutorials. Luckily for you guys though, I'll summarize everything so it's easier to understand. First I'll just explain the area though. We have a monitor in front of us which displays Remnant Puppet. We aren't able to walk around as much but we can turn around three different times to see every angle of the room, as well as check under this table in front of the monitor. Seems simple but of course that's not enough so there is also an upstairs area we can access by going up a ladder. Here we can also look straight in front of us and behind us. We also have a computer screen which we can only view when staring at the screen with Remnant Puppet on it, which shows us four different simulations we need to manage. The first animatronic we need to prevent from killing us is Remnant Balloon Boy. He can be seen standing directly behind us and very similar to Foxy in FNAF 1 needs to be looked at very frequently. Failing to do this for long enough will cause Balloon Boy to move one step closer to killing us. Let this happen too many times and we are dead. In front of us is a monitor with Remnant Puppet. Wait, is that Remnant Puppet? Puppet or Miniature Puppet? I'm sorry, I can't even remember. There's like three different puppets during this night. I'm not even kidding. Anyways, Miniature Puppet, I think it is, can be seen in front of us on the monitor. Every once in a while during the night, the words I am above will appear on the screen. When this happens, we need to click on the screen with our mouse a few times until this question appears. Enable blaring connection. We now have to press Y to enable it before running up the ladder and turning around to scare away the puppet. I have no idea why it even asks you yes or no because if you say no I'm pretty sure you just instantly die. One trick to this though is that we actually can't enable the blaring connection if Remnant Puppet is present. When Remnant Puppet appears we will hear a faint piano sound playing in the background. Once this occurs we need to immediately go up the ladder and stare at Remnant Puppet. This will cause Venta Puppet to appear in front of us. Yes, the third puppet in this night. And then we must just look to our left I think to get rid of him or spam click on him, I don't really remember honestly. I have no idea how this really works because I died a few times but then other times I would just get away with it so I'm kind of confused on this mechanic. The final thing we need to worry about during this night is the simulations. Randomly during the night one of the characters will ask a question on the simulation and we will need to give them the proper item to calm them down. If we fail to do this some weird thing happens where they will just turn into one of the animatronics. Like on this attempt right here I didn't attend to this guy fast enough and he just turned into Freddy, the animatronic will then appear behind you and kill you. Sometimes there is literally no way to win, like this attempt right here where one of them decided to ask for an item as I was already on my way to attend a remnant puppet. And because of how slow the animations are, there was literally no way for me to win. Some of these questions are really dumb and make no sense, like this one with Balloon Boy. Here he asks me for his very own pizzeria and in a panic I had to quickly choose an answer, so I chose whatever this one was right here. Nope, wrong. 
Surely it can't be this picture of Freddy's face. It looks nothing like a pizzeria. Yeah, it's that one. Not the one with the balloons, not the one with the table. Nope, this picture of Freddy's face indicates a pizzeria, I guess. Other than that one stupid death though, this simulation thing didn't cause too much trouble. As long as RNG is in your favor, you don't really have much to worry about. There is also this virtual disconnect meter in the top right, which indicates whenever an animatronic needs attention. This helps a lot because it allows us to watch over Remini BB instead of having to constantly check the monitor. Every time you see the percentage go up, you can just quickly go and deal with the simulations. Overall, this night actually wasn't too hard. I only died like 7 times, which don't get me wrong is a lot when considering how long the nights are, but to this game's standards, I mean that's pretty good. Out of all the nights in the game, I might even go as far as to say that this is the most well balanced night. Other than a few times where there was nothing I could do, I actually felt like I had a grasp on the mechanics this time and felt pretty good executing them. All of the animatronics and visuals in this night are amazing as well. The setting is really cool, and I like that in this night we are more stationary. The walking around of the previous nights just got nauseating after a while. Also, all of the animatronics look really cool, especially Remnant BB and the way his chest opens up as he gets closer to you. I also think the simulation idea is actually pretty cool. The idea that you have to keep the animatronics remembering happier times or else they will revert back to their animatronic forms is just really cool. And turning around and seeing them actually come to life in the office is also sick. One last thing I want to point out is the music in this night is actually really good. I'm not sure if Arjack did the music himself, but if he did then huge props to you dude because this music goes hard. So yeah, not the worst night ever. I would actually say I like this one if a few of the tiny issues were ironed out. After finishing night 4 we also get another mini game and this one is is really cool. This minigame is a text adventure starring Afton himself. I'm not sure if it's William Afton or Michael Afton, but yeah. And here I actually managed to get a good ending. In this minigame, we make a series of choices which determines which ending we get. And a really cool thing about this one is that we can actually restart every time we fail. So it's not like if we mess up once, it's the end of the world. Also, the music here is really good once again and not annoying at all like the last minigame music was. I'm pretty sure whichever ending you get here has an influence on which ending you get at the end of the game, but I can't really say that for sure. If so though, that is a really good touch and it adds a lot of replayability to the game for anyone insane enough to attempt this game multiple times. Alright, so now time for night 5 and this is where things get extremely brutal. For anyone who has played Post Shift 1, you may notice right off the bat that this night is very similar to that game. In this night, we are standing in the middle of four hallways. There is one in front of us, one behind us, one to the right, and one to the left. Each of these hallways belongs to one animatronic, with the four animatronics attacking us being Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. I'll start with Freddy though. We will know Freddy has spawned when we hear his laughing sound cue. We will then need to run down his hallway to make it to the room where he can be seen playing the piano. Freddy can be heard playing one of four songs, so we will need to open up our tablet and click the song databank before selecting whichever song he is playing. Most of these songs are iconic FNAF songs, like the Torador March and the Circus song from FNAF 2, but it's still going to take a lot of trial and error and a couple of times of choosing the wrong song before you get the hang of this mechanic. For Foxy's mechanic, we will hear a robotic voice come over the intercom and it can tell us one of two things, either that Foxy has appeared in Pirate's Cove or a certain number. If we hear either one of these, we must run over to Pirate's Cove. If the voice told us a number, we will need to open up our tablet and put that number to stop Foxy. However, if we did not get a number, we will need to open up our tablet and then open up the even smaller tablet. Yes, there are two tablets and use the camera to check on Foxy. From here we need to check if Foxy's eye is missing or not. We can then close the tablets and either declare his eye missing or just not do anything at all, and return to monitoring the other animatronics. For Chica, there is a lot of stuff written on the tutorial, however I did not really follow it at all. There are these two buttons used on the tablet to deal with Chica whenever she spawns, those being cut power and oxygen removal. Apparently the oxygen removal will stop Chica however your gas mask won't work for 90 seconds and apparently there's a 1 in 4 chance she can still kill you? Like what? 
I have no idea what any of that means. For me, every time I heard Chica spawn, I would simply run over to her room and use the cut power button, which will just return her to the stage. The gas mask that the tutorial is referring to is used whenever gas fills the room. Basically, randomly during the night, sometimes gas will appear for around a minute and you will need to wait for it to pass. While waiting for it to pass, you will have to use the gas mask, however, the heavy breathing and muffled sound it makes makes it extremely difficult to hear the animatronics, so it's best to wear it only when absolutely necessary. This is honestly what killed me most during this night besides Bonnie because when I had the mask on I couldn't even hear the most obvious of sound cues like Freddy's laugh. The character breathes so loud and everything else gets drowned out so it gets very sketchy whenever you have the mask on. Alright so now for the last animatronic who is by far the worst one to deal with and that is Bonnie. Whenever Bonnie spawns, we will get a notification on our tablet, meaning that we need to run into his room immediately. As soon as we make it down the hall, we will hear one of four versions of him playing the guitar, very similar to Freddy. The only difference is actually differentiating which option to pick is nearly impossible unless you have died to him over and over and over again. This is pure trial and error, and I cannot tell you how many times I died to this guy just because I chose the wrong option. Basically, he will be playing the guitar, and we will need to say if it is normal pitch, low pitch, no drums, or with drums. And if that sounds confusing, that is because it is. So let me just use the tutorial to break this down because it still makes barely any sense to me. So if the song is playing and doesn't have drums, and it's at normal pitch, you will need to click with drums. If the song is at a low pitch, you will need to click normal pitch. If the song is glitching, which is the easiest one to tell, you also need to click normal pitch. And if the song is playing with drums, you will need to click without drums. So to get this straight, the low pitch button does absolutely nothing and shouldn't even be on the tablet at all. If you hear that it's at a low pitch, you click normal pitch. But if you hear that it's at a normal pitch, then you need to listen for drums to decide if they're playing or not. Now it might sound like it's not too bad, but when you quickly need to come up with an answer, it is extremely confusing. Especially because you are most of the time picking the option that is the opposite of what you hear, unlike with the Freddy one. What makes this worse is that on top of everything else, we also have an attention meter. This attention meter determines how active the animatronics are. But a better way to look at this is just do not let the number go over 20. Letting it do that will cause the animatronics to become extremely active to the point where you just get absolutely spammed until death. The attention meter rises every time we do anything, such as running down the halls or using our tablet, so we will need to be sitting in the middle of the room listening quietly for as much time as possible. It is also extremely important to keep that meter down because once we reach 6am, it is still not over. No, 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 this is post shift 2 we are talking about, so of course we're not going to get let off that easily. So on top of reaching 6am, we also need to do these tasks at the end of the night using our mini tablet, something that was wasn't mentioned at all during the tutorial, or that's what I thought at least, because the tutorial only mentions the orders if you open up the mini tablet, but the catch to that is that the tutorial doesn't even tell you the mini tablet exists. And by the way, you open up the mini tablet by pressing Q, so there was no on-screen button to open it up. I had absolutely no idea this thing even existed until I went and watched a guide. We can finish our orders by securing the web line, which takes about 30 seconds to complete, before then doing insta orders which is like another 30 seconds. On my night, once it reached 6am, I realized I didn't do my orders yet and I just completely sent it. I did not worry about any animatronics and decided to just stick the orders to hopefully win. And to my surprise, I actually did it. After I can't even count how many attempts, I finally beat night 5, one of the hardest nights ever. I need you guys to realize how hopeless this night truly felt when playing. During the night, there was a lot of downtime between each animatronic spawning. Those seconds you are sitting there and just absolutely dreading that Bonnie spawns. And the hopeless feeling that I had that I could just guess wrong at like 5am and just die immediately made things so much worse. I seriously didn't know if I was ever going to beat this night or not. Now for the positives of this night, and I have very few to say for this night. First of all, like always, the animatronic designs are really sick. I especially like how Chica looks when glitching out right in front of you and how Bonnie looks. Those two are definitely the 
scariest in this night. And for the last positive, I guess, I like the layout of the night. I think it's cool that each of the four animatronic characters got their own exclusive night, and the way they each get their own room with their own mechanic is really interesting. The execution of it all just wasn't done the best. One final thing I need to mention is there are actually two power-ups which can help you during the night. The first one is a second life, which really saved me on my winning attempt. Basically, if you enable this, upon getting jump scared, you will be taken back an hour and revived, so you can continue that run. This was extremely helpful, and also the weird animation it does when you get brought back to life is really cool in my opinion. The other power-up makes it so that any sound you make doesn't actually add to your attention meter. However, I only used this once, and it didn't really help me out at all. After completing that absolute torturous night, we have yet another chance to play the Afton Text Adventure before moving on to night 6. You only have to play it again if you want, but I decided to do it again and actually managed to get a different ending, where I used a drone to sneak into Freddy's room. This apparently got me another good ending, so I went ahead and moved on to night 6, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Alright, so now for night 6. Oh boy, night 6. I have no idea how I'm even gonna explain this night, but I'm gonna do my best, so just bear with me. First of all, unlike every other night in the game where the tutorial is read while walking around the office, for night 6 we are instead given a novel featuring 5 pages worth of tutorials to read before going straight into the night. This already is a huge issue because there is no way to know what the tutorial is actually talking about unless you have already played it. This means that you will need to basically go into the night blind and just get destroyed for a couple of attempts before you can even begin to grasp what the tutorial is talking about. The reason the tutorial page is so long is because not only are we once again in a new area, but there are also brand new animatronics every two hours. In this night, we need to survive from 12am to 6am. The night is split into different segments and all of them need to be beaten in one go. The different segments are 12am to 2am, 2am to 4am, and then 4am to 6am, before then having one final section. Now thank god there is actually a checkpoint when you reach 4am. However, you can still not close the game or even pause it. Regardless though, if this checkpoint right here didn't exist, I can say with 100% confidence I would not have beaten this game. To put this night into perspective, before even beginning an attempt, I had to read through the tutorial multiple times and write another guide in my notebook for myself to refer to whenever I had to deal with an animatronic. This helped me so much in my first few attempts and were really the only reason why I got the hang of the mechanics at all. Especially because when you die, the game doesn't tell you how you could have prevented it or give you tips on how to survive next time. You're just on your own to figure it out. Alright, so 12am to 2am. Before even explaining the animatronics though, I need to quickly explain the office because this is by far the most confusing one in the entire game. We can look to our right to see Golden Freddy stage and then we can also walk closer to get to this machine right here. Whenever we reach a new milestone in the night, so every two hours, we will need to come to this button and press it in order to progress to the next section of the night. To our left is a table, which animatronics can hide behind and under. This will be important later. And then behind Behind us is a computer. We can go up to this computer and use it to upload files. Something we need to do during the night to generate power I think, because yes, this night has a power meter if it wasn't already hard enough. In front of us we can also walk forward to another computer screen, and this computer screen is used to fix errors whenever they arise, and we're also able to look to our left of the computer to check an open hallway the animatronics can go down. On top of all of this, we also once again have our trusty tablet from night 5, as well as our mini tablet attachment. We also again have our gas mask, because yes, the gas is back. And one thing weird I want to mention about these is they both are now accessed using a button in the bottom left. Even though literally one night ago they had their own keybind, which makes it very confusing to get used to. We also on top of everything have a camera to watch over the animatronics, although there is not enough time to sit there and just watch the cameras, so this is basically only only used to fight off a few of them. Alright, so I think that's everything in terms of the movement. I could be missing something, but I think I got it all. The five animatronics we need to deal with in the first two hours of the night are Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and Shadow Freddy. 
Freddy will appear in front of you when you hear it laugh, and when he appears you will need to open up your monitor and press the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 in that order to make him go away. It's not that bad. Foxy will appear in the vent view to the left of the screen and is actually pretty easy to deal with. We just need to run up to him and click the load voice button on our tablet to scare him away. Chica will randomly appear behind a whiteboard at the prototype table with no sound cue and can be scared away by clicking this button in the bottom and then pointing our plush at her. It's actually really tricky to see when Chica spawns and there is no sound cue so you will need to be checking this area very frequently. Luckily the button to pull out the plush kind of gives it away though so it makes it a little bit easier. Bonnie will appear right behind us at the communications post and you will not believe it. He once again has the same mechanic he had in night 5 which is just absolutely brutal. I cannot believe he brought this back for night 6. I just cannot believe it. Luckily though unlike night 5, since he's only here for 2 hours of the night, you will most likely only see him like once or twice during an attempt. Also the buttons are switched up a little bit and easier to guess, but not by much. For the final animatronic on the first 4th of the night, we have Shadow Freddy who will appear in the cameras. One funny thing about Shadow Freddy though is the tutorial straight up lies about him. It states that he is only present during the first 2 hours, but this is not true at all. Shadow Freddy is actually present I'm pretty sure from 2am to 4am because those were the only times when he would appear during my run which according to the tutorial he shouldn't even be active anymore. His appearance will be told to us through a sound cue and this purple effect which goes on our screen so we will not need to be checking the cameras the entire night but when he appears we will need to find out which camera he is on and then click this button repeatedly to get him to go away. <sighs> Alright, that was already a lot, and that was just the first four. Luckily though, that is probably one of the easiest sections of Night 6. And don't get me wrong, by no means was this easy at all. I'm just saying it was the easiest out of the four sections. The amount of trial and error it took me to learn all of this cannot be understated. I think it was at least like two hours of playing before I even got past 2am. Some things I want to mention before moving on to the next section though were just a few things I actually like about this night so far. First of us, like always, the area we are in is really cool to explore and look at, like this Toy Bonnie prototype on the table for example. It just shows how this game actually decorates its play spaces. It's not just a realistic looking or scary looking building, it actually has decoration which makes the world feel vast and lived in which I find to be one of the strongest aspects of the game. Also, the night features the best music in the whole game. The soundtrack goes seriously hard here and even though it was breaking Breaking my focus from hearing the sound cues, I didn't even mind it because it's actually really good. Alright, so now for 2am to 4am. The four main animatronics are no longer active and we now need to survive against Remnant BB, Miniature BB, Remnant Puppet, Miniature Puppet, Miniature Baby, and Miniature Ballora. Remnant BB appears directly behind us in the communications post very similar to how he acts on night 4. We need to frequently check on him in order to make sure his chest isn't opening and if you check on him and his chest is open a little bit you can just click on it to shut it which will basically put him back to zero. It is also important to note that when he is present we actually can't access the computer anymore so no more getting power from 2am to 4am because he is always just living right there. For Miniature BB every once in a while at the prototype table you will see a button to hide and listen. Upon seeing this you will need to click the button to go and hide under the table and then open up your camera where we can then select a memory which causes Miniature BB to go away. This isn't what the tutorial says though. Instead the tutorial for some reason tells us to just wait under the table until BB leaves but this never worked for me. And selecting the memory on the camera works every single time so I'm not really sure why it's not mentioned. Miniature Puppet in my opinion is by far the worst animatronic to deal with during these hours. They will appear in one of the cameras and need to be checked on as soon as possible because failing to do this will cause them to appear over your screen and begin doing damage to you until you eventually die. If you allow Miniature Puppet to appear on your screen, you have a very small window to make your way back to spawn and look at Golden Freddy, which will actually for some reason make him disappear. This is extremely difficult however, as within like 5 seconds of Miniature Puppet appearing, their face will cover your whole screen, making it nearly impossible to make your way back to Golden Freddy unless you remember the exact keys to press 
best to make it there without seeing anything. So your best bet is to just not let Minotaur Puppet get past the camera phase. Remnant Puppet is pretty similar to Minotaur Puppet. They will appear only on Cam 5 though, and upon seeing them, you'll need to press this button in the bottom left corner of the tablet to get rid of them. It's best to do this while also doing other tasks, such as right before dealing with Remnant BB. Minotaur Ballora behaves a lot like Foxy did in the last two hours. When she appears, a robotic voice will announce her presence, meaning it is time to run up to the same area Foxy resides in and use your tablet to to switch the music tracks. This oftentimes causes an error to occur on the screen though, but that can be dealt with by pressing tab. Sounds easy enough, but this is something the tutorial doesn't even mention. The only way I was able to figure out that you're supposed to press tab was once again through a YouTube tutorial. For the last animatronic, we have Minotaur Baby, who will be seen sitting at the screen hacking our computer. Whenever this occurs, we need to open up our camera and click on this button at the top of the screen. We then just need to select a positive memory, just like we do for her in night 1. After finally making it to 4am, we need to once again interact with Golden Freddy's box one more time, which will finally solidify us with a checkpoint. This took me countless hours and so many deaths to complete. I died over and over and over, took countless notes, watched many different playthroughs and tutorials, and this was still the sweatiest night I've ever played. The fact that you can die before even getting to attempt the 2am to 4am section makes it insanely rage inducing, because the first two hours aren't even that hard, it's just basically RNG based and a guessing game whenever you you run into Bonnie. 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. is when the difficulty actually ramps up, so you just want to keep replaying that part in order to get the trial and error done. But because the first two hours are there, this isn't so easy. I was absolutely raging here, but once I got the checkpoint, I was actually finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Luckily for us, 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. is not as hard as the last section. This time we are dealing with Revenant Freddy, Revenant Chica, Revenant Foxy, and Revenant Bonnie. Remnant Freddy has by far the dumbest mechanic in maybe even the entire game. It almost makes no sense at all. Freddy will appear in front of the prototype table and to get rid of him we will need to open up our tablet and press the numbers 4321 in that order to get rid of him. However, this does not work as the song needs to be restarted. We do this by opening up our camera and pressing the restart song button that is now just randomly there. Now the reason this mechanic is so dumb is you think you could just restart the song first, right? I mean, that would make perfect sense. But no, you have to open up the tablet, press 4321, let it fail, then open up the monitor, wait for the restart song button to work because most of the time it is still grayed out, press it, then open your tablet up again, and then type the code for a second time. This makes absolutely zero sense and I have no idea why the restart button is always grayed out. It feels like it's just complete luck. For Remnant Chica, luckily she is really easy to deal with though. She will appear in the communications post and once again all we need to do is just point the plushie at her which is not hard at all. For Foxy, he will appear under the prototype table. When he is under there, we need to press this button to go under there with him before opening our camera and selecting a bad memory to get him to go away. And what makes this actually pretty easy is that the bad memory is the same every time. We just need to find this one where there's this dude with a gas mask and apparently that's a bad memory. So just select that one every time. For the fourth and final animatronic, we have Remnant Bonnie. Remnant Bonnie can appear either at the vent view or or Golden Freddy stage. Whenever he spawns we need to run over to wherever he is and use our camera to throw a decoy drone to get rid of him. After getting through this one final stretch and reaching 6am, you would think it's finally over, right? Surely we worked hard enough and we can finally enjoy the end credits. But nope, it keeps going. For the final section of the game, we will need to survive 200 seconds while also dealing with two new animatronics. Amalgabot and Remnant's End. And Amalgabot is the one that we built in night one. If you remember how we kept sending that drone over and over again, basically we built this dude and he's back to kill us. Remnant's End will sometimes appear in this elevator, which now exists apparently. It's a new section of the office. And if the voice tells you that he has spawned there, you need to run over to the elevator and open it. You will see a plush sitting on the ground. You then need to close the elevator, wait 
three seconds, open it back up, close it again, and then wait three more seconds before walking away. After this, he can either spawn by Golden Freddy or at the vent view. If he is at Golden Freddy's stage, we will need to run over to the vent view and play a voice to lure him over, before putting on a mask and pressing these four buttons in a specific order. If he goes straight to vent view though, then we will need to go over there and just equip the mask without having to lure him with the voice. For Amalgabot, he can also appear in three different places. The first is the communications post. If he appears here, it's actually really easy to deal with. We just need to put on this Bonnie mask, which can be done by pressing this button at the bottom of our screen. Another place he can appear is under the prototype table. If he does this, we will need to go under the table with him and open up our camera. We can then find the audio protocol button, which is on a random cam and spam it until it works. For the third and final place he can appear, it is also at the prototype table, but just right in front of us. We will once again need to open up our camera, but this time find a stop button. We again just need to spam it until it eventually works because no buttons in this game ever work when pressing it just one time and he will be scared away. Before the timer reaches zero though, we will also need to make sure we process our orders just like we did in night five, as if we fail to do so, we won't actually be able to finish the night. Once finishing those tasks though and the timer reaches zero, we are finally done with post shift two. I was literally shaking after beating this and couldn't believe that I actually managed to pull it off. The amount of trial and error and grinding for perfect RNG this game takes to beat is just insane. After finishing the night, we get a final cutscene, which I'm pretty sure corresponds to whichever ending I got. For my game, I got the deteriorated ending, so not quite the good ending. But if you think I'm going back to get the good ending, you're funny because I'm never touching this game again. I already served my time. For my overall thoughts on the game, just like I said with part A, I think this game could have been really good. The game has all the pieces here to be such an amazing fan game, but I think the attempt to fill the game with too much content and mechanics seriously hinders the experience. This in my opinion is what happens when an overambitious developer works on a game for too long without allowing other people from the outside to playtest it. It's understandable that from the developer's point of view, he might have thought it wasn't too unbalanced or complicated because he literally programmed it. So subconsciously, he already knew all of the mechanics and probably thought it wasn't too confusing. I think that the developer put in serious work and I honestly respect him a lot. I don't think he should receive any hate for this game at all. At the end of the day, it's a free game that anyone can check out for themselves. And besides the actual gameplay, every other feature of the game is seriously impressive. The art direction, graphics, cutscenes, music, it's all so good. I really hope the developer doesn't lose passion for game development after this project because he is truly talented. Just next time, I think the game needs to be either simplified or split into multiple different games. Like if there was a post shift 2, post shift 3, that would have been better than just having all these different nights. The game should also be play tested by people who are going in completely blind to the mechanics. That way the developer can tweak the mechanics to not be too confusing and also make sure the tutorials explain everything at length. I'm curious to hear what you guys in the comments think though. Do you guys think that this was a good fan game and where would you rank it on your FNAF fan games tier list? Let me know in the comments down below. Anyways, that has been it from me guys. I'm sorry for taking a while to upload. I had to get my wisdom teeth removed, but I'm back on the grind now, so expect a lot of videos coming soon. I hope you guys all enjoyed this one though and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. If you have been in the FNAF fan game scene ever since its inception, then you may be familiar with a game titled Five Nights at Treasure Island. The game released all the way back in December of 2014 and was based on the already popular creepypasta Abandoned by Disney. Being one of the very first fan games to ever exist, this game hasn't aged very well. Although despite that, the game became very popular after its release, garnering attention from big YouTubers such as Markiplier and Corey Kenshin. 
This led to the game gaining a large fanbase, which prompted a group of developers by the name of Radiance Team to remake the game from scratch, adding new features, new gameplay, and new story elements. The game was released on November 28th, 2020, and was soon followed by its very own sequel by the name of Oblitus Casa, which was released exactly two years after the Treasure Island remake. And now, with a third installment on the way, I thought there would be no better time to dive deep into both Five Nights at Treasure Island and Oblitus Casa, to see why these two fan games are so heavily praised, and to prepare for Nightmare Below Disney, which has potential to be one of the best FNAF fan games we've seen in years. So if that sounds interesting to you, then join me as we dive deep into these two beloved fan games, to see if they are really worth all the praise they have received. Before even loading into the main menu, we get a short cutscene to kick off our playthrough. Our protagonist Jake receives a voice message from somebody named Greg, who works for the Supernatural Studies Association. He informs us that there is a small job position open for us to take. Greg and his team are currently investigating an abandoned island known as Treasure Island, and he needs somebody to watch over the place for a few days. So it is up to us to watch over the place for five nights while we uncover the dark secrets that are hidden on this abandoned island. After this, we load into the main menu of the game, which is very reminiscent of a classic FNAF fan game menu. Yeah, it's just a pretty basic menu, nothing really too interesting to know- Yeah, this really caught me off guard the first time it happened. I looked back at my monitor only to see Mickey duck under the menu, and then I suddenly got jump scared out of nowhere. Already such a really cool easter egg to start off the game. Anyways, after pressing begin, we load into night 1. But before that, we receive a small tip on how to survive. Night 1's tip is as follows. Turning off the office lights can save power. Be careful with the switch, and don't stay in the dark. As soon as we get into the actual office, our phone rings and Greg gives us a brief introduction to the location, informing us that he is here to collect data. He tells us that there are many rumors that surround this location, he says he can't confirm or deny any of them, but he did find a few questionable things, such as costumes, but he doesn't want to elaborate any further. He then warns us of an inverted Mickey costume that is roaming the location, and tells us to shut off a camera if it ever wanders into our office. Apparently because of inverted Mickey's poor vision and his reliance on sound, turning off a camera will get rid of him. After that, Greg sends us on our way to survive our very first shift. The controls for this game are very simple actually. We are able to press shift to turn on and off our lights in order to save power. We can hold control if we want to stand still still, and we can flick our mouse down to access our cameras, which we can use to monitor the entire building. If we press space while well on one of these cameras, we will temporarily shut it off, which in trade makes a loud noise. This can be used to get rid of some of the costumes attacking us, just like inverted Mickey, who was the only one attacking us for night one. Night one is very easy. Just as the phone guy stated, we only need to worry about negative Mickey. So night one serves as a nice way to get used to all of the mechanics. It was also a good time for me to learn the lesson to not leave the lights off for too long, as doing that will result in them breaking, which leaves you in the dark for the rest of the night. After reaching 6am, night 1 concludes as we load into our first post-night cutscene. This one has our players staring through some bars in another area of the island. Some strange sound effects can be heard in the distance, but nothing too out of the ordinary can be seen. After this, night 2 begins. For night 2, our phone rings once again, only this time a woman can be heard on the phone. She introduces herself as Lisa and informs us that she wanted to leave a message of her own. She tells us that Greg had left out a lot of details in his phone call, and then goes on to tell us that the things attacking us are in fact not costumes, but something else. She doesn't know what they are or what they're capable of, but warns us that some of them can actually see despite what Greg told us. So our camera trick won't work on them and we will need to try hiding instead. 
She also mentions a new entity that has been roaming the location by the name of Oswald. Oswald can also be scared away by shutting off a camera, but will hide in much darker places and is a lot harder to spot. Before hanging up the phone, Lisa mentions one last thing. She tells us about a part of the island known as Pirate Cavern and tells us to stay away from there. She doesn't want to give us any more details of the place, but just begs us to not go anywhere near before ending off the phone call. During night two, three new threats are introduced. Those being Oswald, who was mentioned in the phone call, Disembodied, and The Face, who appears very rarely for Night 2. Disembodied, just like Oswald and Photo Negative Mickey, can be scared away from our office by shutting off one of the cameras. Although, unlike those two, he makes a lot louder of an entrance. For the face, who has a very terrifying design, they will be seen sitting in our office staring at us. To get rid of them, we need to shut off our lights in order to hide from them until they leave our office. Night 2 is just a little bit of a step up in difficulty, but not by much. Everything so far was still going pretty smoothly. One thing I really like about the shutting off the camera mechanic is every time you scare a character away from your office, you are essentially trading a piece of information. So while you may not be safe temporarily, you are also missing a camera, which could have been used to monitor the other characters. In the earlier night, Nights, this doesn't play much of a part, but during the later nights when characters are coming in a lot more frequently, it can get pretty stressful with how limited your visibility becomes. After finishing night 2, we once again get another cutscene. We are in the same location as the night 1 cutscene, however this time the strange entity makes an appearance. Before the cutscene suddenly ends, and we begin night 3. For the night 3 phone call, we once again have a brand new person on the phone. This one goes by the name of Henry. Henry tells us that he is also an SSA intern, and he then tells us that he is stuck in Pirate's Cavern, the place Lisa told us not to visit. Henry tells us he doesn't have much time and begs us to come get him, informing us that he is on the second floor before the phone call is abruptly ended. For the new threats that Night 3 introduces, there are two more, those being Impurity and Acephalus. I think that's how you pronounce it. Impurity takes on the look of Minnie and behaves exactly the same as the other characters. So when she appears in your office, just like anyone else, open up your camera and disable one to get her to go away. Acephalus is a little bit different to get rid of, however. Whenever he appears in your office, he can be seen grabbing your monitor right in front of your desk. When this occurs, you will need to hold control so you can stand completely still until they leave your office. Besides this though, no new threats are added during this night so I think it's a good spot for me to talk about my overall thoughts on the gameplay so far. In my opinion, this game fails to be scary in most of its moments. This is because every time you get jump scared, you are able to anticipate it beforehand, which takes up most of the chances for tension to build up throughout the night. Also, with characters like Disembodied, who literally scream in your face when they appear, you get desensitized to any loud noises very quickly. This leads to the game's gameplay getting rather stale pretty fast, especially with how repetitive the character's mechanics actually are. Luckily though, the Sixth Knight does throw a curveball which helps break up this monotonous gameplay. That's not to say there are zero horror elements to this game though. I find the environments and especially the character designs to be extremely creepy. Also, the mechanic of turning off the light in order to save power is pretty effective in building tension, especially during the sixth night though. Sitting in the darkness with no way to tell if a character is present in your office makes you feel defenseless in certain scenarios. After night three concludes, instead of loading into another cutscene, this time we actually load into a free roam section of the game, which is a really nice change of pace. We load into the pirate's cavern and are given a tip, pay attention to everything. If there are eyes, use the flash. If there are no eyes, stand still. We are then set free to roam around the pirate's cavern, searching for Henry. We make our way through many dark rooms, every once in a while encountering the face, who just looks so terrifying in these environments. We eventually make it to an office room, where we are able to find a key in a desk drawer. 
We are then able to take this key over to an elevator in another section of the building and go down to the second floor. We progress through some pretty eerie caves, every once in a while stumbling across a suit, which if we aren't careful will kill us. The sound the suit makes when appearing is just so creepy to me, and the way it looks is just so unsettling. Eventually though, we make our way through the cave and to the staff door, which can now be unlocked with the key we just found. This opens up a room which appears to be destroyed, with writing on the walls and drawings everywhere. We start to see hallucinations of the suit taking its head off, which is a very cool nod to the original creepypasta, before the section cuts off and we begin our fourth night. For night 4, there is not really anything interesting to note. There is no phone call during this night, and also no new threats added. The enemies do become more active during this night, and this is where the difficulty begins to ramp up, but as long as you have already established a strategy by now, it's not hard at all. One of this game's biggest flaws is that the cameras for the first 5 nights are actually pointless. You don't need to do anything in the cameras besides shut one off when a character stumbles into your room. This means that there is pretty much a foolproof strategy to beat this game. Just wait in your office till somebody appears, flick down and shut off one of your cameras before loading up a new camera, and then just rinse and repeat this until the night is over. It is very easy, and once you discover this strategy, this game becomes a cakewalk, at least until night 6. The night 4 cutscene brings us back to where we left off on the night 2 cutscene, sitting in front of the figure behind the gate. The figure disappears and appears right in front of us, staring us down, before once again the cutscene ends and night 5 begins. For night 5, we are actually introduced to one new threat, that being Undying which is the suit we saw in Pirate's Cavern. Unfortunately though, this character adds no new mechanic, and instead just shares the same mechanic as Acephalus. So for Night 5, the strategy is exactly the same. Night 5 actually does have a phone call though, but there's not really any new info on here. It's just like the one from FNAF 1's Night 5, where it's just unrecognizable words, but hey, maybe if you put it in reverse or something, there's some information in here. You guys are gonna have to let me know about that though. After getting through the fifth night, we are suddenly shown a phone. Hey Jake, I'm a little late to notify you about this. My apologies. I'm just leaving you a message to let you know that we're gonna need more time. I know you probably want to get out of there, but there's been a few issues over here at base, and you're gonna have to stay at the island for a little bit longer. I'm super sorry, but there's nothing I can do about it. You just try and keep everything stable, and you'll be completely fine. I'm sure of it. I'll notify you when we're ready to pick you up as soon as possible. Thanks. Good night. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, we actually have to stay for one final night. And this night actually changes the gameplay up a lot. Getting rid of all the previous characters we had to fend off against, and putting us against this monstrosity, who goes by the name of Hourglass. In this night, the mechanic to fend off this character is very confusing, especially for me since I cheesed through using the cameras for the entire game up to this point. The way Hourglass works is whichever camera he starts on, whichever character from the previous night would start on that camera, that is the character Hourglass is going to share a mechanic with. This was extremely confusing for me at first because I had no idea which characters spawned where, which basically screwed me over on every single attempt. Luckily players have formed a strategy that makes this night a little easier to understand, so shout out to DGY Mon. This guy is a legend for inventing this strategy, because without this, I don't think I would have beaten this. Anyways, if Hourglass begins in cameras 5 or 8, we need to stand still when they come into our office. If Hourglass begins in cam 9, we will need to turn our office light off. And if Hourglass starts in cams 3 or 4, we will need to turn a camera off. We are then able to simplify the strategy down even more. All you need to do is check if Hourglass begins in cams 3 or 4. If not, when Hourglass comes into your room, both turn off the light and stand still to get rid of him. Immediately then recheck cams 3 and 4. If Hourglass does begin in cams 3 or 4, when he stumbles into your office, just use a camera to get rid of him and then recheck cameras 3 and 4 once again. 
You can then rinse and repeat this strategy until the night is over. It is a really good strategy that works perfectly, but it is still easier said than done. Hourglass appears very frequently, especially when you get into those later hours of the night, making the whole experience very stressful from start to finish. You also need to worry about power in this night, and they are not very lenient on it at all. That means that during all the chaos, you also need to find safe pockets of time to keep the lights off for a little while. The intensity that this camera mechanic causes makes this my favorite night in the entire game. It solves the problem of the cameras not being useful that was present in the previous night, and also ups the stress factor for the night by so much. Every time Hourglass would appear in my office, I was very uneasy about whether or not the move I chose was the right one or not. Unlike in the previous 5 nights where it was very easy to tell which mechanic to use in order to survive. This is definitely a very challenging final night, but it's one I enjoyed a lot. Also the design for Hourglass is very unsettling, and his jump scare really got me a couple times. After finishing night 6, we actually return to Pirate's Cavern for one final time. It all comes down to this. We need to make our way through the same rundown building and return back to the elevator. We can then take this elevator to the third floor where we can put in a code we were given. This unlocks a door leading us to a secret room in the island. The silhouette Mickey, who goes by the name of Mother, appears in front of us for one final time, before the game concludes a pretty abrupt and anticlimactic ending. Now to be fair, the first 5 nights of this game could have been a lot better, and I also feel like the story left a lot to be desired. All of the cutscenes are pretty vague, and not much happens in them at all. I still think this fan game has a lot of enjoyable aspects though. First off, I find the mechanics to be pretty fresh for a FNAF fan game, especially the office light mechanic, I feel like that adds a lot to the overall experience. I also just can't help but feel like a lot of attention to detail was put into this game. There are tons of references to the original source material as well as so many small easter eggs. Not only that, but the production value on everything just really shines. Everything plays so smoothly, the graphics look great and still hold up, and all of the environments and character designs were handled perfectly. Now I wouldn't go as far as to say that this is one of the best FNAF fan games I've ever played, but it definitely was an enjoyable one. That being said, after completing Five Nights at Treasure Island, I actually didn't expect myself to enjoy Oblitus Casa as much as I did. But Radiant's team really stepped it up, and I was really surprised with how good it actually turned out. Before moving on to the next game though, really quickly guys, if you are enjoying the video so far, please consider subscribing. I go in depth on all of the coolest FNAF fan games I can find, so if you like staying in touch with the FNAF fan game scene, then this is your spot. Anyways, let's get back to the video. Video. Oblitus Casa immediately opens up with an intro cutscene. In this cutscene, the protagonist from the previous game, Jake, is being questioned by a doctor. We learn that Jake went missing during the events of the first game in 2003, and then in 2004 was found and taken into custody after he showed signs of delusions and paranoia. We also learn that Jake is a suspect in the disappearance of all three people who spoke to us during the events of Treasure Island. Jake refuses to comment on most of the doctor's questions surrounding the incident. The doctor then asks Jake about the cabin and tells him to recall his time there. The doctor is already aware that Jake burned the cabin down and wants to know the events that transcribed there. These events are what we experience throughout Oblitus Casa. Like stated in the cutscene, this game takes place in a cabin. We have a notepad on our right and a camera to monitor the surrounding areas. On this camera, we also have a flash button as well as an audio lure. Also seen in front of us is a window to the outside of the cabin and there is also a staircase that leads to the attic on our left. When we click this staircase, we can actually go up to the attic and look around using this trusty lighter we have. Unlike Treasure Island, this game actually doesn't have phone calls and instead gives us our tips through the notebook. The notebook in night one reads, Your friends are dead. I am here to help you. The music on the cameras fool him. Distant sounds are less effective than close sounds. Use that to your advantage. Check this notepad frequently. For night one, we need to survive against Willy and Belial. Willy needs to be observed on the cameras and lured away from our office throughout the night. My favorite strategy for Willy is to just keep him on cam 9 because that cam is outside of the cabin. And what's really cool about that is that we can actually see Willy through the window when we're in the office. 
which helps us know if he has moved spots. The responsiveness of the audio lure also feels really good in this game. It actually responds whenever we use it and doesn't just sometimes not work like it does in FNAF 3. Belial's mechanic is a lot more unique and honestly one of the coolest in the whole game. Throughout the night, a drawing of Belial will begin forming on our notepad. So it is our responsibility throughout the night to frequently check it and erase any amount of the drawing that has formed. It's really satisfying to erase the drawing, and I just think it's such a cool and unique idea. Before moving on to what happens after night one, I just want to quickly comment on how good the game looks. The environments have taken a serious step up from the previous games. The movement just feels so smooth, and when paired with the amazingly done atmosphere, it really makes the game feel high quality. All the renders used and animations also look great, and unique uses of lighting like the lighter in the attic take the game up to that next level. This is definitely one of the most visually appealing FNAF fan games I've ever played. After reaching 6am, the sun rises and we get a message. The morning sun has driven them back into darkness. After this, we are brought into one of the post-night minigames, and I have a lot to say about this one. The concept of this minigame is that you can free roam throughout these different tunnels. You are searching for a very specific room on the grid, which is different every single night. You have a flashlight to help you navigate, but using it can put you in danger. The problem with this minigame is that every hallway looks exactly the same. You see that paper and stuff on the floor right there? Well, that same paper is on the floor one hallway down, and the next hallway, and the next hallway, and the next one. When everything looks the same, this leads to this section becoming extremely disorienting, especially for someone who's playing the game for the first time. I found myself just spamming through rooms trying to find the exit at random, but it never worked. This was until I learned about the unbeatable strategy for this section. What you can do is not turn your flashlight on at all, and instead use the compass to know which hall you are facing. Doing this allows you to go through the section without having to deal with any threats. We then need to listen in every hallway to try and hear a small sound cue. This sound cue means that we are one room closer to the exit. We can then rinse and repeat this strategy until we are eventually out of the tunnels. Now the problem with this strategy is that it is extremely unsatisfying. Like the fact that you need to result in a cheese way to complete the section just because the original intended mechanics are that confusing is really bad. I think that this section should have been either heavily reworked or just taken out of the game completely completely because it drags down the overall experience so much. But at the end of the day, I do respect the devs for going out of their way to invent more gameplay moments instead of just having us sit in the cabin the entire time. After getting through our very first tunnel section, which trust me took a lot longer than it should have, we make our way onto Night 2. Night 2 introduces two new characters once again that both bring in new mechanics to the night. The first one is our old friend The Face from Treasure Island. The Face appears in the attic which will be indicated to us through a sound cue, and if we hear this sound cue we need to immediately make our way up to the attic, and use our lighter to shine it on his face in order to make him leave. This is once again such a cool mechanic, and the look the face gives you when he's in the attic is truly horrifying. I just love his design so much. Also those brief seconds when you don't see him when coming into the attic are very stressful. The second character introduced into Night 2 is Daisy. Daisy will appear in the cameras and attempt to distract us more than kill us, a lot like what Balloon Boy does in FNAF 2. You can get rid of Daisy by using your camera flash, however the flash does need to recharge, so especially on the later nights it is important to be careful with when you will use up a flash and when you'll just allow Daisy to take over a camera. I also think it's a good time to mention the second chance mechanic this game has. Welcome to the Gulag. If you survive, you earn your freedom. Basically, when you die on any given night, you are taken to a brand new office with a whole new set of mechanics. Your goal is to click on three Mickey heads in the cameras, while also surviving against a bunch of new threats, and if you are able to do it, you are rewarded with coming back to life. Now the problem with this section is that you are thrown in completely blind, with no tutorial on how to fend off against anyone. Sometimes Donald Duck would just laugh in my face for like 20 seconds, but then let me live, and also Minnie Mouse 
mouse would like start floating in front of my desk or something. And we also have this like weird Mickey voodoo doll, but I don't know what it does. It's all just very confusing and I actually only managed to make it through one time. And the clip where I did it was absolutely insane. I was literally just spamming the cameras and have no idea how I managed to get that third and final Mickey head. Someone's gonna have to replay this in slow motion and tell me how I even live this because it makes no sense. Now this section is a little bit weird because they don't really tell you what to do, but I will say this. For them to take the time to design whole new mechanics just for a small little mini game is so cool. And the developers also reuse this section later in such a brilliant way, but I'm gonna talk about that towards the end of the video. After night 2 is over, we immediately begin another tunnel section. And by the way, there is no explanation for what we're doing under these tunnels. And the only clue we have story-wise is the voice of a guy who can be heard telling us to come closer and find him. Also, one last thing to mention about this tunnel section, it is actually so horrifying when you do catch the monster chasing you in the tunnels. The animation it does, as well as the sound it makes, caught me off guard so bad the first time I ran into him. After getting through that second tunnel section, we begin night three, and our notebook once again gives us a hint. You cannot let her into your room. Use the flash. This tip is referring to Photo Negative Mini, who is now present for Night 3. Photo Negative Mini can appear in either Cam 2 or Cam 8, and needs to be flashed every so often in order to prevent her from killing us. This means that we now need to be more sparing with our flash, making sure to not use it too often on Daisy. This also means that we will now need to be scanning the cameras a lot more frequently and also more thoroughly as Photo Negative Mini is very hard to spot. Also sometimes Photo Negative Mini can be seen hanging from the ceiling on Cam 2, but you will need to wait for her to be fully on the ground before using the flash. Besides her though, no new enemies are added, so we just need to stay on our usual tasks, which is luring Willy away, keeping the attic in check, and also erasing our notebook. After finishing up night 3, we return to the tunnel section once again, and rinse and repeat the same minigame we have already done two times. Now, I know that it may feel a little bit repetitive, but I promise that night 4's post night section is a lot more interesting. Night 4 brings in two new enemies, keeping the pressure on us very high. We are now introduced to both Pete and Dippy. Dippy behaves exactly the same as Willy, but will begin in a different camera. So now, we will not only be keeping track of one enemy, but two on the cameras. This does sound very stressful at first, but luckily these two can actually stack on a single camera. So not much has changed. You can keep them piled up on cam 7, and as long as you are checking it enough, you can actually keep them there the entire night. The other threat that is brought into the cabin is Pete. Pete is a large figure who will sometimes appear in the attic. Upon discovering that Pete is the one in the attic and not the face, we need to leave as fast as possible in order to prevent our death. This adds a new level of tension when entering the attic as now you aren't just worried about pinpointing the face's location, but also focused on leaving fast enough if Pete is there. I also just really love this guy's design. His larger frame is very threatening to see towering over you in the attic. Now, after night 4 is over, we, yes, once again return to the tunnel section. However, this time after completing it, this happens. We stumble across the creature who has been chasing us in the tunnels, who actually turns out to be Hourglass from Night 6 of Treasure Island. Our character shuts the door on Hourglass and sets the creature on fire. The cutscene then cuts to Mother, the silhouette character who has been present in the previous game, and she has a few words to say to us. What did you do? They were children. My children. I took them under my care. I protected them. They did nothing to you people until you. They didn't know why you were doing anything to them. They didn't even understand what you wanted. They were scared. And you killed them. You people shouldn't have come here. 
I shouldn't have led you. I've seen what you people do before. Everything that you do here. Every time your team meddles in something they can't understand. Every time they push and prod and hope to deep. You don't even realize that the grass you step on, the air you breathe, it's all me. I've always been here, every single time. Even if you didn't realize it. Even if you didn't recognize me. I have been here forever. And I will be here forever. But, even after the countless amount of times I've seen this play out, the eternities I've spent I never thought you'd go this far. I was wrong to let you pollute this place. To walk all over me as long as I did. I was wrong not to deal with you. It will all end here. I will make sure of it. After Mother's monologue, we begin the fifth but not final night. In this night, all the threats from the previous nights are now gone, and we are mainly facing off against Mother. Mother, just like Willie, needs to be lured away from our office. However, she behaves a little bit differently. Not only does she move much faster, but she also requires both the flash and the audio lure. When Mother's eyes are not glowing, that means we can use the audio lure to alter her location. When her eyes are glowing, however, that means we must flash her in order to get her to move. On top of this, we also need to balance other things, such as the notepad becoming full with a drawing of Mother's face, and the face still appearing in the attic rather frequently. The face also has a very slight but significant change in this night. Unlike previously when we would need to flash him only once to get rid of him, we now need to flash him over 6 times in order to get him to go away, and sometimes it can be even more than that. The face gives you a very small window to react every single time it moves, and the first few tries I had at this night, I actually died to him every single time. It's something you get the hang of later, but at first it actually felt nearly impossible, I'm not gonna lie. This night was already extremely hard to start off with, but this isn't where the difficulty ends, as at 3am Mother transforms into a new version of herself, now appearing much larger than before. During this second half of the night, her AI increases significantly, making it much harder to keep track of her location and lure her away properly. And with other time consuming tasks like watching the face, the room to make any slight mistake in this night is just so small. This seriously took me so many attempts but not in a bad way. This night doesn't feel unbalanced, and I actually found it to be a very fun challenge to end off the game. It is extremely stressful and requires your 100% focus throughout the entire 6 minute night, but it does feel extremely good to finally complete it, and the gameplay does a good job of making it feel doable yet challenging. Also, I think Mother's design is really terrifying, and I especially loved this jump scare where she crept her way into the cabin. After making it through that very challenging night, we actually get a rather disappointing final cutscene if I'm being honest.
Nothing was really resolved and we didn't learn much of anything towards the end. But hey, that just leaves more to be discovered with part 3. Like I mentioned though, this is not the end of what this game has to offer. This game has a very extensive and in-depth extras menu which was actually really cool to look through. There is also a 6th night which challenges you to face all of the enemies present on night 4 with much harder AI. Although to my disappointment, this didn't unlock any new story content, only rewarding me with one extra character for the custom night. Speaking of that, this game does have a custom night with characters not only present during the main story, but also new ones, who can be unlocked in the form of these creepypasta challenges. As someone who grew up watching creepypastas when I was little, I was beyond excited when I discovered this. So as a little bit of an extra to throw into this video, I'm gonna go over all of these too, because they reuse previous sections of the game in really interesting ways. The first challenge night up is Jeff the Killer. Jeff the Killer's night is pretty cool, because it reuses the gulag section's gameplay really well. In this night, we need to try and fend off against Jeff the Killer only using our flashlight while also attempting to reboot every single camera. These cameras take a really long time to reboot though, and as the night progresses, we rapidly lose flashlight battery, making this a really hard challenge. I actually got really close to beating this one, but just couldn't do it. Every single time, I would end up running out of flashlight battery right towards the end. There's also this really weird glitch where you will spot Jeff the Killer on the right side of the room, but you just can't see him, and will only hear the sound effect of him being caught, but I'm sure this is going to be fixed soon. Jeff's design looks really good here, and also the music that accompanies this night is really well made. The next challenge night up is Slenderman, who might have the coolest creepypasta challenge of all the characters. I'm not sure if that's just my nostalgia talking, but I really like how this night was handled. It seems to be based on that original classic Slender game that we all watched Let's Players play back in the day. You walk around the tunnel section searching for 8 pages while also trying to avoid Slenderman. Slenderman can appear in front of any hallway, blocking it, and if you look at him for too long, your screen will fill with static and you will die. Slenderman's AI increases the further into the night you get, which really makes it intense when you're on those last couple of pages. It's a perfect balance between simple and easy to understand gameplay and tension filled stressful moments. There is a strategy you can do which involves starting at the top left of the screen and making your way from left to right all the way down in order to make sure you don't skip a room. And while this strategy is very good, it is also equally as hard to execute as Slenderman blocking the hallway you want to go down can really complicate things and throw off your original path. This challenge night does share the same problem of every hallway looking the same, but it is far less relevant in this night and honestly doesn't drag down the night's gameplay as much as I thought it would. This is for sure a really fun addition to the game and also a genius way to reuse the tunnel section from the main story. Alright, so next up is Smile Dog, which for me personally is just as cool as the Slenderman one. Small tangent here, but this one seems like it was literally made for me. I have a vivid memory from my childhood where one summer me and my family went on a vacation and were staying in a cabin in the middle of the forest. This cabin was very creepy at nighttime and even had big windows looking out into the forest. And being the dumb kid I was, I actually listened to the Smile Dog creepypasta with my brother on the car ride to the cabin. So later that night when everyone was asleep, I was up all by myself in this dark cabin just hoping Smile Dog wouldn't kill me. And now to be sitting here playing a Smile Dog game in a dark cabin is just pretty weird to me. Anyways, in this night we need to erase this picture of Smile Dog on our notepad which takes a very long time. Every once in a while the picture will begin repairing itself meaning Smile Dog is present on one of the cameras. If this happens we need to pull up our camera and flash Smile Dog to resume erasing the photo. The photo regenerates very fast, so we need to make sure we are going as hard as we can when we're trying to erase it. The first guide I saw actually told me to not go as hard as I can when erasing, but after that didn't work, I saw another video saying the exact opposite. The guy was basically just saying spam as hard as you can, and after doing that strategy, I passed the night pretty easily. 
I just want to say the model for Smile Dog is done perfectly. Smile Dog has a really confusing design in the sense that it looks a very specific way in the original photo that is hard to translate to 3D. However, somehow Radiant's team pulled it off. Every single render of Smile Dog brings back those familiar fears I had of the character when I was younger. This is yet again another amazing challenge night and a perfect reuse of previous mechanics to create something new. I absolutely loved this night. Now, unfortunately, that can't be said for the final creepypasta challenge. The final creepypasta challenge is for Eyeless Jack, and no matter how many times I attempt this, I just don't get it. This one brings us back to the tunnels, only this time with a much more confusing mechanic. We need to run around listening for footsteps and somehow catch Eyeless Jack, all while having the lights off in order to take a picture of him. And we need to do this like 8 times, but no matter how hard I try, I can't even get a single picture of this dude. I don't know though, maybe I'm just missing something here, so let me know down below if you guys struggled with this one as much as I did. Anyways, with all of those challenge nights wrapped up, that concludes Oblitus Casa. Oblitus Casa is definitely a massive step up from Five Nights at Treasure Island. The gameplay mechanics in this game are way more fleshed out and much more fun to navigate. There are more characters you need to deal with as well as more unique gameplay situations the player is put into. Everything is presented perfectly with smooth gameplay in every section for the most part, as well as beautiful graphics and animations. The story, while still needing some work, did keep my interest throughout the runtime of the game, and it does still have me looking forward to part 3. There was also so much post-game content, in the form of these challenges and also the custom night. With all of this being provided for free by the Radiance team, I don't see how anyone could give this game a hard time. Sure, some things could have been executed better, but this is an excellent fan game and I cannot wait for the third installment in the series. Let me know what you guys think of the game in the comments down below though. Where would these two titles fit on your FNAF fan games tier list? And are you interested in me covering the third game on the channel. Anyways, with all of that being said, that is it from me. Thank you all so much for watching once again, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. You know what you did? His head could easily be broken by my foot. A little while back, I received early access to one of the most anticipated FNAF fan games of the year. And after playing it, I can say without a doubt that this is the scariest FNAF fan game I have ever played. If you aren't familiar with Grizzlies, it is a FNAF fan game that was released a few years back. The game gained a lot of popularity due to its very unique and polarizing story. And now in 2023, with a Grizzlies 2 on the way, developer Lester Tellez, along with a few very talented people have remade the original Grizzlies in VR, bringing more immersion to the original entry while also adding new cutscenes, visuals, and gameplay features. With how good Grizzlies 2 is looking, I eventually wanted to check out the original game, and now thanks to this remake, I was able to do that for the first time. So, if you want to see why this is the scariest FNAF fan game I have ever played, then join me as we look into Grizzlies VR. Also quick disclaimer guys, I did get early access to this game, however I'm sharing my complete and honest thoughts. If this game was bad, I would have told you guys, it just so happens that this is truly an amazing fan game. Also if you have a VR headset, I seriously recommend checking out the game for yourself before watching this video, as it's going to contain major spoilers. Anyways, with that being said, enjoy the video. Immediately when beginning the game, we are brought to the main menu. We have an old CRT TV in front of us, as well as different VHS tapes. These are used to navigate throughout the menu, which I find very cool. Also in front of us is of course Grizzly, who looks absolutely horrifying staring us down in the menu. The menu also fills with more characters as the game progresses, but you'll see that later on. 
Just the vibe of this whole menu is very eerie, the way the main theme plays as all of the animatronics watch over you. After putting in the night one tape, we load into our office. Very similar to the original Grizzlies, we have a door to our right and a door to our left. Each has a lever to close them, however, we don't get a light like a traditional FNAF fan game. Also in front of us is a monitor which we can use to watch over the different animatronics. We do have a power meter though, so it's best to not spam this thing, only using it when we most need it. We control the cameras by using a knob at the top right of the screen and can also use a knob beneath that one to zoom in and out. One really cool thing about the cameras in this game is that they are actually rendered in real time, meaning we can actually see Grizzly and the other animatronics move, which is seriously terrifying, especially seeing this clown guy twitching towards the camera. Something about his design is just so creepy to me. As we begin night one, we receive a phone call. The guy on the phone welcomes us to Grizzly's burger joint and tells us that he built the place alongside his father over 10 years ago after something tragic happened in his life. I built the Grizzlies Burger Joint establishment from deep in the ground to sky high with my dear father almost a decade ago when some agonizing things occurred in my life. Saddening, I, I know, but this, this has been my one and only pride and joy. He claims Grizzlies is his one and only pride and joy, and says he designed the animatronics himself. He then makes it very clear to us to not tamper with any of the animatronics before telling us what to do during our shift. He explains our cameras and our doors to us, but claims we most likely won't need to use them. Sure. He also warns us of these rabbit characters which will appear on the screen and tells us to switch our camera or shut it off if we see one. He then ends the phone call and we are left to survive our very first night at Grizzlies. Now the first thing I want to talk about with this game is the atmosphere. The game makes a very clear effort to make everything as immersive as possible, which really adds to the experience. For example, instead of being able to see what hour we are on, we actually have to look at and read the clock above our monitor, costing us precious time we could have used to watch over the animatronics. Another good example is the phone call. You actually need to hold the phone up to your ear to be able to hear what the phone guy is saying. So if you're hoping he'll give you some advice on how to survive the night, you'll need to manage holding the phone with one hand while also operating the cameras and doors with the other. Which doesn't sound too hard at first, but on the later nights was actually really stressful. There were even times where I would get so overwhelmed that I would have no option but to just hang up the phone in order to survive. The ambient noises that play, accompanied by the ticking of the clock, add a suspenseful dread that lasted throughout the entire night. Also, the moments where I would turn off the monitor to save power, I felt completely vulnerable and was terrified the entire time of the possibility of an animatronic walking in. During night one, we need to monitor three animatronics, Grizzly, Silly Willy, and our rabbits. Grizzly and Silly Willy behave the same way, both coming to either your right or left door. They each have a starting position and then will slowly begin to move towards one of these doors. When approaching your door, they can be seen on the cameras and also heard coming closer. Also, when they are really close to your door, you can actually see them getting near. There were so many close calls where I would open a door prematurely only to see one of the two almost get into my office, which gave me a heart attack every single time. Just these two animatronics alone caused me to panic because the cameras are pretty confusing to understand at first. Trying to figure out which camera leads to the left door and which one leads to the right door had me stressing throughout all of night one. But after getting the hang of it, these two aren't too hard to deal with. After completing night one with just two bars of power to spare, we see the clock hit 6 a.m. After this, we are taken back to the main menu and can now see that the rabbit animatronics are now present, staring us down just like Grizzly is. Oh, but what's this? Another VHS on the table? Crazy. I know I'm not crazy. This is actually the first of this game's absolutely amazing cutscenes. These are all done by Spectre, who if you guys don't know does a lot of really cool FNAF animations, so these were really a treat to see after every single night. In this cutscene, we see Jonathan, the phone guy, filming one of the doors in his office. Grizzly can be seen towering over Jonathan during this whole interaction, which is just so terrifying. He's so little, so fragile. His head could easily be broken by my foot. No, I would ne never. I will ne never. My pride and joy. Am 
my your pride, 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 and joy, Jonathan? Am I? Cause you're my mind. So little, so fragile, you could break so easily compared to me. I wouldn't let that happen. No one can do that to you. You, my, 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 my joy. I'm uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure I understand. Can can you explain? Oh, oh my god! Oh my god! The way Grizzly's voice stutters, along with the incoherency of his sentences, makes this all the more scary. Grizzly claims he would never hurt us, but at the same time sounds so unstable that the fear of him snapping at any second fills the cutscene with so much tension. Our character then reaches for a remote that can be used to close the doors, before Grizzly completely freaks out, yelling and banging around in the halls as red lights emit from his face. During this cutscene, I felt genuine fear of Grizzly as an animatronic more than I have for any other character in a FNAF game. Hearing the loud banging of him freaking out just had me thinking to myself, I really have to go back into that office for night two. There was seriously an amount of dread to move on to the next night that I haven't felt in any other fan game. This was a perfectly done cutscene. The voice performances were amazing, the audio production was executed perfectly, and the visuals were also flawless. 10 out of 10 cutscene, this was seriously amazing. After this, we move on to night 2. We once again get a phone call, although this time it's from someone different. Hello there, Angel. Oh, Angel. You must be asking yourself what you're even doing here at this point, my dear. Oh, dear Angel. You do have some learning to do, don't you? All of this? <laughs> All of this is so you understand exactly what has happened. What you created. All the sufferings, the death that Jonathan had to go through just for you to leave him behind. Saddening, isn't it? So shameful, so no pathetic. For you, that is. And what luck to be able to take advantage of it all. Oh, Angel, I have a plan. A plan that will change the entire world for what you've seen it to be. I have a plan. <laughs> and don't you worry. It'll be for the better. We'll see. After this mysterious person on the phone finishes telling us about his plan, we are on to survive once again, only this time with a new threat. This new threat is Prototype, who has the scariest mechanic in the entire game. Prototype, just like Grizzly, can be monitored on the cameras, however, Prototype is a lot more hidden. You will need to be looking deep into the darkness of the cameras if you plan on spotting them. When Prototype appears outside either your left or right door, you will have a very brief window of time to close that door before Prototype sprints into your room at full speed. When this occurs, you will hear very fast footsteps approaching and will need to react as quick as possible. With this new character introduced, you now must be completely on edge at every second. The way Prototype looks is also just so disturbing. Prototype is seen to be in a glitched out state, causing it to be more jittery and unpredictable than the other animatronics. Besides Prototype though, no new threats are added for Night 2. We now need to survive once again, only this time the animatronics are a lot more active and our power also becomes more scarce. There were so many close calls during this night that gave me so much anxiety when I was trying to survive, especially during the later hours. There's no way for me to really explain how it feels to really be in the game, but when you are there, you experience real moments of true panic. 
After barely grazing through night 2, we can now see Silly Willy has appeared in our office. This dude's design is so unsettling to me. The way it looks almost human with the way it moves as well as its face is just so creepy. We can also see Prototype who is to our left. And just like in game, they can be seen twitching around and just acting unstable. It seriously looks like Prototype could just snap and attack us at any second. Once we get through night 2, we then get our second VHS tape, this one titled Sleep. This cutscene depicts the phone guy Jonathan once again. This time, he can be seen in a small room working on maintenance for Grizzly. You just don't understand, man! I told you! They keep walking around and watching me sleep! This is getting ridiculous! I just want it to be over, man! I'm tired of going to sleepless nights. I I'm tired of telling them to go away. I already took off Grizzly's chest plate, and I'm currently going to try to disassemble them and edit the programming system. This will show the government, the regime, all of them. All the people who think I'm a sniffling old liar that I am telling the truth. These creations I've made are nothing but twisted evil metal that somehow created life. I, n I never intended for them to be this smart. This it was all an accident. I will fix this. <laughs> you know, John, but in the natural. One time you killed that guy for coming into our place. Our pride and joy. A place that is meant to be a happy place. You know what you did. You made it not so Once again, another perfectly done cutscene. The way Grizzly reminds Jonathan of his past actions is a really cool reveal for the narrative, and the scream Grizzly lets out afterwards is just as terrifying as it was in the first cutscene. These scenes do a really good job of depicting Grizzly as an uncontrollable monster that Jonathan no longer has agency over. It also serves as an amazing way to tell us about Jonathan's past in an interesting and scary way. We not only learn new things about the story, but also see things happen right in front of us. Also the voice acting and visuals are yet again just so amazing. After that tape ends, we now move on to the third and final night of the game. As soon as we begin night 3, we receive a phone call from a brand new phone guy once again. In this call, we learn that we are playing as Jonathan's friend, Angel. The guy on the phone tells us that we abandoned our friend before then telling us that our actions have consequences. The game acts like we should recognize who this is, however, I actually couldn't figure out who it was on my first playthrough. Well, turns out, this is actually the President of the United States. Yeah, bet you didn't expect that one. I'm not sure if this is because I didn't play the original Grizzlies, which did have different cutscenes, but I just had no idea that's who it actually was until I clarified it with the developer. During Night 3, no new threats are added, so once again we have to survive against the same threats, only this time with much harder AI. We need to conserve power as much as possible during this night, using the monitor for barely any time at all. There were so many close calls because of the lack of information I would have gotten on the cameras, which made this night very 
very stressful. Also, during one of my attempts, out of nowhere, this happened. I was not expecting this at all, and after I realized my lever was gone, all I could do was sit there and hopelessly wait for Grizzly or Silly Willy to wander into my office. A random event like this that can happen without warning brings so much immersion and horror to the game, because the surprise of it all caught me so off guard, and made me feel like the animatronics attacking me were capable of much more than just standing at the doorway. This was a night full of pure tension from start to finish. There isn't one moment where you feel at ease, especially during the time when you have your camera off, which for night 3 is most of the night. After getting through the third and final night, we return to the menu for one last time, and once again discover a brand new VHS tape. This one titled, It Takes Guts. If I could make disappear, I would. It's absolutely sick! Why would someone out of all places want to come here? I can't. Yes, you can. You can the guts, John. In this cutscene, we once again see Jonathan's POV. He is holding back a door which someone is banging on, asking them why they would even want to come here. Jonathan yells at this person banging on the door to get lost, before Grizzly stands up right behind him, telling him to do it. Jonathan looks down at a knife in his hands, telling Grizzly he can't. But Grizzly tells Jonathan he can, stating, You have the guts, John. The homeless man then breaks through the door before Jonathan begins to violently stab the man multiple times, before the VHS tape cuts to Grizzly's face. So yeah, this cutscene depicts the actions Jonathan committed mentioned in the previous VHS tape. This does raise a lot of questions however. Was this homeless person the first murder that took place at Grizzly's? Is this the man that possesses Grizzly? And how is that possible if Grizzly seems to be already possessed? These are all questions I have for the narrative that I hope are answered in the soon upcoming Grizzly short film, which is set to debut soon on Spectre's channel. So far, I am extremely engaged in this story and really like the direction it's taking, so I'm super stoked to check out this short film whenever it releases. Once again, the direction this cutscene took is fantastic. The fact that we are actually shown the murder firsthand is something you don't see a lot in fan games. I'm really used to fan games using the tell not show method when coming up for a narrative for obvious budget and resource reasons. But to see a FNAF fan game story fully actualized with really beautifully rendered and directed cutscenes is just so sick. Now unfortunately that is where the game ends, however I honestly think that's not a problem. Not every fan game needs to be 5 nights long and if the game is able to spread its mechanics and story over a 3 night span more efficiently, then I think that was the better move for the game. Also after completing the game we are given access to a custom night which I have not been able to beat yet. as well a really cool extras menu which we can navigate through the CRT TV. Overall, I think the Grizzlies VR is a fantastic FNAF fan game. The production value behind every aspect of this game cannot be overlooked. And with a short and sweet story that can be completed within a few hours, I would recommend this to any FNAF fan that has a VR headset. The graphics and animations present are truly stunning. All of the mechanics are engaging and had me stress the entire runtime, and all of the story elements kept me engaged with the narrative throughout my entire playthrough. My only real complaint I would have for the game would be the confusion I experienced for the first time I heard the night 2 and 3 phone calls. I think it should be made a little more obvious who we are playing as, as well as who is talking to us on the phone throughout the various nights. I also wish we would have gotten more of a conclusion for our protagonist Angel, as the game kind of seems to just forget about him after night 3. There was no intro showing us applying for the job, and also no outro of us receiving our paycheck. 
So we are left completely in the dark with what happened to us after night 3. It seems like Angel takes a backseat in the story, serving more as a vessel for us to learn more about Jonathan. This is still an amazing FNAF fan game though, and is truly the scariest one I have ever played. Let me know what you guys think though. Did you enjoy Grizzlies VR, and are you looking forward to Grizzlies 2? Anyways, with that being said, that is it for me guys. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. The other week I was looking around on Game Jolt for new FNAF fan games to play when I stumbled across one that I've been putting off for a really long time, that game being Teelerland. Despite this game's extremely high quality screenshots as well as its promising direction, I had never actually gotten around to playing the game for myself. That was until recently when I decided to download the game and jump in completely blind to see if this fan game really is all that good. And after completing it for myself, I can safely say that Teelerland is a criminally underappreciated fan game that does so many unique things, not only design wise but also with its gameplay. The visuals are some of the best I've ever seen. The gameplay mechanics are all fresh and unique, and the story ties the whole experience together with its nicely animated cutscenes and voice acting. Also the game ends on a really cool final night, but you'll have to stay around till the end of the video to hear me talk about that. Anyways, if you're interested in hearing why this FNAF fan game is seriously underappreciated, then join me as we dive into the world of Teelerland. Right when we launch the game, we immediately get a cutscene showing us the withered remains of the Teeler animatronic. We then see Teeler come to life and begin to look around, before the cutscene ends and we are taken to the title screen. You can usually tell how polished a fan game is by how well done the menu is, and well, this game is no exception, with all of the menus being excellently done, but I'll get more into that later. After clicking new game, we get some needed context to the game's story. Years have passed since the unfortunate closure of the Teelerland Amusement Park, founded by you, David Artell, along with your brother Teal. The reasons for the closure were never fully disclosed. Since then, you both have moved on and gone separate ways. After all of this time, the park still stands, abandoned, untouched, until now. Someone familiar has called. After this, we see our protagonist David pick up a phone as a voice tells him to come and find him. David then puts on a Teeler mask before the title screen appears. Seriously, a really well done cutscene that got me super excited to jump into this fan game. After that, the cutscene is immediately followed by the footsteps of David as he approaches the Teelerland amusement park. We then load into our very first free roam section where we are given a tutorial screen. Welcome to Teelerland, a now abandoned, lifeless amusement park untouched, unwanted. When you are ready to go beneath, find a way into the storage facility hiding below. From here we are able to look around the game's very well rendered environments as we look around for the secret entrance. The atmosphere is very dark, with creepy cardboard cutouts of animatronics surrounding us. When going to our right, we also get a very brief glance at one of the animatronics haunting the amusement park. After moving some suspiciously placed trash bags, we find the entrance to the hidden storage facility and make our way down. This brings us to a ladder minigame section where we will need to make our way down while also making sure we survive against Teeler. Teeler gives off a faint audio cue every time he appears and will need to be flashed with the flashlight in order to prevent him from killing us. This is a very easy section to start the game but I still found it really cool. It's a good first chance to see the main animatronic we are going against and it also makes the journey to the underground facility more impactful. Also the animations and UI design in this section are just so polished, which help make the section that much better. After reaching the bottom of the ladder, we then load into the main menu of the game, and this main menu might just be the best menu I've seen in a FNAF fan game. Now let me explain. On this menu, we have four tabs, level select, characters, lore pages, and upgrades. Not only are the levels laid out in a really easily accessible and understandable way, but we are also able to read up on the animatronics mechanics in case we forgot something. Read into the hidden lore pages scattered around the game's various levels, as well as use our upgrade points we gain from beating the knights on hard mode. I'll talk more in depth on the hard mode and the upgrades later, but for now let's just dive into the tutorial.
In this tutorial, we get a brief rundown of our office as well as how to complete each night. What makes this fan game very unique from other fan games is instead of the nights being time based, they are actually based on how fast you can complete them. We have a checklist of animatronics we need to capture using our luring device before we are able to clock out and end our night. As for our office, there are three rooms. The main room with our computer and checklist in it, the connecting hallway where animatronics will attack us, and then the supply room where we can build our lure, check on maintenance, and use our first aid kit. Because yes, this game actually does have a health system. During each night, we'll need to make our way to the supply closet where we can find three parts for our lure. We can then build this lure and control it on the computer in the main room. To lure animatronics to their respective rooms, we will need to move our lure over to the animatronics on this grid. They will try to move away from us, but as we stay close by, their meter will slowly fill. Once full, the animatronic will now follow us, and we can lead them to one of the rooms to trap them in, before marking them off on our checklist and ending the night. It is also important to mention that the door connecting the main room to the supply closet has a keyhole, which we are able to peek through in order to monitor some of the animatronics. Also every once in a while, our lure will glitch out and become corrupted, and to fix this, we will need to use our panel in the supply closet and click whichever file says Zanny on it in order to repair the corruption. More gameplay elements are introduced as the nights go on, but I'll talk about those on their respective nights. During night one, we are only given one task, and that is to contain Teeler. We do this by first going over to the supply closet and building our lure, before using him to attract Teeler and leading him into the containment room. We can then check off this task on our notebook and clock out of our very first night. Now, night one is extremely easy and can be beaten in literally like 30 seconds, but trust me, the difficulty ramps up a lot in the later nights. As for Teeler's mechanics, he will appear in the hallway connecting the main room and supply closet. If you happen to run into him when you are switching through rooms, make sure you leave the room as fast as possible in order to avoid him killing you. If Teeler makes his way into the hallway and you don't see him, he will then move up to the keyhole where he can be seen peeking through. If this occurs, back out of the keyhole so that you are not staring back at him and wait for him to go away. His mechanics are very simple on their own, but once mixed in with the other animatronics, it can lead to some very chaotic gameplay. After finishing night one, we get to hear some dialogue of a mysterious character talking. With enough effort, you can take control of anything. An ability far more powerful than any other. After this, we have the choice of either moving on to night 2 or playing night 1's hard mode. Also, by the way, I know they are hours and not nights, but I'm just gonna call them nights for simplicity. Anyways, beating one of these hard mode nights rewards us with 2 upgrade points which can be spent in the upgrade shop on things such as increased range during the lure sections or more visibility, which were extremely helpful during my playthroughs. As for what actually changes for the hard mode nights, not much. The screen now has a darker red tint to it, which makes it a little harder to see. The computer now requires a password every time we want to use it, slowing us down a lot. And the night also has more aggressive AI. Although for night one, which has such little threats in the first place, even hard mode is still a cakewalk. What I love so much about this game though is thanks to its non-time based gameplay, it is a lot more replayable than the typical FNAF fan game. 
because you are able to finish the knights in 30 seconds to a minute if you know what you are doing, which makes you a lot more willing to go back in on these hard mode challenges and give them a shot. Night 2 introduces us to two new animatronics, those being Willow and Frill. Willow is an ambient threat, meaning that she is not one that needs to be lured away like Teeler. Willow will every once in a while appear in the hallway, letting out a laugh whenever she does. When this occurs, we will have a limited amount of time to make our way into the hallway and stare at Willow directly to get her to go away. Failing to do this quick enough or leaving when we are in the room with her will result in us being jump scared. Willow can be seen on the computer as well, but will have a yellow icon instead of a red one, meaning we do not need to lure her. She is also unable to infect our lure, so we don't need to avoid her on the grid. The second animatronic introduced in Night 2 actually is a lureable threat, and that is Frill. Frill is kind of a mix of both Teeler and Willow. Frill shares the same attack as Teeler, appearing either in the hallway or in the keyhole. However, to get rid of Frill, we need to stare at him long enough for him to go away as opposed to avoiding him. Frill actually does need to be contained on the computer before finishing the night, and can also infect our lure if we stay too close to him for too long on the grid. Night 2 is definitely a little bit of a learning curve with the addition of being able to be infected during the computer sections, as well as the need to listen in for more sound cues. However, it still isn't too hard and the night can be beaten in less than a minute once again if you know what you are doing. Also now with more animatronics in the mix, I think it's a good time to mention that these animatronics seriously look great. Not only are their designs very unique and really creepy, but the animations they do whenever you come face to face with them in the hallway or in the keyhole are seriously so well done. Also, the jump scares are just as well made. I mean, seriously, these are some of the best I've ever seen. Speaking of jump scares, some of the animatronics don't actually kill you in one hit and will actually leave you with a little bit of health left to spare. When this occurs, we are able to make our way to the supply closet and use the med kit to heal, which may sound too easy. Easy, but on the later nights, it's actually really hard to make it to the supply closet safely, especially when your vision and hearing are severely limited. After finishing night 2, we once again get a short little cutscene. His machines have far greater potential than what they were made for, sitting in this facility, rotting away. I will put them back together. Now moving on to night 3, we are introduced to one new animatronic, that being Tacy. Tacy is another lureable threat that we will now be required to contain before moving on to the next night. Just like Frill, Tacy will either appear in the hallway or in the keyhole and will need to be looked at in order to get her to go away. Unlike Frill, however, Tacy has a completely different sound cue which is much quieter, so we will now need to be listening a lot more closely when trying to get through this night. Night 3 is where the difficulty really starts to creep up because now we need to contain three different animatronics. On the previous nights, we were able to just completely ignore everything and try to contain the two animatronics before anyone else attacked. However, this strategy no longer works. With how long some of the animatronics take to be lured, you are for sure gonna have to repair your computer at least once during this night. Every trip to the supply closet is a huge risk because you need to make sure you know which animatronics are in the halls and also remember their respective mechanics in order to survive. Also for night 3, we are introduced to a brand new mechanic in the form of a generator. Basically the facility's power now has a meter which can be seen in the top left. The meter runs down rather fast, however unlike typical FNAF fan game power, we actually are able to get some back. We can do this by collecting a gas can with our lure animatronic on the computer and bringing it to this generator. This can be pretty time consuming, especially on the later nights where every second is important, but regardless, it has to be done, as failing to do so will cause this to happen. Yeah, so it's best to just keep that generator running. Once we complete night 3, we get our post-night dialogue where we learn more about the animatronics at this location. They were meant to be taken apart, modified, tampered with. He should have known. One day it would all be compromised.
Night 4 brings in the last two animatronics the game has up until the final boss on Night 6. These two animatronics being Mischievous and The Doll. Mischievous, much like Willow, is another ambient animatronic, meaning we don't need to contain him to get through the night. Mischievous will appear in the hallway every once in a while and will announce his presence through a music box which will play. We need to make sure we don't go into the hallway while he's there, which isn't too hard, as the music box is one of the loudest sound cues in the entire game. While Mischievous is in the hallway though, he will place down the other character, The Doll, in one of two places, either the supply closet or our main office. So after Mischievous makes his departure, we will need to be on the lookout for this doll, and make sure to click on him fast enough, as failing to do so will get us jump scared, resulting in our character beginning to bleed out. This mechanic is actually pretty tricky, as when you're dealing with all the other stressful mechanics, it can be easy at time to forget this character even exists, and you'll find yourself randomly getting jump scared by the doll at the least expected times. This was definitely Definitely the hardest night for me as the learning curve of balancing every single character while also trying to contain all three animatronics had me stressing so badly. This was also the first night where I wasn't able to beat the hard mode version so that should say something about its difficulty. After night 4 is over we get some very short dialogue once again. One more step until the plan is complete. The clock is ticking. For night 5, like I said, there is no new animatronics added, so instead this night serves as a final test of your abilities. All of the animatronics AI is ramped up really high, making this the most chaotic night of the game for sure. I actually struggled on this one quite a bit before I got a really lucky run and managed to lure all of the animatronics without even checking the hallway. After finishing night 5, we hear our last piece of dialogue before moving on to night 6. It is complete. I fixed them. I have made them perfect. They are all together now. They are now one. It will lure the beast out of his cage. Surprisingly similar to the final night of Juniors, now all of the animatronics have combined into one, the deterrent, and it is our job to stop this animatronic to get through the night. For this night, we are actually in a new location which is this sort of cave area. In front of us are two entrances, one on the right and one on the left both of which we can flash with our flashlight. Behind us is a computer screen where we are able to open four doors as well as charge four generators. When charging a generator, our screen will go black and we will become vulnerable to the deterrent, so we will need to make sure we are listening for any sound cues. Upon hearing that the deterrent is attacking, we need to turn around and shine our light on them to get them to go away. When a generator is charged to 100, it will actually explode, damaging the deterrent. So to get through night six, we need to charge the generator up almost to full, open the door and leave the deterrent in, and then charge the generator to max to blow up the animatronic. We then need to do this four times while also trying our best to survive. Also in the mix is a ghost version of Teeler, I'm pretty sure, who will every once in a while appear in either of the rooms to distract us. When we see him, all we need to do is quickly turn in the other direction to get rid of him, as failing to do so causes him to put this very disorienting effect on our screen. Just like the previous nights, this night is also riddled with amazing looking animations of the characters walking around, and a really well done jump scare. After we actually blow up all four generators and destroy the deterrent, we are then set to walk free, and we get to see the ending of the game.
despise. Don't you want me gone? For all the times I tried to fix your wrongdoings, I have already lost. So go ahead, Dane. Free. Going into Tealer Land, I already had high expectations just based on the screenshots alone. But after finishing the game for myself, I can say without a doubt that this game outdid my expectations. Everything you could ever ask for in a fan game is here, plus more. There is unique and interesting gameplay that is expanded on as the nights progress. An interesting story which kept me hooked throughout the entire runtime of the game. Amazingly well done graphics and animations that make the whole experience feel extremely polished and all the other miscellaneous things you could expect in a fan game, like extras and a custom night. Also, the new unique things this game introduces, like the level select screen with optional hard modes which reward you with upgrades, as well as the task-based nights opposed to time-based, made this game really stand out amongst the vast sea of fan games out there on Game Jolt. I'm really curious to hear your guys' thoughts on the game though. Let me know down below in the comments, did you enjoy this game as much as I did? Also, a quick update on the channel for anyone still sticking around, I'm going to be trying to broaden the topics of this channel to more than just FNAF fan games, so to start that off, I'll be releasing a review of Security Breach Ruin after that is released, so stay tuned for whenever I drop that video. Anyways, that is it from me guys, I hope you all enjoyed the video, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. Final Nights is a series of FNAF fan games that I have been suggested to play countless times on my channel. Being a 3D FNAF fan game with 4 different entries in the series, I always knew I eventually wanted to get around to checking out these games, exploring its unique takes on gameplay, looking deep into the game's story and lore, and overall just seeing if these games still hold up. Instead of covering just one game at a time though, I wanted to make a much larger scale video where I go in depth on all of these games at once. And with the end of the year finally coming around, I thought what better time to sit back and dive deep into one of the most highly talked about and content rich FNAF fan game series there is to play. So if that sounds interesting to you, then join me as I dive deep into every FNAF Final Nights game in the series. <laughs> Final Nights 1 is of course the first game in the series, releasing all the way back in February of 2016, and being one of developer Jelly Liam's first projects, the game's quality definitely is lacking in some areas. That does not mean that the game is not interesting at all to look at however, as many of the decisions made in this first entry, along with the game's story and many confusing glitches, actually made this one of the more fascinating games in the series to look into. The game opens up with a cutscene from the perspective of Fredbear. We see him look over to his left where we can also see Spring Bonnie on stage. There is also some text in the corner reading, Machine, Fredbear, status, in need of repair, battery level, unknown, current activity, idle. After this, the camera pans to show more of the building. The place looks worn down, although because of how dark the restaurant is, it's hard to tell which location we are at. We do know that the Final Nights games play with the already established canon of the FNAF series. Well, whatever was established back in 2016. So if I had to guess, I would say that we are probably at the FNAF 1 pizza before the cutscene ends though, the camera pans to the right, revealing this game's version of the puppet, who appears out of the air in a ghostly manner before
before flying towards the camera. This is where Final Nights 1 begins. The first cutscene still leaves us very much in the dark. We get to see around when this game takes place in the overall timeline, but don't really get much detail beyond that. Also, we are able to see one single animatronic on the menu, that being Fredbear, who seems to be the main focus of this first game. After pressing new game, we are greeted by yet another cutscene. My name is Mike S. Schmidt. I've been investigating Freddy's for a long time now, and finally got in as a night guard. This might be my chance to discover what happened to... him. Judging by the first few lines of dialogue, we can see that this game takes place during FNAF 1. We play as Mike, who is searching Freddy's for a person who is not named. Although I'm guessing it's Mike's younger brother. During the cutscene, we see Mike run out of power, almost being jump scared by Freddy, before he dodges out of the way and moves to the side. After this, we see a puppet-like character new to the Final Night series named The Brother, who emerges from Freddy in a ghostly manner, much like in that first intro cutscene. The appearance of The Brother scares Mike, prompting him to turn around and run, eventually making it back to his house, before discovering that The Brother has followed him home. Damn, he's here! <laughs> He didn't seem to like my flashlight all too much. This is where Night 1 begins, where we will be tasked with defending ourselves against this new character, the brother. Overall though, this was a pretty interesting introduction. The game builds up mystery behind this brand new puppet character, who has been retconned into the already existing FNAF timeline. It's also just really cool seeing developers fill in the blanks of the FNAF story with their own interpretations of what happened with the characters. Anyways, enough story talk for now, let's talk about the gameplay. Because oh boy do I have a lot to say for this first night. Night 1 puts us in the living room of Mike's house. We are able to look towards various sections of the room similar to FNAF 4. We have a door to our left, a door to our right, a TV in the middle, and a cupboard behind us, which we need to keep track of. Throughout the night, we must defend ourselves against the one and only threat, the brother, who will approach us through various different entrances. To stop the brother from killing us, all we need to do is look in the direction he is in and press space to flash our light. What this night mostly comes down to is listening for sound cues. Each area of the building has a different sound, making it easy to know where the puppet is if you've learned the night properly. If you hear the door creak, that means the brother is at the right door. If you hear static, the brother is on the TV. If you hear high-pitched static, Static, that means the brother is at the left door. And if you hear high pitched static and a door creak, then the brother will be behind you. The gameplay sounds really easy on paper, but it can actually be pretty confusing when you first start out. The fact that the sound for the brother being behind you is the two other sound cues combined, I think was a really good idea, as it confuses the player and forces them to be actively listening throughout the entire night. Also, when looking in a certain direction, it takes a while for our character to look back, meaning we need to be very careful careful to not accidentally look in the wrong direction. Doing so could waste just enough time to get us killed. We need to survive for around 6 minutes before the night abruptly ends and our gameplay is interrupted by a cutscene. Still though, even with all that, Night 1 doesn't sound too bad. Well, it wouldn't be if it wasn't horribly bugged. Sometimes the flashlight will straight up just not work, which kept happening to me. And I cannot tell you how many times I died like this. It's pretty insane to me that the one singular mechanic used in Night 1 is bugged, but hey, this was one of the devs' first games, so I'll let it slide. One last praise I want to mention though before moving on to Night 2 is that instead of showing us a timer like in other FNAF fan games, we instead hear a grandfather clock after every single hour. If you guys have seen my other FNAF fan game reviews, I'm sure you know by now that I'm a huge fan of finding in-universe ways to explain HUD elements and this grandfather clock is a perfect solution to that. Not only does it make the game more immersive, but it also serves as a small auditory distraction when we are busy listening for the brother's next move. This night is 6 minutes long, with each minute counting as an hour. Unfortunately though, because of the glitched flashlight and how long the night is, there is literally a 0% chance of me getting through this first night without the game bugging out. Luckily though, when the dev re-uploaded this game to Game Jolt, he actually uploaded the 100% 
save file version. Meaning I was still able to move on to night 2 and see the rest of what this game has to offer. Before moving on to the second night though, we need to see the post night 1 cutscene. If you do manage to, by some miracle, finish night 1, the gameplay is quickly interrupted by the brother. Mike looks up to see the brother flying above him. The brother then flies closer to us as an image of a pizzeria faintly appears on our screen. Mike questions if the brother was trying to tell him something by showing him this location, and decides to investigate it himself. This begins night 2, which is titled The Prologue. This night starts off right where the last one left off, with Mike entering the pizzeria. We are set free to roam around the place, looking at old arcade machines and animatronic stages. Around the building are also a few different posters, all which appear to be from Fred Bear's family diner. After making it through some debris, we find ourselves in a back room of the building. In this room, we can see Fred Bear and Spring Bonnie plushies along a table, as well as a withered Freddy, who seems to be decommissioned on the floor. Also in this room, is a paper which reads 835, which is some sort of code that as far as I know is never used later in the game. After grabbing this paper, we are able to go through the door and into the next room. And this is where the true gameplay for night 2 begins. This night has us in an escape room type area where our mission is to use different items scattered around the room to find our way out. While doing this, we need to deal with two different threats. Springtrap and Golden Freddy. Springtrap acts like a weeping angel, which is a very common mechanic for free roam FNAF fan games, mostly thanks to the joy of creation. We need to keep our eyes on Springtrap while attempting to escape the room, as not looking at him for long enough will result in him making his way closer and closer until he eventually kills us. As for Golden Freddy, he works a lot differently. In this room, there are holes in the ceiling, specifically one in the main room and one in the side room. Whenever we hear a sound cue of wooden boards creaking, that means that Golden Freddy is ready to attack. Upon hearing this sound cue, we need to check both holes in the ceiling, so we can shine our flashlight on him to scare him off. While trying to survive, there are also many different things we need to do to escape this room. We first begin by grabbing a key off the table, which is used to open a back room. In this back room, we discover an endoskeleton covered in blood, alongside a door that only opens during show hours. Also in this room, is a Fazbear token found in a bucket off to the side. We can use this Faz token to open up a generator room for the main stage curtain. We are then able to attach a generator found in the main room to it, and after that we can use a key obtained by using the claw machine to open another locked door in the generator room. This grants us access to a lever used to turn on the main stage. From here we are able to activate that stage and enter the previously locked door. It's here that we find a pendulum to a grandfather clock. After doing all of this, we can finally use a crowbar which is found in the generator room to knock the wood off of this door. And this is where the stage is meant to end. All we need to do now is enter the room and place the pendulum on this grandfather clock. But most of the time, you can't. The problem is, just like in the prologue, this night is extremely glitchy. It may sound pretty easy when I'm explaining it, but that just couldn't be further from how it actually felt when playing it. First of all, there is no tutorial, meaning this section is pure trial and error. I spent my first couple painstakingly long attempts just figuring out what to do, which is already brutal enough when you realize that you have to rewatch the entire intro cutscene every single time you fail. But that's only half the battle. Sometimes Springtrap would randomly kill me without even moving. And that's not even where it ends. For some reason, every time you open up a door or interact with anything, your character is temporarily frozen. Meaning if you decide to do an action moments before Golden Freddy appears, you're screwed. Also, I can't even name the amount of times Golden Freddy would kill me when I couldn't even see him. And you also have all the times I was jump scared during unskippable cutscenes. Also, why the f*** does pressing W on the main menu make the Freddy in the background start moving? <sighs> So yeah, as you can see, this game is very buggy. In all seriousness though, this section could have been pretty good. There are some cool concepts here. First of all, the concept of having escape room type gameplay in a small closed down environment works very well for free roam FNAF fan games. 
As seen in the glitched attraction, if done properly, it allows the game to have fair, challenging gameplay that has more depth than just something like open world free roam levels. Also, I actually really like the idea of turning Springtrap into a weeping angel. Although it wasn't executed the best in this game, and the mechanic has been done to death, I still find the concept to just be horrifying. Especially when it's with a character like Springtrap instead of the usual endoskeletons. Just knowing that there is a real person inside this animatronic makes it all the more creepy when you are just staring them down. Oh yeah, also during one of my attempts, I accidentally locked myself in one of the back rooms, and well, this happened. Anyways, after finishing this insanely broken section, we trigger another cutscene. We see Mike, for whatever reason, attach the pendulum we found in the spare room to the grandfather clock, before running out of the room. The generator then suddenly explodes, setting the pizzeria on fire. After this, we wake up in one last gameplay section where we need to escape the building, dodging around debris and huge flames. We run towards the exit of the pizzeria before suddenly Fredbear picks Mike up and bites him. The brother once again approaches Mike before the credits roll, and we see the entire pizzeria burned down. Now, while this fan game was not the greatest and definitely did suffer from game breaking bugs, not everything here is bad. Looking past the buggy gameplay, sometimes janky looking visuals, and overall lack of polish, it's clear that the developer of this game at least had a vision. Not only does this game make an effort to establish a storyline, but also executes upon some pretty original gameplay ideas, shows us key moments in a story forming around this series, and also sets up further ideas to be expanded on in more entries. With that being said, let's now move on to Final Nights 2 the second game in the series, to see how much the game improved and also take a look at where Jelly Liam decided to take the story. Alright, so the next game up in the series is Final Nights 2 Sins of the Father. As soon as the game starts up, we get a look into what this sequel is going to be about. We can see the four main animatronics, who now seem to be burnt severely after the events of the previous game. Is it just me, or are these designs straight out of the joy of creation? Also, Burnt Bonnie is hilarious, bro is just a leg and torso. After pressing play, we get to see a quick intro cutscene. This cutscene opens in 1992 at Fredbear's family diner directly after the place burned down. We see through the perspective of a firefighter whose partner seems to be calling him. Huh? I can't hear you. Hang on, I'll come over. What the hell? Hey guys, I found something. Uh huh. <laughs> After this, we get a flashback from five years earlier, and we are now in the perspective of William Afton, and are given a choice. Either wear the Fredbear costume or the Spring Bonnie one. This was immediately just so cool to me. Giving us the choice makes these cutscenes so much more interesting, and the way events unfold differently depending on which suit you wear is so cool to see. On my first playthrough, I of course had to go with the iconic Spring Bonnie suit. After making our choice, the cutscene ends, and night one begins. Right when the night begins, we immediately get a phone call, but not from someone else. Instead, the phone call is coming from ourself, something that has never been done before as far as I know for a FNAF fan game. We learn that William has amnesia, and after every week forgets most of what happened. So the phone calls we hear in this game are actually reminders made by William for himself, which is definitely interesting. As for the gameplay in night one, it is much different from what we experienced in the first game. This one once again takes place in a home, although this one seems to be in an upstairs room. William brought the animatronics home after the fire had taken place, and now it is up to us to survive from their attacks. 
We have six cameras in front of us, which are laid out in a very confusing manner. Unlike most fan games, we can see all the cameras at the same time, but figuring out which camera shows what room definitely does take some getting used to. We're also able to turn to our left to check on a cabinet, turn right to check the two vents which can only be closed one at a time, and we can also turn around to either flash the hallway or run up and close the door. Right away, this night was immediately giving me heavy joy of the creation vibes, specifically the final night. Not only did the final night of the Joy of Creation also take place in the upstairs room of a house, but it also had very similar vent mechanics which involves timing when to close each side in order to prevent both threats from getting in. One pretty annoying thing about this gameplay though is the controls, which are extremely disorienting. This gameplay is much like FNAF 4, having us check different areas of our room to survive. But unlike that game that has us clicking where we want to go, we now use our keyboard. We use A to turn to our left, but what makes it confusing is that instead of pressing D to look back to our right, we instead need to press A again. This gets super confusing because you'll find yourself having to press the opposite button in order to go to a place you want to go. This becomes even more of an issue when you realize that the walking animation is decently long and can cost you a run if you are pressing the wrong input. Foxy is the first animatronic we need to deal with. He can be seen in the top left camera walking into this doorway, which means he is now in our hallway. Upon seeing this, next time we hear breathing, we must run to the door and close it. Once we hear another sound cue of Foxy leaving, we can safely return to the front of the room. The second character we need to deal with for night one is the brother, who is once again tormenting us. Much like the first game, the brother needs to be flashed with our flashlight. So throughout the night, we need to consistently check to our left in this cabinet to flash the brother and return him to his original position. For the last character we need to deal with for night one, we have Burnt Freddy. Burnt Freddy will be seen on the cameras entering a vent, which is accessible through one one of the bedrooms. Shortly after this, you will be able to hear banging in the vents, meaning you only have a limited amount of time to close the vent and get rid of him. The vents operate on a timer, meaning once you press the button, they will only stay closed for a few seconds before reopening. This means you need to time the closing of the vent pretty well to actually survive. Foxy, Freddy, and the brother are the only threats for night one, which after some learning of the mechanics is very manageable. Before moving on to night two though, I do want to point out how much this game is already a big step up from the first. Not only now do we have proper gameplay mechanics that have been fully fleshed out, but things like the animatronic models, environments, and overall polish have all seen a step up from the first entry. After completing night one, we get to see our first post night cutscene, which like I mentioned earlier is different depending on which costume you chose at the beginning. If we chose the Spring Bonnie suit, the cutscene opens with William in the costume approaching a kid during a birthday party. William asks the kid to follow him, and the kid agrees. After that, the two exchange a few words before the cutscene suddenly ends. If we chose the Fredbear suit at the beginning, however, William will once again be seen approaching the child, before being told by him that we aren't the real Freddy, and that if we don't go away, he'll tell his mom. This will come into play later. After this, we begin night two, which is just like night one, with the only difference being that Burnt Bonnie is now thrown into the mix. Much like Burnt Freddy, Bonnie will make his way to you through the vents, only this time going through the right one. Bonnie is a little different from Freddy, however, as when making his way towards your office, he will often get stuck in the vent, which slows him down and makes it much harder to time when to close the vents. This is actually a really cool mechanic because moments when you have both Freddy and Bonnie in the vents can be extremely stressful. Figuring out which vent to close first and timing everything perfectly while also dealing with the other threats takes planning and a deep understanding of the mechanics which just works really well. It also adds a whole new layer to the camera mechanic, as now not only do we need to watch Foxy on the cameras, but also keep track of multiple vent entrances around the home. After finishing night 2, we once again get another cutscene, this one picking up directly where the last one left off. This means that if we chose the Spring Bonnie costume, the cutscene opens with William and the child standing in the back room. We are then given the option to either kill him or not. 
Killing him will continue our path towards the good ending, whereas sparing him will lead us to the bad ending. Yeah, seems a little bit backwards that the ending where William kills multiple children is considered the good ending. If we chose Fredbear during the first cutscene, however, then after Night 2 concludes, we immediately begin Night 3, skipping that sequence entirely. It would have been cool to maybe get a cutscene of something else, that way picking the Fredbear suit wouldn't be completely meaningless, but hey, the fact that this game even has multiple outcomes is already really cool. During Night 3, not much changes. No new animatronics are added, so this night is pretty much the same as the last, only with a slight increase in the animatronics aggressiveness. Now, I think this is a good time to talk about the fact that I'm pretty sure this game's mechanics are scripted. I'm not 100% sure on this, but during my playthroughs, I realized that the nights would play out in a very similar or almost identical way every single time. This does kill replayability and make the game extremely easy for for people who have already beaten it, but it also allows the developer to balance the encounters in the most optimal way. For example, during Night 3, oftentimes Burnt Freddy, Burnt Bonnie, and the brother would attack all at the same time. Moments like this really test your understanding of the game, knowing how long it takes to flash the brother, or which animatronic needs to be attended to first, is a huge part of what makes this game challenging in the first place. Also, at this point, Withered Bonnie's mechanic was very frustrating for me. The delayed cameras on the vents, paired with the sound cues which make you panic, makes Bonnie one of the most threatening animatronics in the game. Night 3 was seriously a struggle. Also, getting jump scared by a torso is crazy. After getting through night 3, it's once again cutscene time. This time we see William emerge from the back room once again. He spots three kids wearing animatronic masks, asking them where they got them from, before chasing the kids and eventually grabbing one, and once again bringing him to the back room, before the cutscene fades to black. This cutscene surprisingly plays out the same way no matter what suit you have on, most likely because, well, we're not wearing a suit in this cutscene. Funnily enough though, you can actually miss the quick time event on grabbing the kid and completely fail the good ending. This didn't happen to me personally, but I'm sorry to any poor soul that suffered through this because going through the first three nights just for this to happen is crazy. I don't know what it is, but something about seeing Fredbear's family diner and stuff like the kids in the animatronic mask that we only ever see in the mini games be fully rendered in 3D is just so cool. Especially because, at least in my opinion, I think this part of the timeline is where FNAF story is the best. Anyways, now moving on to night 4. This is where we see the introduction of the final animatronic before the boss fight on night 5. That animatronic being Chica. Chica's mechanic is pretty simple on paper. She comes into your hallway just like Foxy, and to get rid of her, all we need to do is shine our light on her, specifically when we hear breathing. This forces the player to pay more attention to the hallway door on the cameras, because without seeing who entered the hallway first, you won't be able to know if you need to close the door or shine the light. After this night ends, we once again and return to the cutscenes, and just like in Night 2, we are given the choice to either kill the kid or not, and this once again dictates which ending we get. Um, look, kid, I'm, um, I'm going to take this mask back. You're, um, you're not allowed to wear these here, and, uh, make sure to go tell your friends about that, okay? Also, once again, if you chose the Fredbear suit at the beginning, this cutscene just doesn't play at all. Alright, so now we're finally moving on to night 5, the final night in the game. And before we even get into the actual night, almost the entire game changes right here. There is a new main menu, which is much darker in setting, accompanied by Fredbear and Spring Bonnie, and weirdly enough, Balloon Boy. The night screen is also different, which matches the new look for the office. It's now raining extremely hard, and in front of us, there is a broken window. The place is also much darker, and attacking us are the three new characters we saw on the menu. This night's gameplay is totally different from the other nights. Spring Bonnie takes the role of both Burnt Freddy and Burnt Foxy, while Fredbear takes the role of Burnt Bonnie, Burnt Chica, and the brother. On top of this, Glitched Balloon Boy is a new threat we have to deal with. 
He comes through the left vent randomly during the night, and if we fail to prevent him from getting in, he will slowly destroy all of our cameras, giving us no way to know where any of the animatronics are. There was actually one pretty crazy attempt I had where I managed to make it to 5am after Balloon Boy had already gotten into my office. So it's not completely impossible to clutch up even if he does get in, but it just makes this extremely hard night even harder. Because of how active the animatronics are on this night, you need to be extremely alert. Listening for every single sound cue and figuring out which threats need to be dealt with in which order. Your timing also needs to be flawless the entire night. If you mess up and take too long on any one task in the game, well then it's game over. This night is also as far as I can tell pretty glitchy. There would be times when I would close the door on Fredbear only to be jump scared by Spring Bonnie. This night is extremely unbalanced and I was honestly thinking I wouldn't be able to get it done. That was until I had a very lucky run where for some reason Spring Bonnie completely stopped attacking early on in the night. Meaning all I had to do was keep track of Fredbear and Balloon Boy. This allowed me to cheese my way through night 5 and move on to the end of the game. Now unfortunately, on my first playthrough I decided to spare the kids, which meant I chose the path to the bad ending. So after the game ended, I got to see what the bad ending was. <laughs> like I need a psychiatrist. Yeah, so in the bad ending, it was all a dream, meaning the entire story was pointless. This is when I realized that to see the actual ending, I was gonna have to beat the game twice. And well, I did exactly that. So if you guys are enjoying the video so far, please consider subscribing. If we play the game again as Spring Bonnie, but this time only kill the first kid, sparing the one with the Bonnie mask, this actually changes the ending to a different bad ending. And in this one, we actually get to see the bite of 83 take place. Don't bring your brother in here. Mike, stop! No. No! Look at what you've done. You're not going to get away with this. Now this is another bad ending, but this one is much better than the original bad ending. In this one, we actually get to see something happen that the story led up to. So I was a lot more satisfied with this ending, but there is also one last cutscene for achieving the good ending. In this cutscene, we see William Afton in a worn down Freddy Fazbear's pizza. We see Shadow Fredbear lead the other animatronics to the dining room, while William sneaks up on them from behind and destroys them. I'm pretty sure this cutscene is depicting what we saw in the minigames of FNAF 3. William continues dismantling the animatronics one by one, finishing with Foxy, before this happens. Where are you? How can you exist? No. No, 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 stay away from me. Stay away from me. Yeah, yeah, the suit, that'll scare them. See? It's me, Bon- We see William get springlocked just like in the FNAF 3 minigames, only this time it's done in the first person perspective. And the one to scare William into putting on the suit is none other than his own son, the brother. This is where the game ends, and I'm actually a pretty big fan of these narrative changes to the original Scott story. It seems like Jelly Liam's approach to this series at this point was to make the notable events of the FNAF series more cohesive as a narrative, and also tie a lot of the characters together, making the 
the story mostly revolve around the Afton family. I think it works pretty well here. Moments like the bite of 83 and the Springlock scene are really cool to see from William's perspective, because we are so used to only hearing about these things or seeing them in 8-bit. Not only was the story a huge upgrade in this game from the first, but also the gameplay. I really liked the puzzle-based aspects, and the way you need to manage all of the animatronics reminded me of a lot of my favorite nights from the Joy of Creation, which is a good thing. The graphics are also a big step up from the first one. They aren't perfect, but they do a good enough job to show what's going on. There are also a few moments where animations look janky or jump scares glitch out, but besides that, everything looks pretty good. Also, this is really impressive for a game made by just one person, especially considering it came out nearly seven years ago. Anyways, that concludes Final Nights 2, so now let's move on to Final Nights 3, Nightmares Awaken. Alright, so now for Final Nights 3, and before jumping into these games, I usually like to go through some of the promotional materials, looking at the Game Jolt teasers, as well as the trailers to get a grasp on what the game's main premises will be, and well, immediately when looking on the Game Jolt for this game, I got extremely hyped, because Final Nights 3 is actually an adaptation of Five Nights at Freddy's 4, showing what happened to the crying child after the events of The Bite of 83. The game opens up with an intro cutscene showing the crying child being taken to the hospital. The whole thing has a very sad, cinematic tone that I'm really not used to seeing in any FNAF game. Like I said, I'm not used to seeing stuff like this in FNAF type games, but I feel like it works surprisingly well here. It feels like the game is taking the events that happen a lot more seriously than most games have, and that honestly got me really excited to see where this story would head. After this, we wake up in the hospital. It's daytime, and talking to us is our Fredbear plushie. This is the tutorial of the game. We are able to press W to get off our bed, and from here we have several options like turning to the left to check on the window, which we are able to run up to and close, or looking to our right to check the hallway door, which we can also run up to. We can also check both the left and right sides of the hallway, as well as close the door by pressing space. We are also able to run up and close this closet right in front of us. Finally, we learn that getting back on the bed and pressing space causes our character to go to sleep. This is the only time we actually progress in the nights, so we will need to make sure we are sleeping when ever we are safe. After this, the tutorial concludes, but before moving on, I just want to quickly say how much I like this environment. Changing the FNAF 4 bedroom to a hospital not only makes much more sense, but it's also just a more unique location for a FNAF fan game to occur. After moving past the tutorial, we get a few small tips from our friend Fredbear. We must sleep to progress. No sleeping if the reapers are in. Scare the puppet away when he's closest. Close the closet. Close the door when my friend is closest. After this, the night begins, and we see the brightly lit hospital turn to night. The tips we got from Fredbear were of course referring to the various threats we face on night one. The first of these threats is Reaper Puppet. Reaper Puppet will be seen through the window on the balcony slowly moving closer to us through stages. If we go up to close the curtain before the puppet has reached its final stage, we will be jump scared, so it's important for us to only close it when the time is right. The other animatronic attacking us during night one is Reaper Spring Bonnie, who is actually a really cool concept for a character. I always found it interesting that the crying child didn't have nightmares about Spring Bonnie, so to see that portrayed here is just really cool to see. Spring Bonnie has one of the most confusing mechanics in the game though. He begins the night at the end of the hallway, and every time he moves it is indicated to us through a sound cue. Upon hearing one of these sound cues, we need to run up to the hallway and flash our flashlight at Spring Bonnie. 
We need to do this for both his first and second stage. After this, he will finally do the sound cue one more time, indicating that he is now in our doorway. This is when we need to run up to the door as quickly as we can and shut it on him. This resets his position back to the beginning, buying us time to get some rest, after dealing with all the other threats. Luckily though, for night one, all we have to worry about other than him is the puppet, so finding time to sleep is pretty easy. But as the nights progress, you will see that it gets harder and harder to juggle Spring Bonnie's mechanics while also worrying about so many other threats. I think the mechanics work well here though. The controls are not as confusing as they were in the previous game, and I also really like the concept of having to choose times to sleep. This creates a whole new dynamic to the gameplay, where you are trying to free up moments where you'll be able to rest for a good amount of time. Despite this being a minor change to the FNAF formula, it actually does a lot to set this game apart from the others. I gotta say though, I'm a huge fan of this game's overall theming. I love the hospital setting and the direction the game took with FNAF 4's ideas. Sadly though, I still feel like FNAF 4 has one thing over this game, and that's the animatronic designs. I really wish I would've liked the designs in this game more, but to be honest, a lot of them come off as more goofy than scary. Which hurts a lot because I really wanted this game to be a darker version of FNAF 4. After the night is over, we see someone unlock a door and enter a room. It seems to be a storage room of some sort, and right in front of us is Reaper Toy Chica. This actually surprised me at first because looking at it, it really reminded me of that Scrap Chica drawing from the survival logbook, but then I remembered that this game came out before that even existed. It's pretty interesting that Toy Chica is a nightmare that the crying child had, but I'm guessing this could be related to the Toy Chica toy that the little girl had in the FNAF 4 minigames. Just like FNAF 4, we are forced to play a minigame Game before proceeding to the next night. Only in this game, Chica is taking the place of Plush Trap. During this mini game, we are supposed to listen for sound cues. We are able to flash to our left, in front of us, and to our right. So it is up to us to figure out where Chica is. Also in the mix is Chica's Cupcake, which will make other sounds to distract us. To be completely honest, I never got the hang of this mini game and wasn't able to complete it a single time. After this though, instead of loading into night 2, we actually get a playable cutscene. During this cutscene, we are still playing as the crying child. We are able to roam around the FNAF 4 house while we are able to hear William and Mrs. Afton arguing in the background. So I'll let the key moments of that cutscene play out now. Your work is running the business. Things were going just fine with just the band. Hey, it's my business. I do that as I please. Creating more characters can be beneficial for marketing purposes. Do you know how many toys Bonnie has sold? Not enough to support us, it seems. We had to give Kevin one of your dumb plush toys for his birthday this year because we couldn't afford a proper gift. And you know how much he hates your characters. He's terrified Honey, of them. He's not. He's just putting on an act so he can come back home and stay in his room all day. Oh, don't turn this against him. I'm not. It's the truth. He plays with those plush toys all day. Do you really think he's scared of them? You know what, Dave? If you can't stop wasting your time on this nonsense and actually start focusing on providing for this family, I will personally shut down your business and move out with the kids. You wouldn't dare. Try me. It may seem a little random to be seeing a cutscene like this, as it doesn't have much to do with the actual gameplay, but as the cutscenes progress, we will see what all of this is eventually leading to. Also, I should point out that she calls him Dave in this cutscene and not William, but according to the wiki, this is just an alias. Now, I'm not really sure how this dude managed to lie about his name to his own wife in legal papers and everything, but hey, I'll just, I'm gonna just let that part slide. After this, we move on to night two with our only tip from Fredbear being that the animatronics are more aggressive. After this, we load into the night and immediately something is different. The lighting is now more red and outside the window, we can see some sort of fire taking place as well as a police car. 
The environmental storytelling this game has is definitely something that stuck out to me throughout this whole game. During night 2 we once again need to protect ourselves against Reaper Spring Bonnie and Reaper Puppet. But also one new threat begins to cause us trouble. That threat being Reaper Balloon Boy. Reaper Balloon Boy slowly creeps his way out of the closet right in front of our bed. He moves in stages and it is up to us to not let him reach that final stage as doing so will get us killed. It's pretty quick to run up and close the closet, but once again, it's just one more thing we need to worry about in an already stressful situation. One last thing I noticed before moving on to the next cutscene is that the jump scares definitely did take a step up in quality from the first game. They are a lot more surprising now, and the animations just look really good. Also, the music you get for the game over screen is really eerie, which I'm a big fan of. It honestly reminds me of something you would hear in like a .exe game or something like that. After finishing night 2, we once again have to play the Chica minigame, before moving on to the next cutscene. This one takes place in the house once again, only this time we see William come into the living room, where he can be seen planning something. But damn, the government won't give me ground to build it on. Damn. Damn! Oh. I guess I'll have to build it. Underground then, yes, yes man. I'll have to cover it up. Wait. I could just build a smaller location on top. They won't ever check into it anyway. They never do here. Ha <laughs> ha! She'll see. Well, she won't now, but... I know she was holding me back. She was trying to keep me from expanding the franchise. No, 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 not anymore. Circus Babies Pizza World. Chica's Party World. It's the perfect cover. I can't lie, some of the evil dialogue that comes from William is hilarious. They definitely went over the top with the acting, and the motivations are really not that believable. But even with all that being said, I just can't bring myself to hate it. Just even seeing these obscure moments like when William decides to start construction on Sister Location actually be animated and voice acted is just so interesting to me. After this, Night 3 begins and we once again have a tip from Fredbear. This one reading, What crawls in the vents does not like to be seen. The noise of a rising temperature can scare it. This tip is actually referring to the new animatronic introduced in Night 3, which is Reaper Mangle. Near the hallway door, there is a thermostat on the wall that will glow red. We can go up to this thermostat and turn it on to scare Mangle away anytime we hear a sound cue of her climbing in our vents. Mangle is pretty easy to prevent from killing you, but it is once again Begin another time consuming task that you will need to keep track of. Seeing her descend out of the vents is also super terrifying, and I think the nightmare version of her was a great addition to the game. It actually makes sense that the crying child would see this, as his sister had a toy of Mangle that could have been the reason for him having these nightmares. Also on this night, I had a weird moment with the puppet where I accidentally let them in, but instead of just jump scaring me right away, this instead happened when I tried to sleep. This took me to some weird mini game with Purple Guy where I needed to choose which path to go. I'm gonna explain all these mini games when I explain the ending, so for now, let's just move on. Night 3 was a really tense night, but it was also still pretty manageable as the difficulty still hadn't jumped up too much. After night 3, we once again go back to the Chica minigame before returning to the main story. In this post night 3 cutscene, we see the construction begin for what appears to be Chica's party world. We can see what looks to be a spring lock Chica suit on a poster, as well as arcade machines being brought into the restaurant. While exploring the place, we can also overhear a conversation between William and the construction worker, which seems to be about baby. Since the spring locks are wound perfectly, I spend many many sleepless nights wait and making her amigo so you better watch your mouth and finish your work instead of insulting mine uh, certainly sir everything should be set and done in a month what about the elevator Are you guys working on that yet 
Or do I still need to climb down the emergency shaft every time? Not yet, sir. There's been complications. The animatronics like to get in the way of our staff. Well, then tell your staff to move! Now get out of my sight. After William yells at the construction workers to not worry about the animatronics, the cutscene ends and night 4 begins. The tip before the night refers to Fredbear's doppelganger and claims he approaches the hallway window. We need to shine our flashlight on his side of the hallway but only when we are most certain that he is there. This tip is referring to Reaper Golden Freddy who is the new animatronic introduced for night 4. To counter Reaper Golden Freddy, you need to pay attention to the window next to the hallway door as well as listen for a laugh. When Golden Freddy laughs and you see him in the window, you need to run up to the door and flash to your left to get rid of him. If you flash the hallway when Golden Freddy is not in the window, however, you will be jump scared. Night 4 is definitely where the difficulty took a huge spike. It's really challenging to balance all of the mechanics while also trying to find the right amount of time to sleep. Also because of how short the battery life lasts in between uses, Golden Freddy's mechanic adds so much more resource management to the night. But finishing the night does feel rewarding and none of the deaths felt really unfair. Besides like one attempt where for some reason the clock just glitched out entirely. Moving past the fourth Chica minigame, we now progress to the next cutscene. And this is where the cutscenes begin to change, but I'll talk about the differences between them when I go over the other endings. If we proceed with the normal playthrough though, the night 4 cutscene will have us in a now newly built Chica's party world. And during all of this, we can overhear two guys talking, whose voices you may recognize. Hell, I just want a warm pizza. Yeah, it makes no sense. It's like, and this fog in here, what, what is this? Like, honestly, the pizza is closed, so why is it going to be like foggy? Is this fog? Is it fake or is it like some kind of weird gas? Is there a leak anywhere? Somebody's obviously just dropped trow and farted. Have they left the bathroom <laughs> stalls open? Is that is that what they've done? Is this, oh, am well, I going to have to... The smell convinces me. I, I'm going to have to literally call in the health inspectors here. The smell is just... It is horrendous. You know, I'd actually believe that, to be honest. And the food, it, it didn't really help the smell of this place either. No, for real, though, we are making jokes and stuff, but there, there is something very odd about this place. I just don't... After hearing our two angry customers' thoughts on the new restaurant, we begin the fifth and final night. Instead of receiving a tip from Fredbear like the previous nights though, we are instead greeted by a paper reading join us over and over and over. The entire room is also dark and shrouded in purple, much like the last night of Final Nights 2. During this night, we need to defend ourselves against three characters, Grim Fredbear, Grim Chica, and Shadow Bonnie. Shadow Bonnie is the main animatronic giving us trouble during the this night. His appearance is indicated through a sound cue and he can attack from multiple different places, like the closet where Balloon Boy comes from, the window, and he can even mess with the thermostat. While dealing with his mechanic, we also need to worry about Grim Chica and Grim Fredbear. Both of these animatronics are located at the end of the hallway, with Fredbear being to our left and Chica being to our right. We need to run up to each of these suits every once in a while and press the glowing orbs to stop the spring locks, as failing to do this will get us killed. On paper, I thought this night was going to be pretty easy since it's only three threats attacking us, but that just couldn't be further from the truth. This night's difficulty, much like the rest of the game, lies in the player's ability to time every action perfectly and know which order to do things. I really love the atmosphere for this final night though, it really does feel eerie. The FNAF 3 ending music really sets the tone for the implied death of the crying child. Also the visuals of actually seeing the spirits inside of the Springlock suits does so much to make these designs that much more creepy. This really did feel like a climactic conclusion to this third game. After finishing Night 5, we get the final cutscene, and in my case, I got the bad ending, which shows our character passing away in the hospital. Heart rate just dropped dramatically. Call off the procedure. We need adrenaline now. Applying adrenaline. One, two, three. It's not working. We've lost him. Defibrillators now. One, two, three, clear. <laughs> Nothing. Give me another charge. We've completely lost him. He's gone. Hour and date of death. 6 a.m., 13th of December, 1987. Let's wrap it up, everyone. 
This seems like a pretty predictable ending, and well, yeah, it is. But luckily there are two more endings, the true ending and the FNAF ending. For the FNAF ending, if the player beats all of the Chica storage minigames flawlessly and beats an extra Fredbear plush minigame, then during the post Night 4 cutscene, there will be an elevator to go down. Taking this elevator down will reveal the finished construction, as well as Circus Baby, who is waiting in one of the rooms. Getting too close to Circus Baby causes us to get scooped before the next night begins. If all of this is done correctly, then after night 5, we load into a brand new cutscene. In this one, we are in Circus Baby's stomach hatch, and this is once again where the endings split. If we do nothing while in the stomach hatch, then eventually the scooper kills us, and we get the FNAF ending. And for the third and final ending, during the section when we are in Circus Baby's stomach hatch, there is actually a way to escape. If we spam A and D when the red light starts flashing, William will realize that we are in the stomach hatch and let us free. However, just as we are set free, Circus Baby falls on us, killing us anyways. And not knowing what to do now, William brings us over to the Spring Bonnie suit and stuffs us inside. This actually begins a whole new post night section for night 5. In this new post night section, we are set free to roam around the hospital. We need to make it to the exit, all while being chased down by Shadow Bonnie. Also in the halls are Grim Chica and Grim Fredbear, who are both trying to stop us. After running from these threats and eventually making it to the exit, this happens. Sweetie, it is I. Why won't you come join us? Why won't you be with us again? You won't survive for long like this anyway. It won't hurt. Just let go. We can have our revenge together. <laughs> This ending honestly confuses me a lot. I think this is the ending where the crying child becomes the brother. I'm just not sure why Shadow Bonnie is the one to do that, or who Shadow Bonnie even is. But my best guess is maybe he just represents death or something like that. Also, I'm not really sure why the FNAF ending would have the crying child be scooped by Circus Baby, so I'm guessing we play as Elizabeth in that cutscene and not the crying child, but it's never stated who we are playing as, so it's honestly just up for interpretation. Either way though, it's really cool that this game features multiple different endings for the player. All of them do a great job at showcasing the events that this story is trying to portray. So far, I would say that every single game has improved pretty heavily from the last entry. I think that this game does a much better job at story and cutscenes than the previous entries, and I also think that the graphics here, as well as the jump scares and environments, all look great. While there is the odd bug here and there, I can still say that this game is pretty polished. Also, this game provides an insane amount of variety with its different animatronics throughout the nights, the dynamically changing office, and its interactive cutscenes. The gameplay is also a step up from the second one. All of the mechanics are more cohesive here and feel a lot more responsive. Also the inclusion of having to sleep to pass the time did a lot to make this game's gameplay more unique than the others. With that being said though, there's only one more game to dive into and that is Final Nights 4, Fates Entwined. Alright, so now for Final Nights 4, and before we even begin the actual review, I have to talk about the hardest part of this game, just getting it to work. 
No matter what I tried, I could not get this game to launch. The EXE would just simply not open if I double clicked it. Reading through the game joke comments, I found out that almost everyone else was experiencing the same issues. Luckily there is a low spec version of the game that does work, but it sucks that we can't see the game in all its high graphics glory. I want you guys to see how much the graphics really did improve though, so I'm gonna use someone else's gameplay for this part of the review. When I say I tried everything to get the high poly version to work, I mean I tried literally everything. I ran it as administrator, I updated my drivers, I tried compatibility mode, I emailed the dev who told me to downgrade my DirectX or get a virtual machine for Windows 10, so I got a different version of DirectX, tried a Windows 10 and Windows 8 virtual machine, which neither of them worked, I installed Steam VR on both of them as it was required for the game to run, but still it didn't work. And I finally tried a special copy of the game that the dev sent me that ran on his PC, and it still wouldn't launch. So yeah, as far as I know, in 2023, it is pretty much impossible to play this game unless you play the low poly edition. If any of you guys find a way to make it work though, please leave a comment down below because I'm very curious to see if anyone else can figure it out. Anyways, with that quick side tangent out of the way, let's finally dive into Final Nights 4, Fates Entwined. Right away when loading into this game, we are greeted by an extremely cool main menu which got me hyped right off the bat. Just from the characters on the side, you can immediately tell that this game is taking us back to Fredbear's family diner. We can see what looks to be two versions of Spring Bonnie and Fredbear. And after pressing play, we get our very first cutscene to kick off the game. My name is Max Donovan, and I'm a paranormal investigator. I've been investigating Freddy's for over five years now, and I know... I know I'm close to finding out what happened. Mysterious disappearances, possible murders, no bodies, no nothing. I-I-I-I-I-I need to know what happened. It could, it could be my breakthrough. It could solidify me as the man who solved Freddy's. Attached to this note is the key to Fredbear's. I cannot disclose my name, my origins, or how I found you. But I will meet you there. Signed PM. As you can see from the cutscene, in this game we are playing as a brand new character, Max Donovan, a paranormal investigator trying to solve the mystery of Freddy's. Max receives a mysterious letter in the mail from an unnamed person, and attached to this letter is a key to Fredbear's family diner. Apparently, the person who sent this letter is going to meet us there. After this, we load into the very first gameplay section. This first part is actually free roam, but unlike the other games in the series, this one is point and click. I found this decision really interesting because this game does run on the same engines as the previous titles and is capable of real free roam, so the point and click was purely a creative decision. I actually think it's one that paid off in the end, but I'll talk about that more later. We begin parked outside of Fredbear's family diner. We have a backpack which we can store items in, as well as a notebook with questions we are looking to answer on it. Also weirdly to the right of the building, a mysterious animatronic seems to be lurking. After grabbing a crank and the keys out of the trunk, we are able to proceed to the front door of Fredbear's and let ourselves inside. This opens up a few rooms to explore which we need to solve puzzles in. We first need to type the date seen on this calendar into a padlock on a door. This opens up that door and reveals wooden planks blocking the way. To get rid of these planks, we need to find a chair in a different area of the building and use it in the bathroom in order to peek over the stall. Here we can find an axe which has been stabbed into somebody's neck. Some of these screens during this section such as this one are actually really eerie. After grabbing this axe, we can return to the door and chop down the wooden planks, allowing us to enter the room. In this room, we are able to turn off the gas, which was previously blocking us from going down one of the hallways. 
After leaving this room and returning to that previously locked off hallway, we are greeted by the brother, and this begins a new minigame section. I gotta say though, before moving forward, I think that the point and click free roam elements here work surprisingly well, and still feels like a FNAF game while also adding more unique encounters than ones just seen in office gameplay. During the minigame with the puppet, we need to survive against him for an undisclosed amount of time. We are placed directly in front of his show stage, and the puppet has various ways it can peek out to attack us. It can either peek its own head out, in which case we need to not do anything, or it can peek its hand puppet out, which we need to flash with our flashlight. It can also poke its hand puppet through the hole, and in this case we need to move the curtain out of the way. You are able to look down and charge your flashlight as well, but to be honest, you don't need to flash the puppet that often. This section is actually really easy once you get the hang of it. Not only is it really short, but the puppet only has three attacks you need to memorize. It can be a little confusing when you first start, but once you know what to do for each attack, it becomes a cakewalk. After that's over, the puppet jump scares us anyways, and then we begin night one. Yeah, that wasn't even the first night yet. What's so cool about this game that you will see as the video goes on is that this game does not hold back at all on the post night content, sometimes even having full length missions between nights. The first official night begins with us in our office at Fredbear's Family Diner. We receive a call from William who reveals to us that we are playing as Henry. We learn about the camera systems we have to watch over both the pizzeria and the ventilation systems, as well as our alarm system and air refresh buttons. We also learn that using left shift while outside of the cameras will activate the alarm system right outside of our room. This comes in handy when dealing with our first threat of the game, Fredbear. Fredbear begins by moving off stage. After this, he will try to go to party room 1 where he is able to shut off our power. To prevent him from doing this, we need to use our alarm system on multiple cameras to lead him out of the room, before eventually using the lure outside of our office to bring him right to us. After doing this, Fredbear will return back to his stage. This is a pretty confusing mechanic to get the hang of at first, but once you get it, it's really easy. Also, this game lets you spam the alarm as many times as you need, so there is no need to worry about timing it just right. Spring Bonnie is also active during night one. Just like Fredbear, Spring Bonnie will also roam around the pizzeria. William says the reason he does it is to look for intruders. We need to keep track of Bonnie on these cameras and stay completely still if he ever walks into our office, as failing to do so will get us killed. I love this animation of him peeking into the office so much. Something about having to stay completely still while the animatronic approaches is just so creepy. Night 1 is pretty much a cakewalk, but it's a nice introduction to get us used to all of the mechanics. One of the first things I noticed on this night is just how much better the animatronic models have gotten. If you compare the models in this game to the previous entries, it's seriously night and day. You can see that the developer really polished up his character designs. Also, some of the characters we see later look even better, but I'm gonna save that for later to avoid spoilers. Things like the lighting and office design also look so much better than anything we saw in the previous games. After completing our first night, we return once again to another free roam section. In this one, we are actually located at a worn down house which may look familiar. Making our way into this house, we discover a decommissioned foxy on the ground from the second final night's game. Next to this foxy is also a pair of scissors which we are able to grab. Taking these scissors to the front of the house, we are able to use them to open up this gate. I'm not sure why the character didn't just climb over the gate, but who knows. After this, we approach the front door and this kicks off the next part of the minigame. After walking in, we immediately see a cutscene of Fredbear kicking the door open, which knocks our player to the ground, before Freddy drags us deeper into the home. After this, we are set free to roam around the house and look for parts. It's seriously so cool to explore these sections from the second game that we only ever got to see on the cameras. It helps make the locations of the series feel more real, and also returning to them is just a sick callback. Also, exploring the house, we eventually find two parts which we are able to use to make a crank. 
Moving through the house, we eventually stumble across a decommissioned Bonnie on the ground. We then need to spam F to use the crank on Bonnie and free his spirit. But there's just one issue. Behind us, we can see Chica's shadow lurking over us. This means that as soon as we are done setting Bonnie's soul free, we need to run to an area to hide in the house to prevent Chica from killing us. I think this minigame serves as a perfect example of why the developer decided to go with the point and click style gameplay. By limiting the player's movement to such few options, the developer is able to play with things like lighting to create scares that otherwise wouldn't be possible. I was unsure if the point and click would work well for this game, but after this moment, I was pretty confident that it was the right choice. After hiding and escaping from Chica, the minigame is still not over. Emerging from the hole we hid in, we are now able to move to the second floor of the building. Moving through more abandoned rooms, we eventually stumble across the room from Final Nights 2. This this begins the next minigame section, where we need to survive against both Freddy and Chica. We can look behind us and shine our light on Chica, as well as hide to the left side of the door. To complete this quick section, we need to keep our light on Chica to keep her at bay, while waiting for Freddy to stand up and get closer to us. Once Freddy is right in our face, we are able to use our crank on him and free his soul. We need to do this to Freddy twice though before it works, and then immediately hide behind the door. Here we can wait for Chica to stumble into the room before freeing her soul as well. After this is over, we cut to a cutscene of our player dragging both Freddy and Chica into the woods. The brother is there as well, and he watches us as we set the animatronics on fire. This is where Night 2 begins. Seriously such a cool post-night minigame though. I loved seeing the old animatronics and locations come back, and also the more puzzle style gameplay is a nice change of pace between the office sections. For Night 2, we are introduced to one new threat, that being the puppet. The puppet's mechanic is actually pretty strange. From my understanding, you need to watch the puppet on the camera in order to slow them down from approaching your office. Looking at them for long enough seems to cause them to go back and forth between cameras, which stops them from ever reaching your office. Also, every time the puppet moves, there is a sound cue, which is pretty helpful. It's really not hard to keep them away, but the way it's explained to the player just isn't very clear. It does add another thing we need to watch on the cameras though, and this is where things start to get a little bit stressful. Also, because of the camera's real-time movement, you would think it's easier to keep tabs on animatronics, but that's just not true. For some reason, animatronics seem to wait a few seconds before transitioning between rooms on the cameras, which can be extremely disorienting when trying to keep tabs on multiple animatronics at once. After night 2, we continue the free roaming part of the game. This time we are in Fredbear's, continuing where we left off in the beginning. Our notebook reads, what caused these symptoms? And we are able to move through the rooms, exploring the abandoned pizzeria. Making our way deeper in, we eventually get a cutscene. Fredbear kicks us over before grabbing us by the neck and lifting us up. Here he asks us a few questions, and depending on if you answer correctly or not, will determine the ending you get. Fredbear begins by asking us who we are, before saying, Those final nights, what did he do to me? This is actually extremely interesting and very well done. While the good ending is technically easier to get than any of the other games, because you just need to answer questions correctly, I still think this is the most well done way to do it. We need to tell Fredbear who killed him and what happened to him. The only problem is that the answers to those questions are what we are investigating in the first place. This means that to know the answer to some of these questions, we will need to have beaten the game already. This is such a cool way of making the player replay the game to see the other endings, because instead of a hard restriction, your own knowledge is the only thing preventing you from getting the good ending. That is if you don't look it up. It also adds a lot more to the investigation aspect of the game, by actually having us seeking answers during our exploration of the previous locations. After we answer Fredbear's questions, Night 3 begins, and just like Night 2, one new threat is now active. This time, that is Proto Spring Bonnie. Proto Spring Bonnie is a withered, older version of Spring Bonnie that can be seen laying down in one of the back rooms. 
And I do have to say, this guy's design is terrifying and also just really sick. I have always been a huge fan of Spring Bonnie's design, and this even more eerie version of him is just so cool to me. Starting on night 3, Proto Spring Bonnie will begin getting up and walking around the pizzeria. Just like the other animatronics, he can be seen walking around, and he can even walk straight into your office and through your vent, which had me stressing the first time it happened. To stop Proto Spring Bonnie from killing us, we need to use the air refresh buttons on our monitor whenever he stops moving. This means that we need to be watching him on the cameras pretty frequently, which adds a lot more stress to the night when we are already worried about characters like the puppet and Fredbear. This night itself wasn't too hard, but it's clear that this is where the difficulty begins to pick up. After finishing night 3, we get a quick cutscene of our protagonist and the puppet returning to another familiar location. The puppet turns to us and says, The ones in there failed their task. She made it her home. She still haunts, but I've taken her task now. Free her, and I'll show you more. After that, we are set free to investigate the hospital from Final Nights 3. Our notebook also has a new question in it. Why was the hospital abandoned? Moving closer to the building, we are able to take a crowbar which is wedged into the front door and use it to break into the sewer from the back alleyway. Down here, we need to solve a puzzle involving math and a few numbers on the wall. And after finishing this, we unlock a new entrance to the hospital. Here we are let free to explore a huge area of the hospital. However, unlike the other mini games, this time we are being chased. Which may sound scary, but the mechanic is actually really weird. The puppet from Final Nights 3 is the one chasing us, but the way it works just feels very artificial. Whenever the puppet is approaching, this drawing of the puppet will begin to flash on the top right of the screen. And if we don't run to another room fast enough, we will be jump scared. The weird thing though is I'm not sure if the puppet's location even saves. Because if we leave a room and then immediately come back, the puppet will be gone. This makes the whole chasing mechanic feel super artificial. And instead of the warning being threatening or stressful, it's more like a quick indicator to just move to another room. Making our way upstairs, we encounter more decrepit rooms of the hospital, as well as this mysterious message next to a plushie. First there were five of us, then we met the two of them. After those two, there were six of us. Yeah, I have no idea what this is supposed to mean, but if you guys know, then let me know down below. Also in this upstairs floor, we are able to find a screwdriver in the closet. We are then able to use this screwdriver to repair a previously decommissioned elevator. We do this by first removing a panel on the wall, and then solving a puzzle with these random, like, Japanese letters? I think that's what they are? And after this, we are able to move up to the third floor of the hospital, where we can continue our investigation. There is not much to note on this third floor other than this mysterious projector which we can turn off, but to my knowledge there is nothing else we can do with it. Making our way down the hallway, we eventually come across this door, and entering it reveals Chica's storage room. Immediately, I was stressing, because as you guys know, I did not succeed at this minigame a single time during Final Nights 3. Luckily though, my stress was soon alleviated, because this is actually one of the easiest minigames in the series. All we need to do is sit across from Chica and shine our flashlight on her if she moves. After the first time doing this, however, two more versions of Chica appear. You would think this would add more difficulty to the minigame, but it actually stays pretty much exactly the same. We just need to watch the three Chicas and shine whichever one moves. It's actually that easy. But that's not where this post night section ends, as we actually have one last task. Before going in though, at this point if we check our notebook, once again we can see that some of the questions we have been investigating have been answered. We learned during this minigame that the hospital was abandoned due to the rapid death of patients. And we also learned that this was caused by hauntings brought in from a victim at Fredbear's. These notebook answers are the answers to the questions Fredbear asks us, so it's important for us to remember all of these things. After surviving against Chica's short section, we move forward one more time and are met with a screen with tips for the next section. This basically gives us a rundown for the next part's gameplay, but I'll explain it more clearly instead. During this section, we are in the hospital room that was our office during Final Nights 3. 
We also need to defend ourselves against a lot of familiar threats, such as Reaper Mangle, Reaper Balloon Boy, Reaper Spring Bonnie, and the Puppet. Reaper Mangle can be seen hanging above us and needs to be flashed whenever they move. Reaper Balloon Boy can be seen on our bed covering his eyes, and just like Mangle needs to be flashed if he's seen moving out of his normal position. Reaper Spring Bonnie, much like his Final Nights 3 counterpart, approaches from the right side hallway outside of our room, and will go away after we flash our flashlight on him. Unlike that game though, there's no need to close the door. The puppet attacks us by disorienting our vision and then eventually killing us, and he can be dealt with by turning off the light switch by the door. On top of all of this, we also need to make sure that this hole in the wall doesn't fill up with Fredbear plushies, as letting that happen also gets us killed. This section, while having a lot to deal with, was surprisingly not that hard. After one or two deaths, you can pretty much get the hang of the mechanics and pass it. I still think it's a really cool throwback though to have us face against the threats of Final Nights 3 one last time. Also, the redone designs for all of these animatronics look so much better than they did in Final Nights 3. After surviving this part, which only lasts about 2 minutes, we are interrupted. The camera pans to show a Fredbear plushie, and we are told to free her and burn it. We then light the plushie on fire, I'm guessing to set another soul free, and then Night 4 begins. I'm a little confused on whose spirit we are meant to be freeing, because I'm guessing it's the crying child, but I'm not sure if the crying child is possessing the brother. You guys will just have to let me know though, because this is pretty confusing. Anyways, for night 4, Proto Spring Freddy is now active. Proto Spring Freddy attacks us from the vent above our heads, so we need to watch this vent whenever we see Proto Spring Freddy enter a vent, and close it right before he reaches us. If you close the vent too early, Freddy will actually jump down the vent shaft and and jump scare you, so it's very important to close it on him at the last second. Something that makes this mechanic really cool is you can actually see Freddy crawling around in the vent, which makes it a little easier to know when to close it, but it also makes him look a lot more creepy. Other than Proto Spring Freddy though, there are no new threats added for night 4. This night was still extremely stressful though, as this night serves as the final test of your ability to fend off against these animatronics. After finally completing the night, we load into another cutscene where we continue our conversation with Fredbear. Fredbear starts by telling us, the puppet master, he talks to me. He wants me to ask you if you know what happened in the hospital. He then asks us, did William really do all this? And after answering these two questions, we load into the fifth and final night. If you guys have been paying very close attention and have been trying to piece together who Fredbear is, you may have figured it out by now. But for the people who still haven't figured it out, I'll save the surprise for later. Just like the other Final Nights games, Night 5 is a completely different night. The location is once again shrouded in a dark purple color, and we need to face off against brand new threats. The two threats we need to protect ourselves from during this night are Insane Fredbear and Insane Spring Bonnie, who I must say have maybe my favorite favorite designs in the whole series. To stop them from killing us, we need to be constantly scanning the building for them, using our alarm system as soon as we see them. This night is actually surprisingly simple and not too challenging for the final night, as that's the only thing we need to do. Now that's not to say it's easy, it's definitely still a challenge, but compared to night 4, I honestly feel like this is easier. Also, the cameras have an exclamation mark on them to show you where the animatronics are, which just makes it even easier to know where to use your alarm. The insane animatronics can also wander into our office, but they can be dealt with by simply using the office alarm. Oh yeah, their jump scare is also pretty crazy. After finishing up Night 5, we load into the final free roam section, only this time we are playing as Henry. Henry stands up from his desk and is now ready to escape Fredbear's. We need to traverse the various rooms looking for the exit while also still avoiding the insane animatronics. We do this by pressing space to close our eyes whenever we see them. It's really easy to avoid them, but they still add a lot of tension to this final escape. After making our way through the pizzeria, we eventually find some keys next to a stain of blood. And after picking it up, well, this happens. <laughs>
Henry gets knocked over by both of the insane animatronics before eventually being stuffed into the Fredbear suit. So yeah, if you guys didn't figure it out already, the Fredbear talking to our investigator is none other than Henry himself, who we were playing as during the office sections. I'm not really sure how to feel about Henry becoming Fredbear, as it seems a little anticlimactic for his character, especially considering what he is meant to go on and do further down the line in the series. But I can't help but love the way the narrative tied everything together. Having the game switch from the present moment to the past only to tie everything together at the end is just so cool, and something I was honestly not expecting. After getting stuffed into the suit, the brother has some words for us. You didn't pay attention, and answered wrong. We can't use you anymore. You'll stay right here, until the universe gives you another chance. Yeah, so this is basically just the brother telling us that we got the bad ending. If we answer all of the questions correctly during the two Fredbear cutscenes, however, then after night six is over, instead of getting up to leave the building, the puppet instead tells us that we have one more task. We are then set free in a playground area to roam around. Making our way across the street, however, we come across Fazbear's Fright. Moving through the front entrance, we make our way into the building, and here we can force ourselves into a locked room where we can then set the place on fire. This actually causes our character to momentarily pass out before standing back up. We now have to escape the burning building before we die. However, while trying to make our escape, we run into one final animatronic. Springtrap then shoves us onto some debris, which I'm pretty sure impales Henry, killing him immediately before the game ends. Overall, I think that the story for this game was the best in the series. I think the reveal for the major story beats were handled the best in this game out of the four titles, and I also think the characters and locations felt a lot more meaningful to the story than they did in previous entries. Looking back on the other games, the models for the animatronics just don't even compare to the ones in this title. Also, the locations all look great and were so much fun to explore. Gameplay wise, I would also have to say that this is the best one in the series. Not only do you get a little bit of everything with the mini game free roam sections, but this also just felt like the most fair game out of them all. There weren't many game breaking bugs, and all the nights were pretty challenging, while also not having me slamming my desk trying to get through them. Anyways, with that being said, guys, that concludes my review on every single Final Nights game in the series. This video took so long to make, so if you made it this far, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. Also, comment down below which out of the four games is the best. Anyways, with that being said, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace. Alright, so we have finally made it to the end of this very, very long video. And just like I said in the intro of the video, I'm going to be doing a tier list to give my final thoughts on all of these games. Now I know in a lot of the videos I would say like, oh this game is my new favorite FNAF fan game, and I said that like three times. But now that I've played almost every single FNAF fan game, I wanted to give my true final rating. So the first game up is Baby's Nightmare Circus. This one's pretty hard, I think I'm gonna put this one at A tier. The reason I'm going to put it at A tier is because, well, first of all, the presentation in this game was amazing. It really gave me those nostalgic original FNAF vibes that you don't get from many fan games. I also thought that the gameplay was pretty good in this one, and it also just has a lot of content. It even has this extra classic mode that everyone's been telling me to check out that I haven't even played yet. And even without seeing that section of the game, I still think of this game very fondly, so I'll put it at A tier. Next up we have Final Nights 4, which I'm gonna actually move this and kind of try to organize this a little bit more. That way this kind of makes more sense, so we'll skip over that one for now. Alright, so next up we have Jolly Bees, and once again I'm gonna put this at A tier. It's not a perfect fan game, so it's not gonna go in S, but I think overall it's a pretty good game. 
The intro cutscene was pretty solid and got me hooked right off the bat, and throughout the nights I never really got bored. It introduces some pretty unique gameplay ideas, and it also has a story that the developer was actually trying to tell. For Jollibee's Phase 2, I'm gonna have to go B tier. The reason for that is not only was this game a lot shorter than the first one, but I also felt like the nights were a lot more repetitive. While the side jobs were a pretty cool idea and is original for a fan game, I felt like the gameplay for those side jobs weren't very in-depth and were pretty one-dimensional. And overall, I just think that this game had a lot less content than the first Jolly Bees. Alright, so next up is Eddie and the Misfits, and I'm also going to put this at A tier. The animatronic designs in this game are seriously some of the scariest I've seen from a fan game. And this game also had a lot of variety with its many mini games that are sprinkled throughout the runtime. So yeah, I'll put that at A tier. The glitched attraction, this is going to be our first S tier. The reason I say that is because, well first of all, this is a 3D FNAF fan game, which immediately allows the developer to pack this with so much content. Each night is a different location from the FNAF series, with its own unique gameplay and characters. The game also runs really well and looks really good. So yeah, this is definitely an S tier. Alright, so this is Bondi's Barnyard, and I'm gonna put this at S tier. While the game is pretty short, I think that overall it's just a perfect FNAF fan game. It has a concise story with a start and an end point, a unique location and set of characters, and the gameplay always felt engaging but never unfair. The mechanics as well as the premise also had me really interested the first time I played it. So yeah, overall this is S tier in my opinion, just a nice overall package and a really good starter fan game for someone who's never really played fan games before, as it isn't very hard and it can be completed in just a couple hours. The Joy of Creation story mode is also going to go S tier. Even though I didn't really understand the story the first time I played it, the gameplay is just so good that it has to be an immediate S tier. Just like the glitched attraction, the graphics are amazing and every single night is its own thing. So the content you're getting just from this one fan game is already insane. Also all of the cutscenes look really good. So yeah, this is definitely an S tier. Fredbear and Friends Left to Rot, this is also going to be an S tier. Just like Bondi's Barnyard, I think this is a really good starter fan game. Just like the glitched attraction and the joy of creation, each night is its own thing. The graphics are also really good, and the premises introduced in this game are super unique for FNAF fan game. This was also one of the first ones I've ever played, but still to this day I look at it very fondly. So yeah, definitely S tier. The Tubbyland Archives Act 1, I'm gonna give it... Uh, I'm gonna give it A tier. Now this game could have been S tier, but I feel like the only thing holding it back was its balancing. I remember this game being extremely unfair and I couldn't even beat the final night. So yeah, if that was just ironed out, I would have probably given it an S tier because everything else was really good. The animations, character designs, graphics, and the story that's told through the minigames were all really engaging. It just needed to be balanced better, so yeah, I'm gonna have to give it an A tier. The Return of Bloody Nights, I'm gonna give an A tier. Now the gameplay isn't the greatest in this game. But what really stands out the most to me is the setting with Fredbear's Family Diner and also the cutscenes between each night where we actually get to hear the phone calls between Henry and William. I thought that was something super unique to this fan game and it had me super interested the first time I played it. The only thing holding it back I would say is the gameplay. There's nothing inherently wrong with it, it's just not S tier worthy I'd say. The Twisted Carnival is going to be another B tier. Now it's not really fair to judge this game because I did just play a demo of it and I definitely will re-review this whenever the full game releases but because I haven't seen the full game and just got a small glimpse of it I can't really put it at A tier or S tier yet. And it also just feels unfair to put it at C tier or D tier so yeah Twisted Carnival is B. Another game that goes in B is Visiting Fazbear's. Just like the Twisted Carnival, this game is just a demo so I can't really get a full grasp of how the game will be. There's also not really a story to this game as far as I know, so yeah, this is gonna go B tier. There's nothing wrong with this game, but it just doesn't com- There's nothing wrong with this game, but I just can't put it on the same levels as these other fan games. Polar Dread, I have to put at A tier. 
Despite not really having much of a story, the gameplay in this game is just so unique that I can't help but put it this high. Things like throwing items at the animatronic on the wall and hiding under the desk are just so unique and different from any other fan game that there's no way I could put this at B tier. So yeah, this is an A tier. SCP The Endurance is also an A tier. This game isn't perfect by any means, but just as a complete package, this is seriously an impressive fan game. Not only does the soundtrack go extremely hard, but all the cutscenes are seriously well done. The gameplay was also super unique, and that final secret ending is so memorable even to this day. Trying to type in all the code while also fighting off the animatronics was seriously one of the most stressful things I've done in a fan game. So yeah, SCP The Endurance is A tier. Five Nights at Treasure Island, I'm gonna put at B tier. While this is a really good faithful remaster to the original Five Nights at Treasure Island, I just feel like the gameplay in this game was pretty forgettable. It also can be beaten pretty quickly, and as far as I remember, there isn't really much of a story. Oblitus Casa, I'm gonna put also at B tier. I felt like the story in this game was pretty hard to follow. Like, I remember the final cutscene was like the mother's monologue, and I just had no idea what it meant. Yeah, the story wasn't too memorable on this game. I do remember the gameplay being really good though. I really liked the mechanic of going upstairs and having to shine your light on the face. And I also thought that erasing the um, drawing on the notebook was a super cool mechanic. I don't know if I could put it at A tier, so I'm gonna put Oblitus Casa at B tier. Also another reason is those uh, sewer mini games where you had to walk around the grid, those were super annoying. And the presentation on it just wasn't done the best in my opinion. So yeah, Oblitus Casa, that's a B tier for me. Post Shift 2, this is a very interesting one. The amount of content in this game is unmatched in any other fan game. Like the amount of animatronic models, locations, animations, music that the developer put into this game is seriously mind blowing to me. The only reason I can't put it at S tier is because the story was so confusing that I couldn't even follow it and also because of its sheer difficulty. This is a fan game that very few people can experience just because of how hard it is. If I wasn't gonna cover this game on my channel, I don't think I ever would have had the willpower to get through the full game. And for that reason, I can't put it at S tier. But I do respect the developer so much for just the sheer amount of content there is in this game. So yeah, Post Shift 2 is gonna go at A tier. All right, so we're on to the last few games. I'm gonna rate Grizzlies VR and Teeler Land next, that way the final games will be the Final Night series as well as the Jolly series. For Grizzlies VR, this is an interesting one. I think I'm gonna give this game... I'm gonna give it A tier as well. I was thinking about giving it S tier, but honestly the gameplay could have been a lot more unique than it really was. The VR mechanics do add a new level to the gameplay that makes it feel extremely immersive the first time you play it, but now that I think back on it, I mean the gameplay was pretty basic. It's just close the doors whenever you see the animatronics approaching on the cameras. They did have that unique thing where the rabbit comes in and bites the lever, but besides that, none of the gameplay really stood out to me too too much. What makes this game A tier though is the cutscenes and story. I think that this game has maybe the best cutscenes in any FNAF fan game I have ever played. Not only do they look like real life, but the voice actors absolutely killed it, especially the voice actor for Grizzly. Never before when I played a FNAF fan game have I been this scared of an animatronic. Grizzly is just such a threatening character. Also the way the story is written is very cryptic, but also really unique. So yeah, not quite an S tier, but I can't put it any lower than A just because of how good the cutscenes were. For Teeler Land, I'm gonna give this game a B tier. For me, the most memorable thing about Teeler Land was definitely the visuals and presentation. All of the animatronic designs, locations, and even the UI were super polished and looked better than 90% of the fan games I've played. 
The gameplay also tried to be extremely unique and played with mechanics that I have not seen in any other fan game. My problem with this game lies in the fact that most of the game is spent on this like computer screen trying to walk around and capture animatronics. And while the gameplay mechanics were unique, I feel like they just don't really work the best and needed to be tweaked more for the game to really stand out. I also think it's kind of weird how you can get jump scared in that game and then go heal yourself up and continue the night. It kind of gets you desensitized to the jump scares and also just doesn't really make too much sense. This is not a bad fan game at all by any means, but I don't really think it's on par with these fan games in terms of its gameplay. Alright, so now what we have left is just the Final Night series as well as the Jolly series. For Jolly 1, I'm gonna put this game at... I'm gonna have to put this game at C tier. Now that does not mean the game's bad by any means, but it is pretty outdated. Looking at the animatronic designs as well as like the location, you can tell that this game is definitely pretty old and doesn't reach the same level of polish that games like Jolly Bee's Phase 2 and the Twisted Carnival's reached. The reason I can't put this game at D tier though is the fact that this game was made when the developer was like 13 or 14 years old which still blows my mind to this day. Also, this game did introduce some pretty unique gameplay ideas with the moving elevators and multiple floors. I thought it was a super cool mechanic that you have to send the animatronics back down the elevators whenever they're coming to kill you. For Jolly 2, I'm also gonna put this game at C tier. I remember this game having a little bit better gameplay than Jolly 1, and I also remember the animatronic designs improving just a little bit but it's not really enough to warrant me putting it at B tier. I just can't in good conscience put it next to Oblitus Casa and Teeler Land. That's not to say the game was bad, it just wasn't all that memorable. For Jolly 3, I'm gonna put this one at B tier. Not only did the locations and animatronic designs drastically improve from the first and second game, but also things like the gameplay also got so much better. This game not only had a fully fleshed out storyline with mini games, but it also had unique gameplay between the nights with the free roaming sections, as well as some pretty cool office gameplay. It's for sure better than Jolly 1 and 2, but I would say it's about on par with Jolly Bee's Phase 1. So yeah, that one belongs in B tier. And now we just have the Final Nights games. Final Nights 1 is gonna be a D tier for me. While this game does kick off the Final Night story, the gameplay is just not good at all in this game. This was definitely when the developer was just learning how to create games, so I can't really put too much blame on him, but there's no way I can give this a C tier in good faith when the first night of the game was just glitching out every single time I tried to beat it. For Final Nights 2, I'm gonna give this a B tier. I think that the gameplay in this game was surprisingly very engaging. I really like the mechanic of having the two animatronics in the vent which you have to time to close and I also think that the final night with Fredbear and Spring Bonnie was super cool. This game also had some of the coolest cutscenes I've seen in a FNAF fan game. Not only do they let you choose which suit you wear at the beginning of the game which affects how the cutscenes play out, but there's also multiple endings and outcomes to many of the cutscenes. Also, I just can't help but love any fan game that takes place during the Fredbear's Family Diner era of the FNAF story. So yeah, this game's gonna go in B tier. Final Nights 3, I'm also gonna put in B tier. I think the gameplay in this game as well as the cutscenes are better than Final Nights 2 and are really impressive, but I still don't think this game is on par with the games in A tier. And for the final game on this tier list, we have Final Nights 4, and I'm gonna put this in A tier. The reason I put this in A tier is because playing all four of these games in the Final Nights series back to back, I thought that it was such a cool idea that in between each night, we return to the old locations of the other Final Nights games. The way the developer also tied in gameplay to these post-night sections worked really well in my opinion. The office gameplay, while rather simple, was also pretty good, and seeing the story of the Final Night series conclude with the really well done cutscenes definitely deserves A tier in my opinion. So yeah, this is my finished tier list for all the FNAF fan games I talked about in this video. 
If you guys watched all the way till the end of this and aren't asleep by now, then I applaud you and thank you so much for watching all the way till the end. I'll have a Help Wanted 2 review coming out either a day or two after that game releases, so stay tuned for that. And with that being said, thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you guys all in the next video. Peace.